All right. So, what we want to, I want to, I want to review very briefly, sort of what I think we got out of Tuesday's um, session, and uh, then I then I want to move on to stuff about unreadiness to hand and involvements and significance and signs. Um, and we'll see how much of that we we get to the involvements and significance uh, section section 18 is you must have found it incredibly dense how many of you made it through there okay <laughs> yeah I, I like this to sort of yeah kind of yeah so what I think is we'll probably talk about that we'll begin talking about th- that this time and we'll probably continue on that for uh, for Tuesday although um, uh, we'll also move next week on to the, the section on Descartes and the criticism of Cartesianism, which you sort, sort of ought to be able to predict once you've got the, uh, at least the version of the story that we've got so far on the table. Okay, so what did, we, what did we end with last time? I think one of the big points of, of Tuesday is was supposed to be that there's a difference between what it is to be a, a particular piece of equipment, what it is to be a hammer, and what the mode of being of the equipment of equipment is. And it's important to get the distinction um, because I think y- you, you don't really have the phenomena right unless you see what the distinction is. So remember, what it is, the idea was that what it is to be a hammer is... Um, determined by the place that the hammer holds in the referential hole of all the equipment. So the referential hole is what you might be familiar with now as... Yes? Oh, no. We don't have any. I have one at home. Okay. I I think this is working now. And maybe I'll try to get a new one. Uh, Okay. So what it is to be a hammer... I'm just reviewing what we ended up with last time, the difference between what it is for something to be the piece of equipment that it is and the mode of being that equipment has. So what it is for something to be a hammer is for it to hold the place that it does in the referential hole, the whole of all the reference relations. So hammers are in order to pound nails. Uh, uh, you pound nails with hammers towards the end of uh, building houses or building bookshelves or whatever. And uh, that happens in the context, ultimately, in the context of uh, for the sake of which, uh, which I'll try to talk about a little bit at the end today, and we'll probably talk about more next time. But a for the sake of which is something like a reference or an assignment for a, for a Dasein. It's something like the stand that you take on yourself. So you hammer with the hammer, you hammer the nail with the hammer in order to build the bookshelves in order to have bookcases towards the end of being able to hold your books for the sake of being a a person who has a lot of books or being a professor or being a teacher or being a student or whatever. Um, So that's that's the referential hole. And what it is for any piece of equipment to be the equipment that it is is to hold the place that it does in that referential hole. Then there's the mode of being of equipment. That's uh, something different, though related. The mode of being of equipment, that's to say, the mode of being in which equipment most shows itself as it is, in itself, is readiness to hand. So not all equipment is always in the ready-to-hand mode of being. We, def- we, we saw that Heidegger wants to define the ready-to-hand mode of being in terms of the withdrawal from awareness of, of the piece of equipment in its being used in order to do whatever it gets to be used for. So the hammers in the ready-to-hand mode of being, when you're hammering skillfully and well and transparently with it, Uh, But it's equipment. It's the hammer that it is, whether you're hammering with it or not. It's the hammer that it is if it's lying in the drawer in the workshop and it's totally irrelevant to anything anybody's doing at the moment. It's still the hammer. 
in that circumstance. Because it still holds, it still gets its definition, it gets to be what it is in terms of the place it holds in the referential totality or the referential whole. Okay. So, um, we made a lot of the notion of the, uh, of the idea that hammers get to be, uh, show themselves most as they are precisely when they're not showing themselves, but not showing themselves in a particular way, precisely when they're withdrawing from your notice because you're hammering transparently with them. So I just want to point out that, and now I'm sort of starting to move on from where we got last time, that this makes the in order to relations um, in the referential totality, they're, they're sort of funny things. They're not the kind of thing that you could that you could really get at if you just built a map, say, hammers point to nails, nails point to pieces of wood, pieces of wood point to... I mean, you could, you could map them that way. And Heidegger, I guess, went in the, at the bottom of 97, um, when he's giving the example of, I think it's the chalk, you know, he, he talks about it that way. The chalk is in order for writing on the chalkboard and so on. So you can map it out. And when you map it out, you're saying something that's at least related to the structure of a world, to the, what he calls the worldhood of the world, the existential structure of the world. The world structure is made up of this equipment, these equipmental relations. That's what the worldhood of the world is. But you've really missed the point if you think when you map it out that you've got anything essential or interesting about that referential totality. Because they, in order to relations, um, are, pro are properly described in what he calls a privative mode, a taking away mode. So the in order to relations are most what they are, just like the hammer is most what it is, when the in order to relations are inconspicuous, unobtrusive, uh, non-obstinate. That's the privative mode, the taking away mode. You take away all ability to notice them or to make uh, to have any kind of thematic or other other awareness of them. And when you take away that, and you take it away in the right kind of context, that's when the in order to relations are most what they are. So hammers are in order to hammer nails. And that doesn't just mean that they refer to nails in some abstract sense. It means, in a basic case, this, right? I, I mean, you can't really say it. You can, any, any time you say it, you, you buy... You make it explicit, you make it noticed, you make it conspicuous. And so, you guarantee that this referential relation um, that you're now naming isn't the best and most authentic version of the reference relation as it characterizes the worldhood of the world. So you get it not just with the hammers. We, we talked about it last time with the hammers, uh, with, with the notion of readiness to hand. Readiness to hand is, is the mode of being that's characterized by the withdrawal from notice of the thing that you're, of the thing that you're working with. But thing that you're working with, hammer, isn't an object. It's described in the context of these reference relations. And the reference relations themselves are most what they are when they're withdrawing from notice when they're inconspicuous, non-obstinate, inobtrusive, and so on. So you get this sort of very difficult to get a handle on kind of picture, according to which everything you think you can say something about, turns out you can't really say anything about it, because the very act of saying something about it identifies it as something that you're trying to keep yourself from identifying it as. That's true both about the equipment, any piece of equipment, and also, sort of, and for that very reason, about the worldhood of the world, about the structure of the reference relations that characterize any particular local environment, like the environment of the workshop, or 
the world of um, academia or the theater or business, and in general, uh, that characterize uh, cultures and whatever it is, whatever a world is, in the most general sense, as a sen- as a as a structure of equipment that Dasein gets to be involved with. So it, it's a very funny, it's a very funny picture. Um, and it involves this notion of the privative characterization. Does everyone know what privative means? I remember when I learned what it meant, and I was embarrassingly old. So if you didn't, don't know what it means. It means taking away, privation. Like it means taking away. And often in words we'll have a kind of prefix that means taking away. Usually, often there's an alpha privative, amoral. The A at the front is, it takes away from the morality but inconspicuous, um, uh, non-obstinate, unobtrusive. Those are privative notions that say what the reference relations and the equipment that's defined by them aren't when they're most themselves. And that's sort of the way you got to do it. Um, And yet, so let me just make this one extra point. And yet... When you do it that way, when Heidegger does it that way, he wants to insist that despite the fact that the hammer and the reference relations that define the hammer are inconspicuous, um, uh, non-obtrusive, non-obstinate, and so on, despite all that, nevertheless, they've got a positive phenomenal presence. They're something that we're already familiar with. Not something, but they're... <laughs> whatever it is we're already familiar with and uh, is already intelligible to us on the basis of which everything else gets to have any kind of intelligibility at all. And I'm going to read a passage that says that before... Uh, but first, Alan has a question. Yeah. So about this primitive... Uh, the way you use the language in German yeah. actually shows the primitive mode as the positive mode already. Yeah, good. Oh, so, tell us. Uh, tell us yeah. Because it's like, if you look at it, it's like Aufschlissen. Yeah. It's laying open. Yeah. It's already in a primitive. It's Schlissen is I the see. Yeah, positive. that's right. I mean, it's well, I see what you mean. The primitive. And then if you come to the uh, Aufsch- uh, conspicuousness and then, what was that? Obstrusiveness, obstinacy, they're all like made with, with the same character, like with using the off. Yeah. So the none that we use, which yeah. makes it so... In English and German, what is primitive is switched. Good. The way you use the language. Good. That's a, that's very helpful. That's one of those, and it, it'll happen again um, it, with the with the Greek word for truth, which is yeah. aletheia. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. So what what Elam is pointing out is that um, when when we have words that are supposed to identify the derivative mode of being, unreadiness to hand. We have words like conspicuous, and we'll go through some of these. Uh, Equipment becomes conspicuous or obtrusive or, um, uh, I keep forgetting, obstinate. Yeah, the third one. Uh, Those words look like they don't have, they're not privatively characterized, but in German, those are actually privatively characterized. Then you get a double. Yeah. And the same thing you use for schließen. Yeah. Off again, so yeah. they're all at the same level. Yeah. Out, like, so, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it it, do, it works a little bit better in German and in Greek. This is what makes him think that those are the those are the, the right languages to be thinking in. So let me read the passage where he's saying something like this on 106. Now a little bit further than we made it last time. Uh. 106 in the English is 75 in the German. Um, And uh, I'm about 10 lines down from the top of 106. If it is to be possible for the ready-to-hand not to emerge from its inconspicuousness. So we've we've got two negatives there. So that means if it's possible for the ready-to-hand to to stay... um, uh, unnoticed and unconspicuous. If it's possible for it not to come out of, but to stay in this inconspicuousness, this not noticed kind of 
way of being, then the world must not announce itself. Remember, the ready to hand uh, is the mode of being of equipment, but equipment is defined in terms of the reference relations, and the reference relations define the world. So for the ready to hand to stay submerged, let's call it submerged or not noticed or something, for it to stay that that way, it must turn out that the whole of the reference relations stay not noticed. And that means that the world stays not noticed. It doesn't announce itself. And it's in this that the being in itself of entities, which are ready to hand, has its phenomenal structure constituted. So that's what we said last time. Um, this is when entities are most themselves, equipment at any rate. And equipment is the basic kind of entity. In such privative expressions as inconspicuousness, unobtrusiveness, and non-obstinacy, um, these are the ones where they're not coming up and being noticed, what we have in view is nevertheless, I want to say, a positive phenomenal character of the being of that which is proximally ready to hand. So despite the fact that when you're hammering with the hammer, fully transparently and fully um, skillfully, and it's withdrawing completely so that you're not noticing it at all, the right way to characterize it is that the hammer, qua hammer, plays no role at all in your understanding of what's going on in that activity. Despite that, Nevertheless, this absence of noticing is itself a kind of pho positive phenomenal presence. It's the kind of thing that phenomenology can study. And it's a kind of positive phenomenal presence precisely because it already involves some kind of familiarity, some kind of what he um, calls, uh, and I don't think I talked about it last time, uh, but I talked about it a lot in section, what he calls circumspection, some kind of awareness uh, of, let's see, what's that, some kind of, you don't, it's hard it's, even to use the words, you don't really, you re, circumspection, some kind of uh, comfort with the environment that you find yourself in. I'll just, let me just make a point about how hard it is to say this um, by talking for a minute about the word circumspection. I hadn't thought I would do this. Does anyone have the first or an early place where he introduces the word circumspection? 68? That's very early. Yeah, 90-something out of thought. 98, great. Yes, oh, good. Oh, well, maybe I did. Did I read this last time? Dealings with equipment, 98 at the bottom, 69 in the German. Dealings with equipment subordinate themselves to the manifold assignments of the, of the in order to. The dealings, that's our copings. I think I read it for that, to get dealings. And the sight with which they thus accommodate themselves is circumspection. Circumspection is the kind of awareness of the environment that you're in that you've got when you're already familiar with it, already comfortable with it, already know how to get about in it. I guess the way to think about it now, I'll say, refer you to an example I gave last time, is to think about it in contrast with the kind of situation where you're not familiar with the environment at all. Think about it in contrast to the kind of situation where you find yourself in some, some radically different environment. I told, what, what's the, and the idea is that this circumspective awareness, this kind of familiarity with the environment, is something you've already got to have in order for anything in the environment to show up either as obtrusive, that was the example last time, or in any other way. And you, I, I didn't give you the full story uh, of my sort of disastrous experience in France last time, the first time, but, but you, you get it if you go to an environment where, where you really don't know what's going on. And my, the best version of it for me was when I tried for the first time to go to France. I didn't speak French very well. I'd never been out of the country. And I was going to, um, I was going to the national, to the rare books room in the National Library in France. And I'd never been in a rare bu books room. So there were all sorts of practices that I just was totally unfamiliar with. It turns out there are all sorts of practices. How many of you have ever been in a rare books room? In the, yeah. So you know, there are all sorts of things you can and can't do. And they will look at you... <laughs> Right. Very 
disapprovingly if you happen to do any of them. Yeah, and they'll even scream at you. Right, exactly. So imagine that I endorse all those practices and then the French version of them in a language that I don't really speak and I'm trying to get some, but I can sort of read, and I'm trying to get some manuscript. And I discovered, I mean, I was just, I just felt like crumbling into a heap in the middle of the room. I did, there were chairs, but I didn't know if I could sit on them. There was a table, but I, it wasn't at all clear that I could write on it or read on, or anything on it or put anything on it. There was some person I was supposed to go to, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do when I got there. And he gave me some plaque that seemed to be, I mean, I didn't know what its identifying features were. It had a number and a color. But other plaques didn't have numbers, and others were, were sort of no particular color. And I, didn't know, I sort of got the idea, because he pointed, that I was supposed to bring it to someone else. But I got there, and the person looked at me like I was an idiot. And I just, I mean, I was just, I had, it was as if I had no idea at all what I was supposed to do with any of the stuff that was there. And so none of the stuff, it wasn't even as though it was obtrusive. Everything was obtrusive. And it was all so obtrusive that I just, I wanted to collapse in a heap in, in tears. And, I mean, it came to the point where I wanted to ask where the bathroom was. And I thought, I thought if I could, if I could just just find the bathroom. I could go cry somewhere. And, <laughs> and I couldn't even do that. I had the wrong word for bathroom. I ended up asking whether there was a bathtub. <laughs> and of course they looked at me like I was crazy. And, then I, and it just the whole thing was a disaster. Okay, so, so, and you can imagine, if you've ever had an experience like that, you can imagine that all of those things are things that we just automatically take for granted and understand, in some sense of understand. Now, and of course, there was some period during which we had to learn those things. When, you know, children make very funny mistakes. Uh, they do incredibly socially inappropriate things without even recognizing that they're socially inappropriate. Uh, but after you've gotten through that, you hope never to have to go through it again. And the problem is that if you go to another culture, you find yourself... Sort of, sort of like a child uh, again, and you don't have that background familiarity on the basis of which anything can be intelligible as anything at all. So that's what. So circumspection is the word is the word for the kind of familiarity that you've got. And let me just say again how hard it is to say what that means. Literally, circumspection means from the Latin it means looking around, like the German word umsicht, which means looking around. But looking is certainly not what you're doing when you're circumspectively aware of the environment in the way we are here, but I wasn't in the rare books you know, room in the library. It doesn't involve any looking at all. It doesn't involve any noticing of anything. It's an awareness of and a, and a know-how for the environment that, you, that you're in that's, uh, that's not a th any kind of thematic awareness at all. So you really don't want to say looking around. Sometimes people try to say circumspection, circumspective awareness. I mean, it's not awareness. It's precisely the lack of awareness. If, it were, if, if you were aware of the things that you've got this circumspective relation to, then it wouldn't be a circumspective relation. So sometimes people say it's a kind of taking in of the environment. But taking is an act of the subject, and it's not a taking either. So you really find that it's very difficult to... So all you can do after a while is just say, you know that, and then point in the, try to describe the phenomenon and point in the direction of it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there any sense that, I mean, when he's writing this, talking about other, you know, we have our own background um, cultural practices and they're very separate across the globe. I mean, is there any sense is that as the world becomes, you know, as technology allows um, cultures to transcend national boundaries and, you know, the world becomes more cosmopolitan. I mean, theoretically, would those type of innate cultural background practices kind of you know, disappear or merge together? And you oh, it's a late Heidegger question, because, uh, of course, early Heidegger isn't particularly interested. He just thinks we've all got a background familiarity, and that's, that's all there is to say. Uh, late Heidegger becomes fascinated by the differences in these backgrounds uh, familiarities and calls them different understandings of being, at least when they have a particular kind of character. And yes, uh, he thinks that the, the, there's a possibility that technology uh, and globalization and these kinds of things 
will reduce the sense in which there's anything different in the experience that you've got here as compared with the experience that you've got in, you know, of, you know, flamenco guitarists in Seville or something like that. Uh, yes, he thinks that it'll, it, it'll reduce the difference, and he thinks that's a disaster. He thinks that that's the worst possible thing that could happen, because in reducing the distinction between all these local understandings of being, um, it, will, it will become harder and harder for us to recognize ourselves as disclosive beings that already have this background understanding. We only get to notice it because of the counter classes. And uh, so insofar as you haven't got any, you won't be able to take yourself as the kind of being that opens up these worlds, discloses them in terminology that we'll start to introduce this time or next time. Uh, and so you'll start to think of yourself in the end, he thinks, as a kind of, as a kind of resource that's just sort of pushed about by the world. And, it, and that's the end of being if it, hap if it goes that way. Yeah, there's no more being and there's no more us. So he thinks that, that would be a disaster. Yeah? Yeah, this is kind of a related question. Like, um, so even in here, though, he sort of makes that, just that comment about radio. Uh -huh. I remember that little piece right where he's talking about the radio is a disaster because it, it destroys our perception of space. Yeah. Right? So that's not exactly, that's already a, a sort of, these technological concerns are even sort of present here. Right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It also seems also like a, like a normative commitment already, right? Like it, it is kind of like a, a, a tossed off comment, right? Yeah. But it does sort of show like a, a sort of, at least some sort of conviction about what it was our proper relationship to the world, right? Well, that's right. Namely, we disclose it. I mean, that's what we'll find out. That's his terminology for it. We, we, we disclose the world, and um, that's not exactly a relationship to it, as if the world were some pre-existing thing. But, but yeah, that's, it's, and that's right. It's a kind of a normative... I mean, you know, like I say, there's sort of normative commitments and sort of not normative commitments. What he'll say is, yes, it's true, that's really the kind of being that we are. Of course... There are different ways that you can take up that being. You can take up that that your, you can take a stand on yourself as that kind of being by rejecting the idea that that's the kind of being that you are, and you can act in the rejection of it. He'll call that a, a mode of in, a, an inauthentic mode of being for Dasein, and that seems to have a, a normative kind of commitment to it. Although he'll say, but still, you know, I'm just describing stuff. It's really uh, later. I think he will try to. I think he'll have more commit more of those sorts of commitments. Though he really, really what he thinks is that um, when you're doing this kind of descriptive phenomenology or on, ontology, um, you're just describing things. And, you know, there is, you'll describe it as a kind of danger because it's the possibility that there won't, uh, that there won't be a, this kind of being anymore. He'll describe technology as presenting a kind of danger. But he'll also try to say why... Um, getting in the right relation to technology, this is later stuff, getting in the right relation to technology um, opens up possibilities that are greater possibilities, that, and the right relation isn't rejecting it. Getting in the right relation to it opens up possibilities that no other uh, culture in the history of being has had. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Ailen. That's right. So, so in a sense that the word sight there is not for nothing. You know, it's, That's not, right. uh, it's not like visual perceptional right, but there is still, it is there, sort of the, like, you know, the arch archetype of like the yeah. sense awareness word is yeah. still there. Yeah. Good. So, uh, so I don't want to say that, um, I mean, I was using awareness in a special sort of sense. I was using awareness in the as, yeah as a kind of thematic awareness or something. But I do want I mean what I wanted to emphasize in fact is just the thing that you're pointing out. I mean at, at, in the passage that I read on 106, the whole point is that even though this phenomenon is characterized using these privative expressions, inconspicuous, non-obstinate, unobtrusive, um, nevertheless. Um, the, it's a pos what we have in view is a positive phenomenal character of being. Right? A positive phenomenon. It's not something that I'm aware of, but it's something that I've already understood 
uh, and is already intelligible to me in the, in the know-how sense. Okay. So you got this big question. Uh, and the big question is something like this. Uh, if equipment exists only in the referential totality of in order to relations, and if it withdraws completely when it's most itself, then how are we supposed to study the in order to relations that define the equipment? Where are we supposed to find them? I already said that whatever they are, they're not the kind of thing that you can, you know, they're not mere abstract uh, pointers of the sort that you could draw a map for. There's something more to them. And, uh, and if they're, the more to them is precisely what you're not thematically aware of when it's most the way it is, then how are you supposed to figure out what it is? And that's a weird and a hard question for Heidegger. It's not all that obvious to me that he's got a, bet, a, a good answer to it. But he's got to have a good answer in order to be able to say something about what the existential structure of worlds is, about what the worldhood of the world is. If it's, if it's made up of this refer, these reference relations, and then we've got to know if the world, that's what the existential structure of the world is. Then we've got to be able to say something about what those reference relations are in order to understand worldhood. And if, if we can't get on to them, because they're most themselves when you're not noticing them, then it looks like we're in trouble. So that's where the mode of unreadiness to hand comes in. And Heidegger's introducing it already, I think, on 94, I think. Yeah, well, he's introducing it on 94, which is 66 in the German. And he says, about uh, three quarters of the way down, that world of everyday Dasein, which is closest to it, is the environment. Environment's like a subworld. It's like the classroom or uh, the workshop or something like that, where, you know, wherever you find yourself right at the moment, the house. Uh, from this existential character of the environment, of average being in the world, what you just sort of find yourself doing normally and usually, our investigation will take its course towards the idea of worldhood in general. So we're going to try it. We're going to start with a particular local environment and then try to figure out what its structural features are. We shall seek the worldhood, the structural features of the environment by going through an ontological interpretation of those entities within the environment which we encounter as closest to us. So we're going to figure out what the structural features of the world are by figuring out what the ontological facts about, about equipment are. And we saw that the ontological facts are going to include that equipment is defined by its reference relations and that it's most itself when it's manifesting those reference relations in the withdrawing way. So, but, so that sets up the problem. The question is how you're supposed to answer the problem. And the answer, I think, is... Um, I mean, so in short, the problem is if equipment is intelligible as what it really is when it's completely transparent, then uh, how am I supposed to be able to thematize it? How am I supposed to be able to say anything about it? And the answer is that there's a mode of being of equipment that makes its structural features stand, show up or stand out, light up, he says. Uh, and the mode of being of equipment is unreadiness to hand. So look at 102. Uh, 72 in the German, uh, about three quarters of the way down the paragraph, ha, the first paragraph, has Dasein itself, in the range of its concernful absorption and equipment ready to hand, does it have a possibility of being in which the worldhood of those entities within the world, that's to say the ontological, existential, structural features of equipment, in which the worldhood of those entities with which it is concerned is in a certain way lit up for it, along with those entities themselves. Is there some way that we have of dealing with equipment that sh makes that equi equipment intelligible to us, not just, uh, you know, um, 
Well, is there some way that makes it, that equipment intelligible to us so that we can figure out what its ontological structural features are, so that we can highlight or light up its in order to relations? And the answer is supposed to be yes. If such possibilities of being for Dasein can be exhibited within its concernful dealings, then the way lies open for studying the phenomenon which is thus lit up, that's the, what the structural in order to relations look like, and for attempting to hold it at bay, that's what the phenomenologist is supposed to do, look at it, hold it at bay, describe it, as it were, and interrogate it as to those structures which show themselves therein. That's why you need the mode of unreadiness to hand. That's what it's supposed to do for us. It's supposed to be the mode of intelligibility of equipment that shows us what the in order to relations really look like. So that's why you want to look at this mode of being. Although I should emphasize, I don't think Heidegger ever calls unreadiness to hand a, a mode of being. And Dreyfus, in his commentary, goes on um, uh, a lot saying, uh, saying that this is actually an important mode of being of, ent- of equipment. And uh, it's sort of unthematized in Heidegger. And I think the, re- the reason it's unthematized is he's not interested so much in, the, in unreadiness to hand per se, what he's interested in is unreadiness to hand insofar as it allows us to see these structural relations that, equip, that define equipment. But he calls um, this mode of being, what we'll call it a mode of being, he calls it, uh, it's a way that equipment has of making itself intelligible to us that's different from the ready to hand mode of being. And he calls it unready to hand. So uh, at the bottom of one O two. I'll, I'll um, well, I'll just keep reading from where I was reading, and then I'll skip a little bit. So, to the everydayness of being in the world, there belong certain modes of concern. Concern again is a way of being uh, open to entities, equipment, in particular. Its concern is something like a generalized, something like a generalized version of the notion of intentionality. Um, these permit, these modes of concern, they're like modes of intelligibility, permit the entities with which we concern ourselves to be encountered. They let them be encountered. That's to say, our being involved with the entities in a certain way lets those freeze, he'll say later, freeze those entities to show up to us in such a way that the worldly character of what is within the world comes to the fore. That's to say, you can figure out what the ontological structures of the equipment is, are. Skipping down to the bottom of 102, um, when, and the particular mode of concern, or mode of intelligibility, or way of uh, being related to objects that he's interested in is unusability. That's one of them, anyhow. When its unusability is discovered, equipment becomes conspicuous. And this conspicuousness presents the ready-to-hand co- equipment as in a certain unreadiness to hand. So that's just to introduce the terminology. I think that's the first place where the word unreadiness to hand uh, uh, comes in the text. An unreadiness to hand is the way that equipment has of making itself intelligible to me whenever there's some kind of disturbance. Whenever it's not presenting itself uh, as available for the completely transparent and skillful pursuit of some, some task that's available to me in the environment. So whenever there's some kind of disturbance, and the three kinds of disturbances that he lists here are conspicuousness, obtrusiveness and obstinacy and they've got different features and I, I won't go into the different features although it's a kind of it's a kind of interesting sort of task for the reader to figure out what, uh, what phenomena he's trying to point at in those cases but, um, but there are lots of other ways in which equipment can uh, be involved in a disturbance and um, He's talking about the, something like the general phenomenon way at the end. I just want to, since we won't get to this um, in the class, I just want to point you to a place where this comes up on 409. 
this is in a section called the temporal meaning of the way in which circumspective concern becomes modified into the theoretical discovery of the present hand within the world. So there's the phenomenon, and then there's the temporal underpinnings of the phenomenon. That's what the end of Division 2 is about. Um, but he's just describing the phenomenon here on 409, uh, at the very end of 357 in the German. And he calls, uh, he calls it discontinuance here, a disappearance of practice. So a praxis. Uh, all of a sudden, for some reason or another, you're unable to go on in the way that it would be not, you're being called to go on. He says, but the discontinuance of a specific manipulation in our concernful dealings doesn't simply leave the guiding circumspection behind as a remainder. Rather, our concern then diverts itself specifically into a just looking around. So what he's describing here is the phenomenon according to which some disturbance occurs. There you are hammering with the hammer, and whoop, the head of the hammer flies off. Okay, some disturbance occurs. He wants to know what the phenomenon is at the moment that happens. And that's what he's describing here. He says, it doesn't just leave the guiding circumspection behind as a remainder. There was this guiding circumspection, this know-how for going on, that uh, was a positive phenomenal presence even though it had completely withdrawn from view. Um, There was that. And it doesn't just leave that behind as a remainder. It does something else. Our concern diverts itself specifically into a just looking around. Somehow, what you become aware of, it's supposed to turn out, is um, the, in order to of the equipment that you were earlier acting in accordance with. The hammer is for hammering, is in order to hammer. But this is by no means the way in which the theoretical attitude of science is reached. Okay, so, that, so this isn't yet a moment according to which you get a scientific interpretation of the hammer. You could do that. You could give a, a scientific analysis of the hammer. You could figure out what its shape is, what its size is, what its uh, material, what the material that it's made of is. You could figure out what its mass is, and so on and so forth. You could do a scientific analysis of the hammer, but you haven't done that just in virtue. That's not the way the hammer is intelligible to you in the moment in which the head flies off and you can't hammer anymore. Um, This is by no means a theoretical attitude of science. On the contrary, the tarrying which is discontinued. So the tarrying is a funny word. what, What was going on was before the hammer broke was that you were tarrying along with it. You were, a lot, you were a, you're in your engagement with it and in its engagement with you, you were letting it be the thing that it most is. He's got this bizarre, I think, and, and likewise, it was letting you be a version of the thing that you most are because you were. T- it was letting you take the stand on your being that you take when you're busy being the hammerer by way of hammering. And you were letting the hammer most be itself, because when it, as if to say, when it was lying in the drawer, it was just um, disconsolate, you know? sort of left alone. You, it wasn't freed to be itself as it really is most in itself. It's as if it's sort of, and, and these, these words, um, the involvement, it's got in, an involvement with. Uh, the, the other equipment. That's something like, it's directed towards the nail. It's always directed towards the nail. And when it's really involved in the activity of hammering the nail, then it's most being itself. It's sort of, it's got, it's this, it's got a kind of, it's put a kind of, as I keep saying, a kind of activity out into the world. So before you were just tarrying with the thing, and you were happily each of each of you, you and uh, with the hammer and the hammer with you, um, allowing one another to be most as you are in yourselves. Um, but when it's discontinued, uh, on the contrary, the tearing which is discontinued when one manipulates take, can take on the character of a more precise kind of circumspection. So all of a sudden, you've got a different kind of circumspective awareness. It's not the circumspective awareness that's completely withdrawn, that's know-how and familiarity and just going on in the way one does. But instead you've got a different kind of circumspection, such as inspecting 
checking up on what's been attained or looking over the operations, inspecting like, huh, that's funny. <laughs> the handle doesn't have a, a, a head on it, right? All of a sudden, so that's the inspecting. Uh, and you're looking over the operations which are now at a standstill because you can't hammer with a hammer anymore. Holding back from the use of equipment is so far from sheer theory. So this is, all, this is another way of being involved with the hammer. A different kind of circumspective awareness. An awareness in which you've discovered it as a hammer because you can now see that it's standing out as something that can no longer do the thing that it's meant to do. But that's not anything like a scientific kind of awareness of the hammer. It's a different uh, kind of awareness, a different kind of intel intelligibility, and it's something that needs to be named. Uh, so holding back is so far from sheer theory that the kind of circumspection which tarries and considers remains wholly in the grip of the ready-to-hand equipment with which one is concerned. So wholly in the grip of, that's to say, in an important sense, what you're now able to become directed towards is the very in order to relation that you earlier had a totally transparent and withdrawn and practical understanding of. That's what become, you, become, uh, you become able to dir direct yourself towards at the moment that the hammer breaks down. And that's why unreadiness to hand is supposed to play um, such, an, such an important role here. Because it, whatever that is, whatever that um, mode of intelligibility is, it tells you something about what it tells you something about the structural relations of, of the world. Okay, so that's so I, I can say more about that, and I will say more about that, and I'll um, and I'll read more passages. But let me just stop for a moment. Um, yeah, well, let me just stop for a moment. Yeah, go ahead, Celine. I was a bit puzzled by the fact that Heidegger says a more precise kind of Right. I think. I guess. I mean, I, ha I hadn't thought about it, but I guess if I had to say something, I'd say it's more precise because it's really directed not any longer at the whole familiarity uh, uh, with the whole environment around you, but it's really directed at um, the in order to relation of the hammer that's now showing itself. That's so. It's, it, that's what's that's what's lit, lit up at this moment. Um, and yeah, yeah. I have a question about when they have new additions, the changes are done by Heidegger himself or not? Uh, they well, they were. I don't know if there have been additions since he died, which is so 1976. On, the, on page 107. Yeah. It's exactly related to what you're saying. So. Um, yeah. Um, it's about like how we understand the hedge right? I mean, how we come to basically grasp that mode of being by yeah. so unwritten slant. And then it's on the top of 107, it says, why can't the worldly character of what is within the world be lit up? So yeah. the, if it is so withdrawn, how can we know it, right? And exactly. then the present at hand of entities is trust to the fore by the possible breaks in that referential totality. But it doesn't seem right. And the redness at hand is show up by true unwritten to hand. So if you look at the footnote, it's yeah. in the past, it's like yeah. I said, but yeah. then he changed it to, so I was wondering who made those. I, I think that he probably made it, although it doesn't say in which edition it was it was changed. Um, I suspect that he made that. I think this is where, um, this is one of the places where um, Dreyfus's complaint that he, the notion of unreadiness to hand is really unthematized. It comes to play. If you look earlier on 103, when he's describing um, the phenomenon of, conspicu of conspicuousness, he names it as a kind of unreadiness to hand. But then when he goes through and describes it, and we'll look at it in a little bit more t detail, the word unreadiness to hand doesn't show up anywhere. There's presence at hand popping up and a readiness to hand withdrawing. And it's as if he's got these two poles and he hasn't really understood that there's this continuum in the middle that names something. But I thought the part that he read it for, um, what was it, 409, was saying yeah. that 
So there is a sense in which being like we don't actually uh, taken away from this by like, complete absorption, yet still the practical concern in a way is still there because you're still yeah. seeing this thing. Now we are seeing yes. it as sort of as but yet still within the context of the practice, not by itself yet. That's right. And at that moment it seems to be the order structures coming up as what I understand yes. saying. Yeah. But even as the case, at that moment, yeah. what I'm understanding is some clues about when he's had, had more than this is the topic of 107. Good, so yeah. why would he say no, right. President had I Good. Well I'll tr- I'll try to explain it. I think there's a I think there's something in the phenomenon that he's pointing to. Um, I'm not sure it'll it'll explain that particular passage because I wasn't thinking about it in that context. But I I, I will say something about it in what, when we read the 103 thing. Yeah, Marissa. Hi. Um, okay. I have, I have a question that's that's related to this. Like just to go back to the moment where the the, the uh, hammer breaks off. Yeah. For instance, when I'm writing with my pen and it starts leaking. Yeah. All over the place. So in that moment where it breaks down, what exactly it is that comes to light? It's the ontological structure. But does that include, in that moment, even if it's not the moment for scientific analysis or awareness, right. is it a moment in which something about the material or mechanical structure of the of the tool also becomes not not to light? Not in that moment, usually, but it could come to light later when you inspect it in order to fix it and so on. Yeah, but the idea is that in that moment, what becomes clear is that it's no longer um, available to do what it what, what it is in order to do. That's supposed to be the so idea. Even as the head of the hammer is flying off and you're watching it fly off, there's no awareness of that's not that's not okay. Yeah, there's awareness of sort of. Well, he, I'll, I'll read his description. I think he, he has an extra thing in there that might be might be kind of interesting. I'll yeah. I'll comment on it. But think about it for yourself. Like, this is what you ought to be doing. Think about it for yourself. Think about the case where you're using just completely transparently some piece of equipment. It's so transparent that you're just, you're, you're just not noticing it at all. It's completely withdrawn. And then something breaks in. Some disturbance occurs. And, all of a su- and the question is, what's the way in which the equipment's intelligible to you at that moment? That's the, that's the question. And Heidegger's got a, a, a story about it. And of course... There, there will be lots of different kinds of disturbances, so there may be lots of different stories, and getting a sense for what they are might be important. Yeah? yeah I wonder if the time factor does not play a very important role yeah. when you compare the present moment to the present attempt and the ready attempt. Take this example. There is a, a little child with a hammer. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't know yet how to use the hammer. For the little child, uh, the hammer is very obtrusive. Yeah. It's more a present to hand than ready to hand. So isn't this a process then of, uh, let's say, a trial and error incrementalism, which leads you in the process of time from a present attempt to um, a ready attempt? Yes. So that's the developmental process. And there is definitely that. Uh, and there's even that, like, like I said, there's even that when you go to a new culture where you've got to learn a whole bunch of new, you know, a whole bunch of new practices. And at the start, they stand out as obtrusive in this very dramatic way. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, the child, especially, has to learn a whole bunch of those practices in order for it finally to gain something like a background familiarity on the basis of which it can go on in one situation or another. And there's no moment at which it would be right to say that the child has done it or hasn't done it. There are clear cases where it hasn't done it, clear cases where it has done it, and light dawns gradually over the whole. So there is that developmental process. And sometimes it's helpful to think about what it's like to be involved in that developmental process because... It, it gives you a contrast class for, for, what we're, for what he's trying to describe. It's very difficult sometimes to understand what he's trying to describe unless you can understand what it's not. But basically he's trying to describe the case in which you've already got, you've already got all these skills up and running. And then he wants to know what the background familiarity is in that situation. And, and once you've got the background familiarity in this, that situation, you, you get this unreadiness to hand. Let me just let me just read um, what he says about the conspicuousness case, because there's some, there, I won't read the I won't talk about the whole thing, but there's something 
I think he's just a good phenomenologist. I mean, read this. So, but at the top of 103 I am now, uh, which is 73 in the German. But this implies, I'm just reading on from where I was before, there's a certain unreadiness to hand. But this implies that what cannot be used, the hammer that's, whose head has just flied off, flown off, this implies that what cannot be used just lies there. It shows itself as an equipmental thing which looks so and so, and which in its readiness to hand as looking that way has constantly been present at hand too. Pure presence at hand announces itself in such equipment, but only to withdraw to the readiness to hand of something with which one concerns oneself. That is to say, the sort of thing we find when we put it back into repair. So I'm just going to stop there. The, th- the thing I want to highlight, although I don't, I don't think it does anything for him, but I think it's an interesting sort of moment in the description. He's got this idea that pure presence at hand announces itself only for a moment, only to withdraw to the readiness to hand of something with which one concerns itself. So I take it what that means is something like, there's a moment immediately when the hammer's head is flying off the handle. There's a moment of pure unintelligibility because you were so transparently coping with the thing and this is such a radical disturbance that there's just this moment where all of a sudden you have no idea whatsoever what's going on. There's just an obstruction, a disturbance, a moment of total and utter confusion that's so radical that although there's something before you, it's completely unintelligible what it is. I take it that's the moment of pure presence at hand. And it's not even as though the thing is understandable as having present hand properties, the way a scientist might be able to describe the the mass or the weight or the size of something. There's just this instant of total and utter unintelligibility, which somehow after after a moment draws back, and then you get something like a kind of intelligibility, but it's a radically different kind of intelligibility than you had when, you, when the thing was totally withdrawn. And it's a different kind of intelligibility than this radical unintelligibility that you had for a moment also. And, uh, and that's supposed to be just a good description of what it's like to be confronted with this kind of situation. And it, I think it is. I, th- I think this is one of the things, one of, it's a sort of very particular example of what phenomenology sometimes in some circumstances, some ontic cases, can do. If you, if you think about that case, I think he's got it right. I think he's got that aspect of it right. And I've never, I never noticed that before. I mean, it's just never even occurred to me to think about that before. It's supposed to highlight for you some aspect of your experience that once it's highlighted for you, you can recognize as a true characterization of what goes on, but which you'd never noticed before. That's one of the things that phenomenologists are supposed to be able to do, and I think this is an example of it. Yeah, Roni. Uh, I just have a question about the end of that. Uh, oh, yeah. That's why I stopped about. reading, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you said that pure, so, so you said that presen- the presence at hand withdraws the readiness to hand something with which one concerns itself. That is to say, the sort of thing we find when we put it back into repair. And I wanted to ask whether that should be read as when it has been repaired or while we are putting it back. I think while we are putting it back. So you, what you're, what you're um, directed to, to is something like the functional character of the thing. Like, in order to hammer nails in, the head's got to be back on. That kind, of, that kind of thing. Which is a way of taking the... Which is a way of, ta- t- of the, intel- uh, the hammers being intelligible to you. That's, that's different. Yeah. Um, Uh, you mean like how this no, this sense of president hand is still a precise a big notion of president hand? Yeah, that's right. Body. Yeah, exactly. That's right. President hand is kind of what we're putting it back together, even if when we decide to throw it away, that it can't be. What if we decide it can't be salvaged? And, then sorry, well, I missed we the beginning of the question. Hammer is broken beyond repair. Yeah. We decide to just throw out the parts. That that awareness. Of that's still, that's still an understanding of it in its unreadiness to hand. I mean, it becomes sort of even more unready to hand. I mean, the, the present at hand understanding of it comes when you, when you literally start to look at it and try to figure out what properties it's got. Um, 
But so the idea here is that this mode of intelligibility is a mode of intelligibility that doesn't understand the equipment as having properties, where properties are context-free and independent in the way that we discussed in the first two lectures. It understands it as having something else that you could only understand it as having against the background intelligibility that you've already got of the whole context of the workshop, the whole context of the project that you're engaged in, the whole context of the equipment that makes the workshop into the thing that it does, and so on. It's against the background of that understanding, pre-understanding that you've already got, that, um, that the, what, what I'll call aspects of the hammer, rather than properties of the hammer, um, become um, sh show up for you. Yeah. Um, I have a problem with hammering. Um, <laughs> me, me too. Um, from the I mean, the, the example you give already directs, the, you know, the you know, the, the ad, you know, the, the way of, of your thinking. I think if we don't use hammering as an example, we use language as, a, as an example. For example, like toy using language. Yeah. I mean, at least to me, more than toys, they're no longer writing about from a, like they're still writing about, but they have a new chain. Besides writing about the philosophical profundity or like really important ideas, they're also writing about language. Mm -hmm. You know, it's writing youth language to write about language. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, T.S. Ellis had I twist language, I break the nets of language in order to do, to do poetry. Mm -hmm. That means what is unread, unread to hand to ordinary people, you know, like the ordinary way of using language, uh, was, you know, become kind of ready to hand to the poets. Yeah. And this ready to hand kind of thing was used to uh, make language to, to be present at hand. So, you know, then in this sense, the, the present at hand, ready, readiness to hand, kind of, you know, confused with each other. Confused with each other. So, let me stop you there. Big, um, so, I think it's right that this is probably not a good description of what language use is like. Um, and I think... Even Heidegger, in Being in Time, recognizes that it's not a good um, characterization of what of what language is, or what uh, what it's like to use language when we're when we're using it to say things, for instance, or to you know to write poems or something. Um, we'll see when we get to section 34 that Heidegger's uh, word for language, his, his German translation of the Greek word logos, is, um, which is so, so supposed to be language in the full phenomenological sense, is discourse. Um, and he asks the question what the mode of being of discourse is, and he says, I'm not sure, I think it's probably not equipment, uh, but I'm not sure what else it could be, because uh, the, only, the only categories I've got really are equipment and... and <laughs> us. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not really sure what to say. And, and in fact, later on, a bunch of people have been asking about artworks uh, and what, whether they should count as equipment. I think they, they shouldn't count as equipment. Maybe, maybe today we'll get to talk about signs, which, although he tries to make them equipment, are a funny kind of equipment, because unlike equipment in, of the normal sort, um, which withdraws when it's most well, most itself. Signs have to be conspicuous in order to do what they're equipment for. And so already he's got a kind of chink in the armor, in the sort of universalist armor of the project of being in time, which is meant to be a full ontology of everything that there is. Language is certainly a big, a big area, uh, and later Heidegger becomes obsessed with language and has fascinating things to say about it. Um, my, well, my, these just to speak gnomically for a moment, it turns out that in later Heidegger, um, we don't speak, language speaks. Language speaks instead of us speaking. I mean, it's constantly putting the activity outside of us in the world, sort of, in something. Uh, and that's one of the things that happens with language. But so you're absolutely right that language is, it's not a good, probably not a good description of language. Um, and he sort of sees that, but he'll see it more clearly later. Okay. So, I, uh, I guess I, I, I want to read, I think I want to read this thing on 104, which sort of sums up what I've been saying. Um, so, I'll just point you to it. If you look at 104, 
uh, which is the middle of 74 in the German. So he's got these three modes of unreadiness to hand, um, and they're supposed to uh, be the mode of being or the mode of intelligibility that equipment can have that shows us something about the structure of the world. So, And that's what he's saying here. Inconspicuousness, obtrusiveness, and obstinacy, which can't, by the way, be anything like a complete catalog of the modes of the ways in which things can be equipment can be unready to hand. But in these three ways of uh, unreadiness to hand, that which is ready to hand loses its readiness to hand in a certain way because it's no longer withdrawn. But in our dealings with what is ready to hand, this readiness to hand is itself understood, though not thematically. In these, um, that's to say, in these breakdown kinds of cases. Um, the, the readiness to hand is, is itself understood, though not thematically. It doesn't vanish simply. That reminds you of the statement on 409 that circumspection doesn't, it doesn't just get laid aside. It doesn't vanish simply, but takes its farewell, as it were, in the conspicuousness of the unusable. So readiness to hand still shows itself, but not now by withdrawing, but instead by showing its ontological character. And it's precisely here that the worldly character of the ready to hand shows itself too. So that's, the, that's why you're interested, that's why Heidegger's interested in the unreadiness, in the unreadiness to hand. Um, and he says, um, I won't read the whole next paragraph, um, but he says in the next paragraph something like, that um, once you see this in order to structure in its totality as a whole, and again, this is the holism recurring. Uh, once you see it as a whole, then you've understood something about the worldhood of the world. You've, you've understood something about the existential structure of, uh, of worlds. I guess at the end of the paragraph on 105, in the three lines into 75 of the German. The context of equipment is lit up. The the whole context of equipment is lit up, not as something never seen before. In that moment when you recognize that the hammer can't be used for hammering anymore, it's not as though the the for hammering is something you've never never seen before, but, um, but as a totality constantly cited beforehand in circumspection, but rather as what you were circumspectively familiar with in the know-how that you were applying when you were using the thing to hammer. With this totality, the totality of all the referential assignments, however, the world announces itself. That's what the world is. That's what its, world, that's what its worldly structure is. Okay. So that's, um, that's, wor- the wor- the, that's how you get to the worldhood of the world from unreadiness to hand. Just, I, I guess I'll cycle back. There was one more point. I wanted to make the point, I, I made the point that these in order to relations, when they're lit up and held at bay in the breakdown case, are nothing like context-free or independent properties of an object. They're nothing like I mean, you, you can imagine, and there have been manifold philosophical accounts of the function, functional properties of objects, uh, according to which um, they're just properties that an object has. The toaster is for toasting. It's, it's got a, that's to say, there's a property, uh, there's, a, there's a predicate, uh, there's, a, there's a property out there in the world for toasting, and you just apply that property to anything that counts as a toaster, and it's that in virtue of which it gets to be a toaster. That would, that's what it would be if the equipment got to be the equipment that it is in virtue of having some property properly assigned to it. And Heidegger's saying that's whatever these in order to relations are, they're not that. Because that's not what's shown up. That's not what's lit up in the case of breakdown. What's lit up is something that's deeply and constitutively related to what you already are familiar with in the environment beforehand. And so he's saying this on the bottom of 114. Uh, 
three lines from the bottom, so 83 um, in the German. This is section 18 now. So he says, but the indicating of the sign and the hammering of the hammer, we haven't talked about signs yet, but I'll say a word or two about them. Uh, The hammering of the hammer are not properties of entities. These in order to relations are not properties of entities. Indeed, they're not properties at all if the ontological structure designated by the term property is that of some definite character which is possible for things to possess, period. Anything ready to hand is, at the worst, appropriate for some purposes and inappropriate for others. That's supposed to point you in the direction of what you already understand and and are familiar with in being um, at home in the workshop, say. And its properties are, as it were, still bound up in these ways in which it's appropriate or inappropriate. So, to say they're still bound up in these ways of appropriateness and inappropriateness is to say that the hammer couldn't have the property, quote, unquote, those are scare quotes, couldn't have the aspect, we'll say, of being for hammering unless uh, you, unless it was already the case It couldn't be intelligible to you as for hammering unless it was already the case that you were familiar with and at home in the kind of appropriateness and inappropriateness that's um, relevant to the workshop. Uh, Good. So that's where I want to stop. So they're not properties. We'll call them aspects. That's not a Heidegger term. And he does use the term aspects um, in this area in a, different, uh, in a different way, but he puts it in scare quotes. So I'm just going to take the term aspect, which is a term that other, others use also, to, to indicate the situationally characterized in order to um, features or, let's say, characteristics of, um, of equipment uh, that are lit up in circumstances of breakdown. Okay. That's, okay, so that's a, that's a stopping point, and I'll go on to say something brief about signs, but since it's a stopping point, I better make sure that it's all as, as crystal clear as it could, as it could possibly be. Uh, so are there questions that, would, that are left hanging? Everybody is delighted. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's hard to make this much. I, I think it's kind of like a question about the entire project, but like, I mean, if, if, if context in its totality is lit up like this, doesn't it lose its worldly character in being humanized? I mean, isn't it like, I guess that's the big question. But like, it's really, yeah. Like, yes. It, like, it depends on like, a trick of language or something. Well, you're right. I mean, the answer is yes, it does lose its worldly character. I mean, it gets um, diverted from its worldly character or developed out of its worldly character or something. It's hard to know what word to use. But you're right. It's no longer what it was. So when, I, um, when the hammer is intelligible to me as for hammering in this moment where just after the, he- the, the head of the hammer has flown off, at that moment, it's intelligible to me as for hammering. And that's to say... The worldly character is lit up and it's no longer withdrawn. It's no longer what it was um, when I was familiar with it in the skillful sort of know-how way. And yet, um, I'm supposed to learn something about what I was familiar with earlier. But But like you say, there's a trick. Because I can't really learn about what I was familiar with earlier since what was essential about it earlier, is that it was withdrawn. And now, insofar as I can notice it, name it, and and be uh, inspected, and so on and so forth, it's not withdrawn. So, if an essential feature of it was that it was withdrawn, and now it's not withdrawn, then it's hard to say that what I'm noticing now is essentially identical with what there was before. And in fact, it's not, I think, essentially identical with what there was before. And yet, there's a relation between the two. Namely, I couldn't have the kind of intelligibility of the hammer that I've got now as for hammering unless it were the case that earlier I I was already familiar with it in this completely withdrawn way. That's the claim. That's the claim. Uh, There's not... And and you... 
That, I'll just point out, because this is really the important point. What that means is that insofar as it's right, in some sense, to say that when the hammer's unready to hand, I'm aware of it as for hammering. So there's a kind of as structure. I notice it as for hammering. Um, as far as it's right to say that, um, then uh, it's not right, I think, to say that it was earlier, when it was completely withdrawn, avail intelligible to me as for hammering. If it's completely withdrawn, then the as can't be part of it. And yet, whatever know-how I had of the hammer when I was hammering with it, and it was completely transparent to me, that's such that it's that on the basis of which it's possible for it to be intelligible to me as for hammering. So this is a very deep and difficult issue, and I don't think Heidegger himself even is always clear about it. But I think that's the, that's the position that you end up with once you... Once you turn things around as completely as he claims to be claims to be doing it, I'll and yet I'll just say there is this interesting fact that um, there must be other ways, uh, other kinds of equipment. Even I mean, a a people have noticed already that this doesn't seem to characterize language. Or this doesn't seem to characterize works of art. Uh, that this doesn't, there's, there are certain things that seem rather important in our world and to us uh, that don't seem to fall under this kind of, this kind of treatment. Uh, and I think, and Heidegger already notices that, though he notices it in a funny way. He wants to say, look, there's, um, here's his way of introducing the signs stuff. He wants to say, look, what I've just shown you is one way in which equipment can uh, make itself intelligible to Dasein so as to show, to light up some aspect of the worldhood of the world, of the structural features of, of the world. But he wants to say, I think there's another way that that can happen too. It's not just when there's a disturbance in equipment. There's some kind of equipment that's actually devoted to showing us structural features of the world. And that kind of equipment is science, he says. And he gives this very charming description of, uh, he says something like, some automobiles are, are, are made up with a, a blinking red arrow on their back that <laughs> sometimes the driver can turn on to indicate that he's going to be turning right. <laughs> Left, whatever. Okay. So, and this is, an, this is his example of, of a sign. And roughly, since the bell is ringing, I'll just give you the two-sentence version of it. Roughly what, what he thinks is that signs are equipment... But they can't work unless they're conspicuous. But the kind of conspicuousness that they've got is a conspicuousness that shows you something about the structure of the world. Because it's not just that it indicates rightness, this right turn arrow. It somehow directs people's activity in such a way as to bring out possibilities for action in the environment or possibilities for, um, for ways of using uh, equipment. Yeah? Yeah, just real quick. Is, is this talk about science like a sort of way of getting a grasp on the phenomenon of reference? Uh, yes. This sort of way of kind of talking about the phenomenon of reference using the sort of existential analytic piece that we developed at this point, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. And, and there's lots and lots of things to say. It's related to what Husserl has to say about signs and Husserl has to say about reference. We won't say it all today. Um, next time, though, we'll move on to involvement and significance, and we'll talk um, hopefully some about Descartes as well. Um. Uh, if you look on the syllabus, you'll, uh, you'll see that this whole week we're scheduled to talk about the critique of Descartes and the spatiality chapter. And we are going to get to those things. Um, I'll probably spend a little less time on the critique of Descartes than Heidegger does, just because I think the way we've been laying it out, the critique of Descartes should be pretty obvious. Um, it sort of follows from what we've been saying rather than introducing something new. I will say something about the critique of Descartes. And I'll say something about the spatiality chapter, although 
um, every time I read this faciality chapter, my head nearly explodes um, because I, I, I think it's confused and I can't quite figure out in what ways it's confused. And so, uh, anyhow, we will get to that. Um, but we're, we've left hanging some stuff from last week that I want to start with. And um, my head is near exploding um, on that stuff. And so I will, uh, I will hope that, um, I, I'll hope that through the discussion today we'll get clearer about it. I've gotten pretty clear on it, um, but there are still some bizarre issues. So, uh, the, and the issues all have to do with uh, notions of reference or assignment, uh, which are two English words for one German word. This is what's sometimes called hendiasis. There's a, uh, a single German word, um, and uh, and there's it's it's got meanings that don't really correspond to the meanings of any single English word, and so. Um, they sometimes use two words to translate one. That's from the Greek, hen, which is one, and dios, which is two. So two out of one. So you use this term, uh, these terms, reference or assignment, um, to translate. I guess the German word is verweisung. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so th- that's one cate- one category of stuff that we're going to talk about. The the notion of reference or assignment, uh, which is discussed in, in section 17, and we've discussed it some already. Um, and then the notions of involvement and the notions of significance. These are all notions that are crucial to Heidegger, Heidegger's discussion of uh, the existential structure of a world, um, which is to say the worldhood of the world. Worldhood is the is the name for the existential structure. And, and there... They're difficult and confusing, but I think if you get them straight, um, uh, you're properly set up for the rest of the book. So there's a lot at there's a lot at stake here. Um, so I want to I want to ease my way into the discussion of of those topics from section 17 and 18. Um, I, I keep mentioning at the end of, uh, for the last two lectures, I've mentioned at the end of the lecture something about signs. So I, I, I want to start off by, um, by saying properly what Heidegger thinks about signs and showing you some of, of the passages. Um, so just to remind you where we've gotten so far, um, remember the notion of unreadiness to hand as a mode of intelligibility that equipment can have um, comes up in the context of the following kind of question. Uh, Heidegger says equipment is what we are proximally and for the most part uh, involved with, uh, what we find ourselves um, in contact with, in our average, everyday dealings with uh, things. Uh, so m- most of the time, the sort of central kind of stuff that we come into contact with is equipment, pragmata, stuff that we use or deal with or cope with. And uh, its mode of being is readiness to hand. And readiness to hand is defined in terms of this phenomenon of withdrawal that the entity equipment is most as it is in itself when I'm using it so skillfully and so transparently that I don't notice it at all. And remember, in that context, the question, the question became something like this. If equipment is what there is, and somehow equipment is what we, is what we uh, deal with in the world, then... If we want to figure out what a world is, we better look at equipment, and we better look at it when it's most as it is in itself. But when it's most as it, in it, as it is in itself, it's, it's withdrawing, we, and so we're not noticing it. So there's this question, how are you going to study the phenomenon that, that Heidegger claims to have named? And last week we saw that the mode of unreadiness to hand, which is complicated and to some extent unthematized, um, but nevertheless discussed, uh, it, the mode of unreadiness to hand is crucial 
because the mode of unreadiness to hand when equipment breaks down and becomes conspicuous, it becomes intelligible to us and is lit up, he says, in a way that shows something about what was going on, or shows something about what was going on already beforehand. And what was going on already beforehand that was that the hammer, before it broke down, the hammer was involved with hammering. That's one of the ways he'll say it. The hammer was involved with the activity of hammering. And now in the breakdown condition, what gets lit up is that this kind of involvement, whatever that kind of involvement was, it's not possible anymore. It's, it's made conspicuous as um, unable to be involved with the activity of hammering in the way that it was already earlier. So that's, lit, that's what's lit up, and that's supposed to indicate that uh, there's some kind of uh, way in which the hammer, when it's most as it is in itself, is involved with, or assigned to, or turned in the direction of this activity of hammering. And we'll see later, I want to focus on this for a moment. We'll see later that, uh, that Heidegger is going to use a funny kind of terminology. He's going to say that in the activity of hammering, there's a process of letting the hammer be free to be what it really is. And this notion of freeing the hammer to be the kind of thing that it really is, uh, is a peculiar notion. As if somehow, before I was involved in the hammering, th th this story happens at two levels. I'm telling it now at the ontic level. It also, we'll see, happens at the ontological level. But let me just stick with the ontic level for the moment. It's as if somehow before I was involved in the activity of hammering with the hammer, the hammer was not free to be uh, most as it is in itself. It was as it, it's as if it were constrained or bound up or enslaved or <laughs> held back or something. It's as if you, know, you get this impression that the hammer's just there waiting to break out <laughs> into, the, into sort of some free space where it can most express its hammerness. And it needs you to be involved with it in the hammering way in order for it to be freed. Uh, to, to most, most to be itself. So you get this image of, um, you know, of the entities having, uh, uh, be, being bound up, uh, and again, they're going to be bound up in two different ways, an ontic and an ontological way, being sort of somehow contained or held in um, from the thing that they would naturally turn towards. Uh, and then there's this activity of freeing them to turn towards the thing they would naturally they would naturally do. This is a, I think this is a bizarre and fascinating uh, understanding of what entities are uh, and what it is for them most to be themselves. And uh, it it's got almost a kind of um, teleological sort of sense to it. As if um, the poor forlorn hammer sitting there in the workshop is, is sort of directed to some end that in the current circumstances when it's sitting there uh, forlorn and alone in the workshop, it can't, it can't properly be directed to. But, but it, what it is, is sort of turning in that direction of the activity of hammering. Okay, so we've, we've got that idea, and we've got the idea that the notion of unre the, the mode of intelligibility of unreadiness to hand shows us this phenomenon, which is essential to the structure of the world. It shows us this phenomenon, it lights it up, 
And as phenomenologists, we're to hold that lit up phenomenon at bay and, 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 and focus on it and describe it. And when we describe it, what we discover is that we can't describe it just in terms of a, a, a context-free, independent property that the hammer's got, the property of having the function for hammering. But there's another way in which this structure is supposed to get lit up also. And that's through the phenomenon of signs. And signs I've mentioned, and I'm going to show you the places where it happens. Signs are also equipment ready to hand, but they're not ready to hand in the way that other kinds of equipment is ready to hand. Because for a sign to work, for a sign to do what it's really intended or supposed to do, for a sign most to be itself, um, it can't withdraw. Uh, if it doesn't stand out and point out something to you, then it's not going to be able to do the kind of sign-like thing that a sign is supposed to do. So the idea is something like uh, if a stop sign were com if it was completely transparent to you whether there was a stop sign before you or not in the way that it's completely transparent to you that there's a hammer there when you're hammering with it then the stop sign wouldn't direct you to stop the car and so it wouldn't do the thing that it's supposed to do. It's supposed to organize activities Signs are. Signs are supposed to organize activities. And they can only do that by way of making themselves known instead of withdrawing. Uh, yeah, and. Sorry, could you argue that when signs are working really well, or that when we're working really well with signs, that in a sense they do withdraw, in that you're not focused on the materiality of the sign, but you look beyond it to the behavior that it's soliciting from you? Well, something, something withdraws. So there's a whole bunch of aspects of the stop sign that withdraw. Like, for instance, the font that they use to write the letters S-T-O-P. Um, maybe the color of the word, uh, and so on and so forth. All that could well withdraw. Um, but somehow you, you, you imagine the meaning of the thing has to, has to come out and strike you. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to go from the activity you're now engaged in, the activity of driving the car forward, to a new activity, the activity of stopping the car. So it's precisely because signs are supposed to direct transitions like that, that they need to bring you out of your sort of completely transparently coping in the way that you are. I, th I think that's the idea anyhow. But you're right, that uh, all sorts of aspects of the sign might well withdraw. Um, the syntactic aspects, the sh uh, formal color aspects and so on. Yeah, Jackson. Could someone say the same thing about um, the shorter chef and the, the tool? The tools are just constantly changing. Yeah. Um, it, someone might say that he has to you know, recognize each of those different tools and kind of see them. They can't be transparent, otherwise, otherwise he can't use them. Um, but it seems to me that the difference between signs and equipment, um, at least when you, at least in a certain perspective, really isn't that different. Um, but I, the one example that I really like, as people in section know, is um, if, you're, if you're playing video game Guitar Hero, um, those signs that scroll down the screen, if you're really good at it, you, you don't even see the signs. You just you just react accordingly. Um, uh -huh. And I, I I don't know the the game. So uh, okay, well, so what do you? Good game, okay. But, um, <laughs> I, I I'm not. I think when signs if, if they're really they're really at their best, you know they they do withdraw, and it may, it may be a different kind of withdrawal, but. So here's something I can imagine. I can imagine two different cases. Suppose there's a case. So suppose you um, you always go uh, uh, for a run on a particular route, and you go. Uh, it's a route. You know, it's a cross country route, and there are signs. You know, arrows that say turn right here, turn left here, and so on. Uh, then I can imagine that there's a difference between the way those signs play the role that they do when you don't know the route and you're using them in order to follow it and the way they play the role they do when you've run the route a thousand times 
and you, so to speak, don't need the signs in order to in order to do something new, in order to follow the route. That, so, in the second case, the signs really will withdraw. You'll just follow the route by rote, so to speak. Um, but to the extent that that's the case, I think um, you won't. The signs won't be acting as signs. I mean, they won't be. They won't be directing your activity now in the way they were directing your activity when you didn't know the route and you needed them in order to figure it out. So I think what Heidegger would say is, sure, it's true. Signs also can recede into the background if the um, work they were doing to organize activity in a certain domain uh, no longer needs to be done. But to the extent that happens, then they're not working as, as signs anymore. Um, uh, I'm not sure that gets your Guitar Hero example because I, c- I can't quite imagine how the game works. Yeah, it might be better to think of this almost a sheet of music that someone's reading off the first time. Yeah, so good. So uh, I, that's more like the issue with Andy. I mean, or, or take the, the words on a page. I mean, there's lots of stuff about the words on the page that you don't notice. You don't notice the font. You don't notice the color. You don't notice the size. You don't. But insofar as it's stuff that's something you've never read before, you do notice what it means. And in the case of, you know, playing the piano or, or playing the guitar or something, uh, even if you don't notice what it, what it means, you, your way of noticing what it means is to be directed to one activity rather than another. And there's a sense in which the sign has to have made itself known, not in its formal or syntactic properties or something, but in its semantic properties. It has to have made itself known in order to direct your activity in one way or another. Yeah, yeah, Alan. When he talks about um, like a certain aspect of survey and how the signs orient our conservable dealings, then what if somebody walks into a tool shed and they do a kind of circumspective survey <coughs> without you know, purposefully allowing their eyes to fall on anything and they see a toolbox, and it's the toolbox then that would serve as a sign for the hammer that's inside. Would that something like that function that way? That orients you to your um, dealings in a tool shed? Um, I'm not sure I get the example. Let me think about it for a second. So, you, do, uh, I mean, it co- yeah, okay, so there are different kinds of signs. And Heidegger does say this. Roni, I think, asked a question about this, uh, about the distinction between natural and non-natural signs or something. Um, there are different kinds of signs. There are the signs that, um, that so to speak, act as signs because... Um, there's a regular correlation between the presence of X and the presence of Y. So you could say X stands for Y, or X is a sign of Y. Those clouds mean rain, for instance. Or uh, there's a regular correlation between the presence of clouds and the presence of rain. Just the way there might be a regular correlation between the presence of toolboxes and the presence of hammers within them. That's, that's a kind of a sign. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, not what uh, Grice calls a, a sign with non-natural meaning. It's a sign that's got meaning just because in the environment there is this, cor- there is this correlation. Um, and it can, I suppose, act as a sign if it turns out that in order for it to do its work, it's got to stand out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I guess I was kind of yeah. taking very seriously when he says um, that the signs let what is ready to hand be encountered, and so it's that kind of signaling that then I can encounter the hammer. Yeah, uh, that's right. But what you what you encounter in the sign, what's supposed to happen is that the sign doesn't let you encounter an entity. It lets you encounter a way of going on. So the indication that there's a hammer there uh, isn't what you want. You want something like the indication that there's the opportunity for hammering available in the context. That's what you want. And so in his example, in the turn signal example on page 108, um, uh, the turn signal example on page 108, so at the bottom, Motor cars are sometimes fitted up with an adjustable red arrow whose position indicates the direction the vehicle will take at an intersection, for example. This sign 
is an item of equipment which is ready to hand for the driver in his concern with driving, and not for him alone, also for those, say, behind him. And what's important is that it's ready to hand within the world in the whole equipment context of vehicles and traffic regulations. It's equipment for indicating, and it has the character of the in order to. What it indicates is, so to speak, how you're supposed to operate uh, in that context. It doesn't, uh, so, and, that's, and that's a full sort of involved notion of indicating. You couldn't have that notion of indicating unless you were already familiar with all these other social norms for driving, for traffic regulations, for giving way, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's the, that's the notion of indicating that we've got it uh, in play. It's, so it shows up, or lights up, the very kind of thing that the unready-to-hand bit of equipment lights up. It lights up um, uh, the mode of involvement of the equipment in this context. Right? It lights up the way in which the equipment is already involved with a certain kind of activity. In the case of the hammer, the activity of hammering. In the case of the turn signal, the activity of driving. And the activity of driving has these options, these possibilities for going forward that are really possibilities for the way in which one, the, the way in which one can go on in the activity in question. Not, so that's the kind of thing that gets lit up by uh, the unreadiness to hand of the hammer, but also by the signs. And so he says this, that signs point out the structural features of the world just the way unready to hand tools do. If you look at 110, uh, at the bottom, page, the very bottom of page 79 in the German, over to 80, signs of the kind we've described, let what is ready to hand be encountered. So, in this way, <laughs> there is this ready to hand equipment that you're dealing with, say, uh, the, say the car that you're driving, right? There is this ready to hand equipment that you're dealing with. Uh, insofar as it's ready to hand and you're dealing with it transparently, it's withdrawing, but the signs let uh, that withdrawing stuff be encountered. More precisely, they let some context of it become accessible in such a way that our concernful dealings take on an orientation and hold it secure. So the orientation is turning to the right or breaking so that the guy in front of me can turn to the right. That's the orientation that the, the coping that I'm already involved with takes. A sign is not a thing which stands to another thing in the relationship of indicating. That's all that you could have if you had the, um, the sort of the Cartesian metaphysics. Um, it's rather an item of equipment which explicitly raises a totality of equipment into our circumspection so that together with it, the worldly character of the ready to hand announces itself. So what announces itself is that equipment, this kind of driving equipment, is for turning or for stopping or for moving you, you along and so on in this, in this kind of existential context. That's the idea. Yeah. Uh, there are probably two different kind of signs. One is, you know, the sign tell you New York City is 100 miles away. And yeah. the other is a red, the red light. Oh, good. Yeah. In, in, in case of red light, it's not just, you know, it's just not just linked to your car or okay, stop your car. But also this kind of social uh, rules, like the law, reinforcement, like responsibility as citizen. Yeah. And if this like responsibility and rule of law internalized, <coughs> I mean, I mean, it has a lot to do if the, the sign actually withdraws. Like if, if this yeah. kind of thing internalized, you yeah. automatically just stop when you see a sign. This kind of different from you know, like have to think, you know, if I don't stop, the police will, keep, will you know, cut, will catch, catch me, you know. I mean, this. Yeah, good. So uh, I think that's, I think what you say is important. It sounds to me like you said two things. The first was that there are these two different kinds of signs. A sign that directs your activity, which is the kind that we're talking about, and a sign that conveys a certain kind of information. New York City's 100 miles away. 
And, of course, the, the second kind of sign could also direct your activity. It's 100 miles away in this direction, and I'd like to go gas. there. So I have better stop for gas and so on. Right, exactly. Uh, Heidegger's going to, insofar as he's got an account of the second kind of signs, which is not very far, uh, but if he were to have an account, he, it would have to be an account that somehow makes those derivative on the what he'll think of as the more basic kinds of signs that primarily direct your activity. So that's one point that you were making. I think that's right. Um, but the second point, you, you said something that, that concerned me in your description of the second point. You said there's a difference between uh, the way signs work when we're unfamiliar with them and the way they work when we've internalized what they're, what they're going to tell us. And I think that's not the way that Heidegger wants to think about it. So let's go back to the example of the signs on the path that you're, of your running route. Also, is the, are the social connections and when you come up with, like, please give the responsibility of the citizen part of the totality of equipment or not? Is what part of the totality? Sorry, say it again. You know, the social connection when you come up with, when you see a red light, for example, you, know, you, you think about your responsibility as a citizen, you know, if you, you know, the re- reinforcement of law and this kind of thing. Yeah, well, I think what Heidegger wants to say in that kind of case is you you could go on and think about all those things, uh, but using the sign as sign or the sign being the kind of thing that it is in itself doesn't in any way require you to think about all those things. In fact, in some important sense, it doesn't require... <coughs> it doesn't really require that you ever have thought about those things in any detailed way. What it requires is that you're familiar with the social norms that manifest those kinds of responsibilities and duties. And if you're already familiar with those from having been brought up in the, in the culture in the right way, uh, then you could go on to think about those things, but that's not what, that doesn't have anything... That's, and that's a possibility... Uh, in the context of using the sign, but it's not it's not the kind of thing that uh, is any is in any way required for it. That's the, the let, me, let me just make the one other point because um, it is important that Heidegger in the case of the of the path that you're that you're running on with the with the arrows uh, when the path becomes very familiar. I don't think Heidegger would want to say that you've internalized the rule turn right at this intersection bear left at the following fork uh, and so on in order to get around the path. I think what he's going to say is and I think this is, this is really a phenomenological claim and I think there's something to it that as you become more familiar with the path the path just looks different and its way of looking different goes all the way down to the bottom of your experience so that one of the things that happens is that the signs withdraw from view. But another thing that happens is that certain uh, roots solicit your activity and others, so to speak, um, repel your activity. So if you become really familiar with the root, then uh, bearing left at the fork isn't a decision that you make. It's a decision you make when you're first learning the root. But after the root, after you're really familiar with it, what happens is that, the, so to speak, the left fork in the, uh, um, in the road sort of automatically draws you in or immediately draws you in. The right fork doesn't even show up as an option. It doesn't even show up as a possibility, as, a way, as an ability for your, for, your act, for your activity, an option for your activity. It just sort of closes itself off. And Heidegger thinks that... Uh, that process of opening up uh, possibilities for acting and, and closing off others just is the process that we go through when we become familiar with any range of social norms or any activity. And, that that, and that that's, uh, that's, the, that's the better description of what goes on in that kind of case than the description that says you've internalized a set of, a set of rules. Alem, did you have a... Good, go ahead. Can you? Wait, right. And from such signs, and there are like quotes around it, for such 
of such signs, we must distinguish traces, residues, commemorative monuments, documents, testimonies, symbols, expressions, uh, appearances. That sounds like the right thing to be reading, but I haven't found it yet. Where is it? On the, on the bottom of page 107, 108. Sorry. Oh, 108. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, aha, uh -huh. good. 78 in German. Yeah. And then you just say, from such signs, from such signs, and they're like, <coughs> we must distinguish traces, residues, commemorative monuments, documents, testimony, symbols. I think symbols will be very relevant to a lot of things about guitar hero and language and whatnot. And expressions, appearances, and significations. So why, he says, that these phenomena can easily be formalized because of their formal relational character. So what we want to understand here, what about this use of signs that he wants to um, tell us here that cannot be captured in this relational, purely relational yeah. character? That's right. So because uh, I think wanting is not helping. We also translate German verb bei as yeah. reference in English. Yeah, right. So in a sense, we translate for Python in two words, but we also yeah. put on reference other work yeah. that we do like. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you do a German Bedeutung. Yeah. So I think these things are confused because of that. So you yeah. want to understand what about Verweisen, which cannot be Bedeutung? Yeah, that's exactly right. Which, what about, that's right. In other words, what about what gets translated here, reference or, I mean, Bedeutung is, is going to have a different meaning in section 18. That's going to be translated significance. So exactly none of them is Bedeutung in Uversin und Bedeutung in Frege, right? I mean, none of them is... Yeah, because one of the things that he puts aside is significations as the last one, right? That's right. So, and yeah. then this, it makes sense if we took it to what is not in, you know, for Bison, which is not relational in this respect, because all the section about why indicating is a relation, but not just a relation... And all that stuff. Yeah. So if you can talk about it, but maybe it would be helpful, I thought. Okay, good. So I'll just say what, what you're referring to is further up on 108. Every reference is a relation, but not every relation is a reference, right? So reference is the verweisung. That's, the, that's this notion of, um, say, the hammer referring to the activity of hammering or the hammer referring to, to nails, the pen referring to ink, the pen referring to the paper. That's a notion uh, that's supposed to be um, different from the empty notion of relation that you could characterize in, say, very abstract set theoretical terms or something like that. Now, so what, what is the difference? I'm, now I'm, I'm going to repeat myself, but it might be useful to repeat myself in this context. What is the difference? To say that the hammer refers to the nail or refers to the activity of hammering is to say that, uh, is to point in the direction of the th what it is, the existential phenomenon that you're able to uh, become aware of and hold at bay in the moment in which the hammer breaks down and becomes conspicuous as incapable of being uh, of referring to the activity of hammering or being involved with the activity of hammering. So what, what you become aware of in that moment is, and now you just have to think of the phenomenon, think of what it's like at the moment the head, the head of the hammer sort of breaks off, you just have to think of the phenomenon. It's not anything empty. It's not anything abstract. It's not anything that could any reasonable way be modeled in set theoretic terms. It's something that you can understand only in virtue of already having the skills for hammering, already having the skills for putting things together, already having the skills of doing all that for the sake of building a shelter, say, or something like that, and so on. So we're, so, and we're going to talk about that. Those are the, those are the involvements. Um, but so here's, maybe this is the way to say it. What you become aware of or able to focus on 
in the moment that the hammer breaks down in the activity of hammering is something you could become aware of only because you've already got the skills for using hammers and only because you've already got the familiarity with the social norms of uh, building things and living in things and leaning on things and so on and so forth. So imagine a person who didn't have any of those skills. Imagine your five-year-old. I taught my five-year-old to hammer over the weekend. <laughs> okay. And, I, and, and he's not very good. <laughs> but he didn't hurt himself, which was great. And, uh, but had the hammer broken down in the middle of the hammering, it would have been neither here nor there to him because he had no, almost no idea what he was supposed to be doing in the first place. Right? So if I'm hammering, I'm not that good either, but I'm better than he is. And if I'm hammering and the hammer breaks down, something leaps out at me that it's not possible for me to go on in the way that it's appropriate or suitable for me to be going on in this circumstance Precisely because the hammer's not able to be involved in the activity in the way that it was. But if I didn't have that skill already, then I wouldn't be able to notice that. So there's a sense in which what I'm noticing is already tied up with the norms for going on. In a way that it couldn't be if, if what I was noticing was just an abstract, theoretical set of properties. If I can just attempt to paraphrase, just for a minute. Yeah. Um, you said that only if we're already skillfully coping with equipment in its relational character or something, <coughs> um, can we, if it then breaks down, become aware of these relations as a kind of reference? Or does uh, reference kind of depends on us already understanding? Yes, reference depends. That's right. So, so see, so uh, becoming aware of the reference relations. Uh, already depends on our having the skills for and familiarity with the domain and the domain constituted by those reference relations. I mean, that's really what you have to say. It's the referential whole um, that's uh, an essential feature of the structure of the world. It's the way in which the equipment relates or refers to all the other equipment that constitutes the structure of the world. And the idea is, I've already got to be familiar with that in order for it to light up and show itself to me. And so what's lighting up and showing itself to me isn't something that you could have absent familiarity with that domain. But he's suggesting that sort of relation is different than reference. Your re relation is just a very abstract <laughs> notion that, um, you know... Uh, um, That's right. That's right. I mean, you know. Yeah, I could say, you know, uh, let the letter G stand for um, God. Or something, you know, what I mean. So there's, there's just no. It's an abstract. It's an abstract symbol that gets a, that gets a certain kind of assignment, absolutely independent of any kind of familiarity in a domain. It's, it's, and it might have, might well have been any other symbol. Uh, the hammer might not well have been any other thing. I mean, if it were a pillow, it couldn't play the role that it does. The letter F would have done fine if I was trying to pick a symbol that was going to symbolize, you know, something. Um, so, so that's the sense in which the hammer, when it's freed for its involvement in hammering, is really freed for something that it was aiming at, so to speak, already. Uh, and that's what part of what makes it a reference, uh, a turning to a verifizung. It's a, it's a, almost like a turning towards or something. Um, that that's what makes it a reference rather than a mere abstract and empty relation. That's yeah. And so and you can see how here we've got um, uh, a resistance to the same kind of thing we started out resisting at the beginning of the term the notion of properties of objects as totally context-free uh, um, uh, features or characteristics that, the, that you know, can be assigned to the object. That totally context-free notion is what, we're, is what he's trying to resist here, I think. Yeah, when? I'm having, so this is something you just, you just came back to about, so, free, so freeing the, like freeing the entity, freeing the hammer to be whatever yeah. it is. And, 
It's <coughs> this, that sounds to me like it's sort of suggesting that we could talk about an equipment, or you know. So I, I guess the question I want to ask is why saying that you know the hammer sort of there's a change that happens when you yeah. begin hammering with respect to you know with respect to the hammer. Like what what is actually like how is that different from the ha the hammer could. I guess why couldn't the hammer be what it most is by being a part of a referential totality such that it's it would be there if I needed it. Like I'm not sure what what switch is actually happening that could still keep me from calling it an equipment or something that's outside of the context. Because if it, if it's always I guess a part of this totality, it's hard for me to. I think another thing is that it, it, it's hard for me to see how it wouldn't be enough for it just to be in the workshop or something that you know. Or why why isn't the let's say the um. The saw that's hanging in the workshop next to me while yeah. I'm hammering, um, yeah. also free, just because if I next need to saw this piece of wood, okay. it would be, you know, it, it, there's some sort of like potentiality to it that would be fine. Um, all right, good. So I half want to. I want to say two things. The first is I want to say I want to show you that Heidegger believes the the thing that you're resisting, or, or suggesting we might be able to resist, and then I want to say why he believes it. But in order to say that he believes it, I have to find a passage that I wasn't planning on reading. So let me just see if it pops out at me. Um, yeah, well, it did. Okay, so on one seventeen. 85 in the German. <clears throat> there's, uh, there's two different kinds of letting be involved or freeing. Um, there's an ontic kind and an ontological kind. And I'm just going to read about the ontological kind. Because that's really the kind that you're asking whether we can have, I think. And, and we can have it. Um, so let me, but, but we have to be clear that when we have it, we've got a particular kind of thing. So 117, 85 in the German, starting in the middle of the page, on the other hand, if letting something be involved is understood ontologically, what's then pertinent is the freeing of everything ready to hand, as ready to hand, no matter whether taken ontically, it's involved thereby, or whether it's rather an entity of precisely such a sort that ontically it's not involved thereby. So the um, you know the hammer, the, the saw that's the screwdriver that's in the drawer in the workshop when I'm busy hammering and sawing is ontologically um, involved in the situation, even though ontically it's not involved in the situation. So um, that's to say, ontologically, it's involved in the situation in the sense that part of what I'm familiar with when I'm familiar with the workshop and the equipment in it is a whole variety of, way, of activities that I could be involved in. There's a whole space of activities that's been, he'll say, disclosed or opened up. And to say that that space of activities is disclosed or opened up is to say that all of the equipment that's uh, in the equipmental whole, that's in the referential whole, um, is ontologically involved. It's the kind of thing, it's the kind of equipment that could be taken up in activities in this context. But ontically it's not involved, but, well, because it's sitting in the drawer, right? right yeah, and so, so, I can, so that's... That's the distinction. I, I want to try to draw that distinction out a little bit more in, in, in a moment. Yeah, one last question. Does familiar, familiarity even come before concern, which is setting these things to use? Familiarity is the, base, is the most basic kind of thing. Uh, and it does come before concern. Uh, he introduces familiarity on page 119. And... In particular, he introduces this notion of primordial familiarity. 119 at the bottom, uh, which is 86 in the German. Um, and just to get the terminology straight, familiarity or especially primordial Familiarity, which is something like um, being familiar with 
any world, a world, uh, in the, the context of which one can take a stand on one's own being, uh, that kind of primordial familiarity happens at the level of care, but that's not a term that we've gotten yet, which in German is Zorg. Um, and then concern is a mode of care, in German, Buzorga. It's one of the ways in which we can be involved with a world, namely by concernfully being directed towards the entities within the world. That's possible only on the basis of the fact that we're already familiar with the world as a whole. So you can see again, what's happening here is he's got this sort of, I take it the Gestaltists sort of took it Probably, well, anyhow, he's got this sort of gestalt-like idea that what you're first uh, directed towards is the whole. But now it's not the whole object like the gestaltists were interested in, but something like the whole world. And it's only on the basis of that that anything can can come out uh, and show itself as something that's already there in the world. So so let me let me move on because... There's a lot more distinctions to make, and I haven't quite gotten to the point where I'm, where, I, where I'm, my head is going to explode. So I'd love to get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to try to talk about involvements and significance, because really, what goes on here. Let me tell you what I think is the wrong way to think about it, because I thought about it this way for a long time. And uh, maybe you're busy thinking about it this way. And uh, if you can understand what's wrong about it, then, then uh, maybe we'll get closer to what the right way to think about it is. So what Heidegger says is the worldhood of the world... <coughs> it seems to have these sort of two components. There's the, uh, the referential whole or um, what, they, what they translate the referential totality but I think whole is really better. It's a unity. It's a whole. That's the whole of the reference relations among the various equipment in the, um, in the world. And then there's the totality or the whole of involvements. And you'd like to know, yeah, you, you, you clearly need both of those to get a world. And you'd like to know what the difference is between them and what the relation is between them. <clears throat> and so... The first thing to think, which I thought for a long time, but I think is almost certainly wrong, uh, is to think that, well, the reference relations, those are the, those are the references that the equipment make to other equipment. The hammer to the nail to the board and so on. And the involvements, those are ways that I could be involved with the equipment. That's a natural thing to think. So there's something like, you know, this is the, the world side and this is the Dasein side. Uh, and somehow, you know, they, they get together because it's the equipment that I'm involved with. Um, but uh, but they're, they're really distinct. I don't actually, th- I don't think that's the way that he thinks of it. Um, and one of the clues that that's not the way he thinks of it, can be found on... Let me see where it is. Well, it can be found on 115. I think I'm just going to read... this passage on 115. So, on 115, we have this notion of assignment or, or reference on the one hand, and we have this notion of involvement on the other, and they're brought together. So, if we were right, 
that the assignment to reference is an assignment to reference of the equipment to other equipment. And the involvement is the way that I have of being involved with the equipment. We ought to find them coming together in this passage on 115. It's 83 to 84 um, uh, in the German. So just before 84 in the German. He says, but what then is reference or assignment to mean? To say that the being of the ready to hand has the structure of assignment or reference. Already that, you, you should be able to hear that now as um, what it is for equipment to be ready to hand is for it to withdraw in the activity. And in that moment when it's withdrawing in the activity, that's when it's referring to or assigned to or turning towards um, Whatever, whatever it's assigned to or referred to or turns towards. The hammer to the nail, say. So to say that, um, uh, to say that the being of the ready to hand has the structure of assignment or reference means that it has in itself the character of having been assigned or referred. So we're, we're making a transition here. Um, the transition is between its... Um, being the kind of thing that is turned towards the nail, the hammer is turned towards the nail, and it's having been, so to speak, um, revealed as the kind of thing, or disclosed as, or maybe you want to say determined as. We're, we're not sure what the, what the word is to use here yet, but it has been assigned to the nail at some point in the past. So the question is, how did it become assigned to the nail? How did the hammer become assigned to the nail? What, what made it uh, assigned to the nail in the way that it is? Um, an entity is discovered when it has been assigned or referred to something, and it's referred as that entity which it is. I'm going to try to make a distinction. Now I'll erase this. But I just want to highlight some of the terminology here. I want to try to make a distinction between disclosing and discovering. This is discovering. So this is, I take it, a definition of what discovering something is. Or sometimes it's, sometimes it's translated uncovering. Um, an entity is discovered or uncovered when it's been assigned or when it has already been assigned or referred to something and it's referred as that entity which it is. So in discovering something, you see the entity as the entity that it is. So in uncovering or discovering the hammer, I see it as a hammer. And when do I do that? When, does, when, do, I, when do I finally see the hammer as a hammer? Well, what's an example? What phenomenon? Yeah, unreadiness to hand. So discovery must be what happens at the level of unreadiness to Um, okay, so we're going to work those out. Now, with any such entity, there is an involvement which it has in something. Okay, here's involvement now. But it's funny use of involvement, isn't it? Because there's an involvement that the entity has in something. And I think the something here is an activity. He goes on to say, the character of being which belongs to the ready to hand just is such an involvement. So there's the hammer that refers to the nails, let's say. And in the activity in which it's being used for hammering, the hammer is involved with something. 
I think it's either involved with the nails or it's involved with the activity of hammering or both. But so far there's no Dasein at all. It's not Dasein's involvement with the hammer that's at stake. It's the hammer's involvement with the other equipment and the hammer's involvement with the activity that's at stake. So we haven't got Dasein yet at all. And that's sort of bizarre and striking. He goes on to say, if something has an involvement, this implies letting it be involved in something. Okay. Well, now there's a letting it be involved. I think that once you talk about letting it be involved, you might be invoking Dasein. I think there's a sense in which Dasein lets the hammer be involved with the nail by picking it up and hammering with it. And there's another sense in which Dasein lets the hammer be involved with the nail, an ontological sense, because it's only because there are practices for hammering with nails at all that hammers can be involved with nails. So those are two notions of letting be involved that, um, that bring Dasein and the equipment into contact with one another. But there are other places in which he says the world is what lets the entities be involved. Um, I didn't highlight that one, so I wonder if I can find it off the bat. Let's see. Well, yes. Yeah. It's where Dasein lived in, right? So there yes. Is, we, we, we didn't talk about that yet, but there's, I mean, there's a certain <coughs> concept of living. So I thought that a human life, and it's generally in moments, is in the first place makes this referential whole intelligible. So in a sense that, you know, there is a, I, I, I like to use more like directional whole instead of referential whole, but it's, okay. it's yeah. a dispute between us. But yeah. it's like, well, you have this different directional whole, right? I mean, it is in the sense that it's for writing. Let's take it in the case of pen, ink, and all these papers, right? It's for writing. Mm -hmm. But where does for writing is supply to? Yes. Where where does it come from is for writing, right? Good. You're you're jumping ahead. So, no, no, no. But that's exactly right. So that's the way I want to try to bring Dasein in. So, but what I want to, so what I want to say is there are two notions of involvement. There's the way in which the hammer is already involved with all the other equipment, and the hammer is involved with the activity of hammering. And that's already a notion of involvement that's just, a, so to speak, it looks at, at the moment anyhow, like it's just at the level of the equipment. What's going to happen is that you couldn't have that kind of involvement, and another word that he's got for it is significance. You couldn't have that kind of significance unless ultimately it grounded out in something like another, another involvement that's in the, in the sort of in play, namely the involvement with Dasein and the stand that Dasein's taking on itself. And he's going to say, that's not, but as it turns out, that's not just another involvement. That's a radically different kind of thing. It's not a way that ready-to-hand kinds of entities can be involved with other ready-to-hand kinds of entities. It's an involvement with a radically different kind of entity, Dasein, and it's only on the basis of that that any of these other involvements get um, get started in the first place. So that's where I'm headed. Yeah, exactly. That's where I'm headed. Um, And I I, I was going to try to pull a little bit out of it um, with this introduction of the phrase, if something has an involvement, this implies letting it be involved in something. So where did the letting it be involved come from? Ultimately, I think, it's going to have come from Dasein. If there weren't social practices for dealing with hammers, then hammers couldn't be involved, in in the first place, then hammers couldn't be involved in the activity of hammering, and they couldn't be involved in the reference to nails and the reference to the structures that you build with them, and so on and so forth. So... That, so that's, a, that's something that Dasein does. It's also something that the world does. And I think this, this terminology of letting be or freeing for, both now, now we're getting into the sort of place where, where I feel pressure on the inside of my head. Um, so 
uh, this terminology of letting be or freeing for seems important for Heidegger. And so I'm trying to figure out what the picture is that, that he's got that requires him to talk in that way. And I think the idea um, is something like this. The world that's, whose structural features involve all these reference relations among the equipment and all these ways that the equipment has of being involved with all the other equipment and with the, da- and the activities that Dasein's involved in, all of, all of that, those structural features of the world are what we're already familiar with in virtue of having been brought up properly. So what we're familiar with, I mean, in, in the context of the culture, so what we're familiar with in the first instance is this whole, this unified whole of the world. And so to speak, if you want to get in contact with any aspect of that whole, then you've got to, well, sort of free it from the unity that it's already that it's already a part of. I mean, not a part. It's not a part of a unity. It's already seamlessly um, uh, held in in a prior unity. So you've got to somehow free it. So what you're already familiar with isn't hammers and nails and boards and structures that you build and other kinds of things that you might find in the workshop. What you're already familiar with is all of that understood as a unity. And it's only in the activity, say, of hammering that you let the hammer stand out from the unity as the thing that it is in its relation or reference to the nails and the structures that you're building and all that kind of stuff. So that's actually, I think, discover. Well, it, it, that is disclosing if it happens at the level of the ready to hand. Okay. So the discovering that happens at the level of the ready. Yeah. So disclosing happens at the level of the ready ready to hand. And I want to say there's no as structure, although there are places where I think the translation does not help us. Um, and I'll try to point to one of them. But, but disclosing happens at the level of the ready to hand, but that's a little bit misleading. It's not as though it happens in a moment. Disclosing is something that's always going on in virtue of the fact that Dasein has social practices that are already given to it. That Dasein manifests in the context of acting in the way that it does, and that are practices that are changeable. I mean, so why, why are we always disclosing the world? Well, because the practices, although they're given to us, are given to us in such a way that if we act in the context of them, we might well change what counts as the norm. And so we might well change what counts as the way in which equipment is involved with other equipment or entities refer to other equipment or refers to other equipment or we might well change what counts as a stand that you could take on yourself and so on and so forth. So disclosing is something that happens, so to speak, at the level of the ready to hand, but it's always happening because there's always something in the background that's going on that's withdrawing that you're not taking account of, even if it's only... You know, you're, you're um, taking the floor as to be walked upon, or the seat as to be sat upon, or and so on. I mean, there's always some range of things that's range of activities and equipment uh, for the pursuit of those activities that's withdrawing as long as you're as long as you're acting. And it couldn't but be that way. And that's what it is to say that Dasein's always disclosing, always disclosing a world. Let, let, let me try to point you to where he's, where he's making this distinction. On 118. So the idea is, it's only because we're already that kind of being that uh, equipment can be encountered 
in the ready to in its ready to hand mode of being. And it's only because of that that it can be discovered in its unready to hand mode of being as the entity, as the equipment that it is. So on 118, I think he's saying something like this. Let me see where on 118. <clears throat> So in this totality, now he's talking about the situation where there's a totality of involvements, which I haven't really presented properly, because we really need these passages on 116 and 117 to look at the totality of involvements. But they will include, for instance, the way that the hammer has of being involved in the task of hammering towards the end of putting together the boards, towards the end of building a structure for the sake of, and I'll make a distinction here, for the sake of a possibility of Dasein's being, namely having shelter, and all of that for the sake of Dasein's being the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being. That's the totality of involvements in short. Um, and he's, And you can come to notice or hold on to this totality of involvements um, when uh, in the context of things sh- uh, being unready to hand. So, and, and when you do, he says, in this totality of involvements which has been discovered beforehand, there lurks an ontological relationship to the world. In letting be entities be involved so that they are freed for a totality of involvements, one must have disclosed already that... Now you really have to translate this on the basis of which. The Vorov Hin is all, always on the basis of which. That on the basis of which they have been freed. The on the basis of which is very important because... If you think back to the introduction of the problems, um, uh, introduction of the question of being, being is that on the basis of which anything is intelligible as anything at all. So being is that on the basis of which there is intelligibility. And this is the same on the basis of which relation. So disclosing... uh, that one must have disclosed already that on the basis of which those entities have been freed. That's to say, one must already have opened up a space through being the kind of being that Dasein is, the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being. Uh, that's to say, one must already have instituted a whole of social norms and practices and disclosed possibilities for acting within them in order for anything to be discovered as as anything at all. So in letting entities be involved so that they're freed for a totality of involvement, so that you can see them as the entities that they are, one must already have disclosed the range of possibilities that are available to them. But that, again, on the basis of which something environmentally ready to hand has thus been freed, has thus been let out of this unity, this prior unity in which it's already bound up so that it can turn in the direction of the thing that it's referred to. Uh, So that on the basis of which something environmentally ready to hand has thus been freed cannot itself be conceived as an entity with this discovered kind of being. It's essentially not discoverable, because now we're talking about Dasein and world and the world. It's essentially not discoverable if we henceforth reserve discoveredness as a term for a possibility of being which every entity without the character of Dasein may possess. You can see the entity as the entity that it is if it's an entity that's not Dasein. Because you can see uh, the activities that it's involved with, hammering for the hammer, and the other equipment that it's involved with. And ultimately, all those involvements and references get the signification that they do only because they ground out in Dasein. 
But Dasein isn't an entity that you can discover as any, as any entity at all, because it's a totally different kind of thing. It's, the, it's that on the basis of which anything gets the intelligibility that it does. It's the entity that discloses rather than is discovered. That's a bizarre, weird, hard distinction. Um, and, but, but here's the terminology for the distinction. And, uh, and I think you can see him starting to make that distinction. It's really the distinction between the kind of beings that entities are and the kind of being the Dasein is. Entities can be disclosed, can be discovered as entities, but only because Dasein has already disclosed a world. That's the, the way he likes to, to talk. And he's building this distinction on 116 to 117. When he's talking about all the involved, the whole of involvements in the context of which you get a world. I, I just, yeah, Anna. So I was wondering about the sentence. I don't have a German version of anybody who's following this from Germany. So you said, but that for which something environmental has been free, your reading is, but that on the basis of which something in the mind to lift their hand has been freed, right? Yes. So what does that whole clause refer to? Do you think it's first to Dasein? Yes. Okay. Yep, so Dasein as the disclosive being that it is. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yep. So on the basis of Dasein, this happens. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And we'll see later in section 25 or 6 or something like that, that he's going to say that what that means, and we'll do a version of it on 116, 117, what that means is that insofar as meaningful differences ground out in anything, they ground out in Dasein. And he's going to say, that means that Dasein plays the role that was traditionally reserved for the ens realissimus, the most real entity, which was traditionally the name for God. That was, so Dasein plays the meaning of grounding, plays the role of grounding all meaningful differences. But not individual Daseins. It's not as though I could just choose at a moment to assign reference relations to the hammer by baptizing it in one way or another. It's only, it's because, it's only because there is Dasein at all. That's to say there are the kinds of social practices that Dasein is engaged in um, that a world is disclosed on the basis of which any can, thing can be discovered as the entity that it is. So it's not individual Dasein, it's the social practices of, of Dasein, that are available to Dasein's kind of being. Yeah, when... So I think that this is the wrong kind of question to ask, and I want to know why it is. So okay, like one good. worry I have is that this, like, so the, the second kind of involvement, the first kind of involvement, which you say is, is dependent on the second, so a hammer being involved with the equipment and activity. Yeah. Um, why does that not reify the entity? Like with something that like does I <coughs> left behind with it? I mean, and, and if it's been left behind with something, it, it, it's, it sounds like it's being imbued with something and should we call those things dispositions or huh. or potentialities or is that the wrong way? Is that the wrong way to think of it altogether? But it sounds like even if, I don't know, even if um, the hammer was in the workshop then, nobody was there and yeah. people never hammered or, or, or so maybe not if people never hammered again because then the practice would be changing but nobody's there maybe nobody's hammering anywhere and so you just don't you know you just construct this case where that's not happening it seems like we could still go back into the workshop and I could continue to hammer yes. after that and you know yes. the social practices haven't been exercised but there was something about the hammer that let me hammer with it yeah right? I think that's right I mean there was something about the hammer that let me hammer with it um, but there was only that thing about the hammer that let me hammer with it because there were already these practices for hammering. So what you want, what what you left out was the most basic ontological claim um, that there was this all, this prior letting something be involved at the ontological level, which is what happens when there are social practices of the sort that Dasein can manifest in in the context. And this is important; we haven't talked about it yet. In the context of Dasein's taking a stand on the kind of being that it is. And that's why the social practices get up and running in the first place. Because Dasein's the kind of being that's taking a stand on the kind of being that it is through its activity. 
And so, in doing that, the social practices get up and running. Okay. Only because that's already happened, is it possible for any entity to be discovered as the kind of entity that it is. But the entities have already been ontologically freed because there are the practices that um, uh, allow these possibilities for use. Yeah. Let, let, me just, let me just point you to the stuff on 116 and 117 because here's where Heidegger is talking about the, the totality of uh, involvements or the whole of involvements. I said the wrong way to think about it is that the involvements are ways that I have of being involved with the equipment. That's just to break it up too starkly. In the first place, the involvements are involvements that the equipment has with other equipment and involvements that the equipment has in, in the activities that it's used for. Um, but it does ultimately bottom out in Dasein, and that's what he's saying on 116 to 117. So I'll just start um, at the top of 116, which is 84 in the German. When an entity within the world has already been proximally freed for its being, that being is its involvement. Has already been proximally freed for its being. I think that means um, there are social practices um, that determine appropriate kinds of activities in which the hammer can be involved and appropriate kinds of other equipment with which it can be involved. Um, so there are these social practices. That means that the entity within the world, the hammer, say, has been proximally freed for its being. It's the kind of thing now that could be taken up in, the ready to hand, in, in its ready-to-hand mode of being, even if it's not at the moment. Um, and it, uh, that, that, um, that being that's revealed when it is ready, taken up in its ready-to-hand mode of being is its involvement. With any such entity, as an entity, there's some involvement. That's what it is to be an entity. It's already involved in some kind of practical context. The fact that it has such an involvement is ontologically definitive for the being of such an entity and is not an optical assertion about it. That's to say... It's an ontological fact that for equipment to be the kind of thing that it is, it's got to be taken up into these reference relations and these involvement relations. That in which it... In, now, and, but now, what are those kinds of involvements? And that, this is where he starts to lay them out. That in which it's involved is the towards which of serviceability and the for which of usability. He's got all these kinds of relations. In order to, the towards which, the for which, and so on. Um, uh, with the towards which of serviceability, there can again be an involvement with this thing, for instance, which is ready to hand, and which we accordingly call a hammer. There's an involvement in hammering. That's the activity that the hammer is involved with. It's involved with that activity, whether it's being used for that activity or not, because there are social practices for involving it with that kind of activity. Um, and then he goes on. With hammering, there's an involvement in making something fast. With making something fast, an involvement in protection against bad weather. And this protection is for the sake of, but now this is just a, not a final for the sake of. It's an um villain. For the sake of providing shelter for Dasein, that's one of the possibilities of Dasein's being. There are lots of other possibilities of Dasein's being. Dasein needs shelter, it needs food, it needs identities, it needs all sorts of things. That particular possibility of Dasein's being, though, isn't the final story. There's, now skip to the bottom, a primary towards which. That's to say... The one, the towards which, in which everything bottoms out. The final thing that everything is for the sake of is called the for the sake of which, and that always pertains to the being of Dasein, for which in its being that being, that very being is essentially an issue. We've thus indicated the interconnection by which the structure of an involvement leads to Dasein's very being as the sole authentic for the sake of which. That's to say, these involvements finally bottom out in an involvement with Dasein's activity of being. That's to say, does, the way in which Dasein takes a stand on the kind of being that it is whenever it does anything, that's ultimately 
what grounds all of these, the significance of all of these involvements. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't have disclosing, you wouldn't have the possibility of entities being known as entities, you wouldn't have worlds. So ultimately, it's Dasein's, it's the fact that Dasein is the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being that makes these involvements have any, have any significance at all. Um, okay, I better stop there. I'm not sure anything I said was clear. And maybe, maybe ask questions next time. We'll start with questions. So what we're going to uh, do today is, um, well, we're going to try to get to the critique of, of Descartes. Some of you presumably have read the spatiality chapter. I'm going to say about two words about the spatiality chapter. Uh, because as I mentioned already, the spatiality chapter is messed up. And <laughs> it's and, and Heidegger knew it. He, I'm not sure he knew it at the time, uh, but he knew it afterwards. There's a place afterwards where he just sort of says... Uh, I forget where in a marginal note or in a later uh, set of lectures or something where he says it was messed up. He really didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, but you can see why he thought he needed to say something in, about spatiality in that section. Uh, because, as we'll see, uh, the going under sort of ontological account, the going understanding of being that he wants to criticize is the understanding of being that he thinks Descartes was committed to, I think Descartes was committed to, and that everyone in the tradition leading up to Descartes was committed to, but Descartes focused it in a particular way. Um, Descartes focused on the idea that what there is really is substances which are self-sufficient, independent entities that need nothing else for their existence. That's what there really is, uh, Descartes assumed. And, um, and Descartes argued that there are two kinds of substance, the most basic kind of which is the extended substance. So uh, the stuff out there in the world, which is everything except for us on Descartes' account, um, is defined as a substance whose sort of primary uh, qualities are, are extent, ex, it's, ex, it's sort of extension in space. And Descartes has a very particular understanding of how to think about space. So Descartes' basic approach, sort of ontological approach, depends on an interpretation of what a substance is, and what it is for a substance to be extended in space. And since Heidegger is against that position, he thinks right after he gives the criticism of Descartes, he needs to say something about what it's right to say about space. Uh, and so that's what he tries to do there. And you can imagine what he's trying to do, at any rate. Um, the, the idea is supposed to be something like, uh, well, extension in space is a mathematical mode uh, of making space intelligible, a mathematical way of making space intelligible, in terms of present at hand properties of the spatially extended object, like its length, for instance. Uh, but you couldn't have access to those present at hand ways of understanding extension in space unless you had some uh, other kind of understanding of spatiality, of what it is for things to be near to one another and what it is for you to be near to or far away from something. And this is supposed to be, so the present hand mathematical account of extension in space is supposed to grow out of the kind of existential account of nearness that you get when you think about the ways in which we're near to things when we're involved with them, maybe the way in which we're near to the hammer when we're hammering with it. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily, or the ways we're near to um, the, the customer when you're hammering with the hammer to put the shoe together for the customer. And that's a notion of nearness that doesn't depend upon 
actual um, measured distance between two present at hand entities. It's some other existential notion of nearness on the basis of which we, and only on the basis of which we could understand something like the mathematical characterization of, of length. That's, that's what he's supposed to be doing there. Um, but but getting clear on what the existential notion of nearness and farness is turns out to be tricky. And so um, I, I've now said more or less the two words that I want, I want to say about it. That's I've told you what he ought to be doing in that section. He ought to be thinking about existential notions of nearness and farness on the basis of which, and only on the basis of which, you could come to have access to or make sense of the kind of mathematical notions of length that Descartes depending upon when he characterizes what's out there in the world as extended substances, extended stuff. Okay, so that's that's where that's the the thing we're not going to get to today. Um, but what I do want to get to, I want I want to finish up some of the things that we were struggling with last time because I thought it was sort of fruitful. Although I'm sure that there are questions, uh, there couldn't but be questions because my there were questions for me and they weren't. I didn't feel like I would quite understood them until the end and the understanding that I had might not have been transmitted to you. Uh, so I, I want to say, um, say a couple more things about uh, involvement and significance and the stuff that goes on in section 18 before moving to the critique of Descartes. So here goes. I want to start by asking a question. It's a question that Alam asked uh, yesterday. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a question about why you would write something in the way that Heidegger writes it in the German in a particular passage in, in section 18. And uh, I think, and there, Alem sort of offered evidence to the fact, to, to this end, that um, native German speakers will. Um, throw their hands up in anger and frustration if they find uh, a sentence like the one that you find on page 115 in the English, which is uh, 84 in the German, where Heidegger's talking about um, where he's talking about refer- the reference or assignment of entities to other entities and the involvement of those entities in activities. So remember, I, I wrote yesterday, I said there are two aspects of this phenomenon. They're, they're intertwined with one another. They're sort of codependent on one another. There's the referential whole and there's the whole of involvement. And I said last time, if we want to understand what these are, um, you might think that the whole of involvement is something like the involvement that I have with the hammer or with the, other, with the equipment in my activity. But I read some passages to suggest that that's not really the way Heidegger's thinking about it, at least not in the first instance. The involvement that he's talking about, all of both both of these holes are in the first instance characterized from the point of view of the tool, of the piece of chalk. The piece of chalk is tied up in references that it makes to the chalkboard and to the students and to uh, the eraser and so on. And it's tied up in a whole of involvements that involves things like the activity of writing with it, the activity of teaching, uh, maybe the activity of ultimately taking a stand on yourself as a teacher. It's this, ch- this piece of chalk is tied up in, in that, those involvements. Uh, so, so Heidegger says something sort of funny, and I and I gather for native Ger- are there any there are for, for, yeah okay so for native German speakers um, I think and even for those of us who learned German much later it's odd uh, so on one fifteen Heidegger says an entity is discovered uh, so oh, eighty four in the German yes uh, eighty four in the side yes top of German eighty four. An entity is discovered 
when it has been assigned or referred to something and referred as that entity which it is. That sentence, I think, is, is funny already and translated funny. But it's the next sentence that I want to focus on. With any such entity, there's an involvement which it has in something. And there's a long footnote on that German sentence. The translators clearly had trouble. Uh, and the next two sentences actually just like the variations on the same thing. He yeah. acts as if he's saying different thing. He doesn't. He just says the same thing over and over in different forms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So um, let, me, let me focus on the weird thing. Because here's what I think is happening. Um, and this is a clue to how you, ought to how you ought to be reading a text like this. Here's what Heidegger's trying to do. He's, <coughs> he's got a very different understanding of what philosophy is than most of our, us are used to. What he, what he thinks philosophy is in its most basic form is the practice of reflecting on what you already are familiar with about the way things are, in virtue of which familiarity, uh, you're able to go on do whatever it is that you do, while recognizing that this familiarity that we have is so close to us that we never pay attention to it. And so it's constantly covered up. So his job as a philosopher, as a phenomenological and existential phenomenological philosopher, is to pay attention to those things that we already understand in some non-thematic way and bring them to light by pointing them out. And the process of pointing them out is supposed to be a process that succeeds when the person you're talking to can reflect on their experience, what they're already familiar with, and think about what you're describing and the way you're describing it and say, you know, you're right. It really is that way. I never noticed that before. But it's exactly that way. You've, you've named something that I was taking account of before that, I never, that I'd never been able to focus on. That's, that's what the... And, and, and the things that he wants to name are the most basic kinds of things, the things that are the most familiar to us, so familiar that we've never seen them before at all. So to do that, he's got a, he sometimes has to play with the, the language. And I think he's playing with the language in this sentence in a way that's supposed to highlight um, the twofold nature of significance. So what's funny, I gather, about this sentence in German, though someone who knows German better than I do will help, it, 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 footnote 2 tells us, es hat mit im bei etwas sein bewendet. So there's two, there's two words there that are, that are um, italicized, the with and the by or the in. Um, and one concern, I think, to a native German speaker is that it looks redundant. It looks like you don't need the mit if you've already got the by. Um, that the involvement is already characterized as an involvement in something once you've got the by there. Um, so you want to ask, what's this extra word doing? What's this extra preposition doing there? That seems to me, I, as far as I understand, the natural question for a, for a native German speaker here. And so someone reading this in German ought to get to a sentence like that and say, that's weird. I never would have said it that way. In fact, it looks redundant to say it that way. It looks like it's hardly even German to say it that way. It just looks odd. And then you want to ask yourself the following question. Why... Given that this is such a strange way of saying what he's trying to say, would he say it that way rather than some other way? And then you've got to have a, a, a sort of principle of charity here. You've got to say, you've got to, you know, and, and sooner or later, this principle of charity is either justified or not justified. Either the guy turns out 
to really to be naming something interesting and carefully using his words to name it, or he turns out just to be speaking balderdash, and, and then you don't apply the principle of charity anymore. You just think he's obtuse and not doing anything interesting. But you apply the principle of charity in the first instance. You, say, you ask yourself the question, why has he got both prepositions instead of just one? What about the phenomenon is he trying to point out by using two prepositions where you might otherwise have naturally used one preposition. And I think what he's trying to point out is that there are two aspects to this phenomenon of significance that you can focus on them independently, but in the end, they only make sense when you think of them together. And the only way you understand that Will you understand what the significance in the world is that we're involved with is that he's trying to point out? So what are those two features? Well, um, we're talking about entities and what it is for them to be assigned or referred. And I think what he's, what he's trying to say is that for an entity to be assigned or referred, we, thought, we said this is the word verweisenheit, uh, verweisen, uh, and um, it, it means something like have a bearing upon. So entities have a bearing upon other entities only when they're involved with them. That's the myth. With other equipment. <coughs> and they get to be taken up, they get to have uh, this kind of involvement in general only when they're involved in uh, activities. Take away either of these and you haven't got the full significance structure. But those are just the two prepositions that he uses in that sentence. So I think he uses them both deliberately. I think he uses them both in order to point out that if you left one of those out, if you just had equipment referring to other equipment, without that equipment being caught up in a whole of involvements, in a whole mo sort of set of practices for pursuing activities uh, using that equipment. If the equipment wasn't already involved in this stuff, you just had uh, hammers pointing to nails and nails pointing to boards and so on and so forth, all the equipment pointing to all the other equipment. If you just had that, then really you wouldn't have the referential hole in the sense that he's talking about it. If there weren't any activities that, in the context of which the equipment has bearing on all the other equipment, then you wouldn't have a referential hole. And if you just had the activities without, well, the equipment referring to the, uh, all the other equipment, then you wouldn't, have, uh, you wouldn't have a hole of involvements either. So you have to have both of these. You identify each of them by giving a different preposition for the notion of for, for the, the kind of involvement that you've got, but ultimately, um, and, and so, but ultimately, they're intertwined with one another, and you couldn't have one without the other. Rosa, did you have a question? Um, I guess I don't understand how they're different. I mean, they're so intertwined. Like it, yeah. it seems like if you didn't have any activities, there'd be no reason to think of the tools as being involved. Here's how they're different, because you, you can have them. So to speak, you can separate them out. Here's how. The, uh, the equipment gets to be the equipment that it is by the place it holds in the referential hole. The hammer gets to be a hammer in virtue of the bearing it has on nails, on <coughs> boards, and so on and but so it forth. it wouldn't have any of those bearings unless it... So that's right. It wouldn't have any of that bearing unless there were practices for dealing with hammers. So we got to have that. But once you, once you get that, <coughs> then... There's a sense in which you could take away any particular involvement. It might be that there are no, there are nobody's dealing with the hammer right now. Still, it has the place it does in the referential hole, despite the lack of a particular ontic kind of dealing. Yeah. So you can separate them out. Yeah. Um, yeah, Alan. So I think um, what he means here is like you could characterize those referentials as like using functional concepts. 
and then it will turn out that it's a you know I am from completely theoretical point of view explaining the u the use yes. of something. Yes. He wants to avoid that. That's because I could have true. done so. Yes. So if I do that, then these things will come up. Right. Yes. I mean involve I don't need to be involved in order to describe the referential whole in the functional terms. Because yes. later he talks about like what can be explained with like function concepts and not I think he's referring to that point. Absolutely he is. So I'm gonna try to bring that out. That's exactly right though. There's there's another way you might have done it. If you thought this referential whole could stand and be made intelligible, completely independent of the background practices for the activities, um, then if, if you thought that, then this would turn out to be a completely empty set of reference relations, or what he'll later call function predicates. And uh, what he's going to claim is that these things are so intertwined with one another that if all you have is these empty abstract function relations, um, then you're never going to get the phenomenon that's pointed out by significance. And so, yeah. Which is the very end of section 18. Yeah, it's the very end of section 18. That's right. Bottom of 88. Yep, that's exactly right. That's where we're, I'm going to read that on 122 in English a little bit later. Yeah, good. Good. So that's the. So, and I think I, I go. I belabor this a little bit, um, just because I think this is really a clue to the way to read to read the stuff. If you see something that looks odd, that looks like there must have been a better way to say that, then what you need to the question you need to ask yourself is, well, why exactly did he say it that way rather than some other way? And you need to. Try to say it in other ways and see what's inadequate about those other ways of saying it. And uh, if you've got the phenomenon in mind, if you've got this very particular example of hammering with a hammer in mind, or whatever the phenomenon is in question that he's trying to name, <coughs> trying to get you to pay attention to, that you're familiar with even though you've never noticed it before, if you can get that phenomenon in mind, then you ought to be able to explain why he uses the words in the funny in the funny ways that he does. Okay, that's a kind of case case study. Does that? I, I want to ask Alam if that if that helps to explain why he might do it that way. Or no, yeah. I just want to understand what is going because it was obvious that it is not you know by mistake because in the next sentence yes. uh, he needs to say something and then he just says the game mit by and then he puts the mit by. In isolation, right? Yes. He's just highlighting it. Yep. So he's just like putting in your nose, almost like just look at it, look at it. But I wasn't sure. So exactly. No, no, no. I think you're exactly. I think you're exactly right. That's what he's doing. He's he is he is sticking it to you right there, right? I mean, he's really saying you got to pay attention to the fact that there are two prepositions here, uh, and unless you've got the phenomenon in mind, you can't figure out why there are two prepositions, and it just looks like sort of crazy uh, gibberish. Okay, so, so we've got these two, two prepositions, the with and the by. There's other equipment with which the hammer is involved. And there are activities in which the hammer is involved. And both of those kinds of involvement are necessary in order for the hammer to be a hammer and in order for the world in which hammers show up as part of the structural um, totality of the world to, um, to have the significance that it does. Okay, so there's, I, I want to work through uh, another passage on the next page because we didn't quite get to this. I, I, I emphasized to begin with that... This whole thing is a way of telling us something about the worldhood of the world. So it's wrong in the first instance to think of these involvements as involvements that I've got with entities. They're involvements that the entities have with something else that one finds in the world, namely activities that are going on. But ultimately, these involvements get to be the things that they are, the involvements that they are, and they get to have the significance that they do in virtue of the fact that they bottom out in some 
basic kind of involvement that's different from all the others, and that's a kind of involvement that only our kind of being could have, uh, namely the for, what Heidegger calls the for the sake of which. You wouldn't get this at all if, if you were reading carefully just the English. Um, and, the, and the translators sort of know it, sort of know it, um, because they put the German words in every once in a while. Um, but if you turn to page 116 in the English and 84 in the German, Heidegger's saying more about what these involvements could be. So in, on 116, just about four lines into the paragraph, he says... Um, with the towards which I think this is where I want to read. Let me just see one sixteen one. Yes, with I guess I'll read from. Well, I'll read there. With the, with the towards which of serviceability, there can again be an involvement. With this thing, with this entity, the hammer for instance, which is ready to hand and which we accordingly call a hammer because it's most a hammer. It's a hammer in itself when it's in the ready to hand mode of being. Um, with this thing, there's an involvement in hammering. That's the first kind of involvement. The hammer is involved in hammering. Okay. With the hammer, there's an involvement in hammering. Uh, with hammering... There's an involvement in making something fast. With making something fast, not fast as opposed to slow, of course, fast as opposed to held together, fast like held together. With making, with making something fast, there's an involvement in protection against bad weather. And this protection is for the sake of providing shelter for Dasein. That's to say, for the sake of a possibility of Dasein's being. Okay. It looks like, um, in this version of the story, that's where it bottom, bottoms out. Being. That's what it looks like here. Now, and, and that sort of bottoming out move happens not in a with which, not in an in order to relation, not in a towards which relation, but in what Heidegger calls here a for the sake of relation. What is ultimately um, what it is for the sake of which the activity is being done. And it's being done for the sake of, um, what, what did you say, making a shelter or something? Uh, providing shelter. And uh, this German word is umwillen. For the sake of. one way that it could bottom out. You could, all this stuff, could, all this activity of hammering, making boards fast, building uh, um, shelters, and so on, could get the significance that it does in virtue of the fact that it's being done for the sake of providing shelter for Dasein. <coughs> and if you think of it that way, then it gets the significance that it does ultimately in virtue of its connection with a possibility for Dasein's being. It's a, we're the kinds of beings for whom it's possible to uh, uh, take a stand on our being by doing something that involves providing shelter for ourselves. That's one of the th ways that we can take a stand on our being. So that's one of our possibilities. I'm going to say that's a kind of ontic possibility because it's a very particular kind of thing, the activity that you're involved in, the activity of providing shelter. You could do it for um, 
me standing up here with the chalk. It's with the chalk that the chalk is involved in the activity of writing on the board uh, in order to produce some words towards the end of communicating something for the sake of uh, my being a teacher. Okay. Now that's, that's an optic possibility for Dasein's being. That's one of the kinds of stands that Dasein can take on the kind of being that it is. It's something like, although we'll, we'll, we'll see m more of this later, it's something like um, you can understand yourself as having a certain role in the situation, and it's only in the context of that that any of the activities in which the equipment in the situation is involved can get the significance that they do. Yes? I mean, do you think that using this example of the shelter is uh, accidental? I mean, why he's not talking about, I don't know. He's not building a school, for example, but building a shelter. Yeah. So it seemed to me it's one activity that is very much interesting. He just talks about whether it's like inhabiting and all these relations to be. Yeah. Because it's a one it's one possibility of for for the sake of its being, right? Yes. So it was Zion Zion is little. Yeah. So it's so it seems to be he doesn't want to just say the one big whole thing that we do, but something more basic he must point out by picking this out. So I think what's going on here is that uh, maybe if it's not accidental, then I think it's ac it's not accidental. It's something like the way you suggest. Although I want to make a, um, I want to insist on something. Because shelter you, is for, I'm sorry, just to yeah. shelter is for dwelling. Yeah, I, right. That's what I'm trying. To get uh, at. I, yeah, I see. I see. Um, um, of course, he hasn't got the notion of dwelling really very well worked out in being in time. That's, it, that comes out a lot later. But I, I, th I think it's more something like this. But, but maybe there's room for both. I think it's more something like, uh, you know, if you were an anthropologist giving an account of what it is to be our kind of being, then you would say, well, one of the basic needs of human beings is that they've got shelter, food and shelter and companionship or something like that. Those are, those are the three basic needs of, of, the, of human beings. Uh, and I think what he's doing here is trying to say, uh, look, let's take what other people consider the most basic need, and now I'm going to distinguish it from something that's even more fundamental, the ontological foundation for having that need. And I'm, so I'm about to make the distinction here. This is one of the things, this is the for the sake of, it's an ontic possibility for Dasein's being. Maybe even a very, very basic kind of possibility. The, need, you know, the, 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 the fact that we're the kinds of beings that take a stand on our own by, being by providing shelter for ourselves. Um, further down the page, he's going to, He's going to distinguish this, although he's not very helpful in, in pointing out the distinction he's making. And, um, and in the translation, it's even harder to figure out that there's a distinction, because uh, the same English words, more or less, get used. Um, but So we'll just, we'll just uh, read a little bit further. So whenever something ready to hand has an involvement with it, what involvement this is has in each case been outlined in advance in terms of the totality of such involvements. So this counts as the activity of hammering towards the end of providing shelter for the sake of being a being that provides, you know, that takes a stand on, on its own being as a being that provides shelter. It's only once you've got that whole context of involvements that the activity gets the meaning that it does, gets the significance that it does, gets to be the activity that it is. That's what he says, what involvement it is. It gets individuated as uh, an activity uh, in which this, this uh, equipment is involved, only in the context of this, of this big uh, whole of involvements. And then he gives another example. In a workshop, for example, the totality of involvements, which is constitutive for the ready to hand, in its readiness to hand, is earlier than any single item of equipment. So the totality of involvements, the fact that 
there, it's all happening in the context of a possibility of Dasein's being. That's what comes first. That's more basic. But then he goes on and he says, but the totality of involvements itself goes back ultimately to a towards which, in which there's no further involvement. So it bottoms out in something that's quite unlike any of the other activities that we've that we've got in the in the chain of involvement. It's quite unlike the activity of writing on the board with the chalk. It's quite unlike the activity of um, of teaching. It's quite unlike the activity uh, even of uh, providing shelter or or being a teacher, because this towards which the ultimate one, is not an entity with the kind of being that belongs to what is ready to hand within a world. So now we're going to bottom out in an entity that's a different kind of entity. It's not just one of the entities that could be caught up in a referential whole or that could be involved in activities. It's not like equipment at all. It's an entity with a radically different mode of being, and we've got to characterize that mode of being ontologically. And that's what he's going to do. It's rather an entity whose being is defined as being in the world and to whose state of being worldhood itself belongs. This primary towards which is not just another towards this. It's not even just another possibility for Dasein's being. It's not just another taking a stand on yourself as providing shelter or as being a teacher or as being a student or anything. Um, uh, It's not just another towards this as something in which an involvement is possible. The primary towards which is the for the sake of which. And that looks like the thing that we just labeled. Because we said you do this for the sake of umvillen, providing shelter. It's the, the primary towards which is the for the sake of which. In English, it looks exactly the same. In German, it's not a lot different. It's the the Vorum villain. But it but it, there's a, it, there's a big difference because this is the ontological characterization of us as a kind of being that's radically different from every other kind of being. The for the sake of always pertains to the being of Dasein, for which in its being, that very being is essentially an issue. We've thus indicated... uh, Okay, so we've got... So letting... So I want to say... I want to say that the for the sake of which that he's talking about here is not an ontic, a particular ontic possibility. It's for the sake of being... The, kind, the for the sake of which is that I am taking, I am the kind of being, being the kind of being that takes a stand, that takes a stand on its own being. So it's only because I'm this kind of being that I can take this stand on my being, or that I can take the stand on my being that I would if I were playing, if I were, um, uh, you know, being a teacher or being a student or being a, a woman or a man or or whatever. Any particular possibility for Dasein's being is the possibility that it is only in virtue of the fact that this is the kind of being that we are, and ultimately it's this that gives significance. It's this upon which the significance of the world depends. That's to say, without Dasein, there would be no world. Okay, yeah. And so you, ben. you yeah. take a stand on the type of being that you are by engaging in the, for the sake of which we've talked about previously. The particular, any, any particular states uh, for the sake of which. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you're always doing that. You you couldn't you can't but always be doing that. You're the kind of being that is always doing that, not consciously necessarily, uh, not in virtue of having 
decided that you're going to be a student for the rest of your life, or a teacher, or a... <laughs> that was me. I thought I was... Rest of my life, baby. I don't... <laughs> okay, so not, not in virtue of necessarily ha- having formulated a life plan, or not in virtue of having made any decision about it, but just in virtue of being the kind of being that you are. You're taking a stand on, on, on what it is to be that being. And you can't help doing that because uh, everything that you do is understandable in that context. That's what it is to be our kind of being. Everything you do is understandable in that context. So no matter what possibility you take up or are thrown into or are given, and as Alan pointed out helpfully um, yesterday to me, there's... Three, three options, he thinks. Do you remember where that was, Alan? Um, uh, three options of what? Three ways um, that you can uh, find yourself uh, having taken up a particular possibility. Um, you, can, you can choose it, he says. Oh, but, uh, top of third Oh, way back there. Yeah, yeah. okay, right. Good. So top of 33 in the English, um, in the German, page 12. Dasein always understands itself in terms of its existence, in terms of a possibility of itself. And the poss- the, in the most general case, the possibility of itself at the ontological level is to be itself or not to be itself. There's also an ontic possibility that it takes up. Dasein has either chosen these possibilities itself or got itself into them or grown up in them already. Those, those are three options. Um, you can grow up in a family like Bach did, where it was just taken for granted that you would become a musician. Uh, you, can, you can choose a possibility for yourself. You can decide, despite the fact that no one in your family has ever read a musical life of note in their life, you're going to become a musician, or you can be uh, thrown into it. You can uh, all of a sudden find yourself grabbed by uh, the possibility of being a musician. Those are three different ways in which you can find yourself taking a stand on the kind of being that you are. But you are the kind of being that does that. That's it. And, and it, it's sort of wrong, it's misleading to emphasize sort of career options as the primary case. Because the sense in which you're always doing it is the sense in which you haven't got any choice about it. You are thrown into a culture where there are norms and you get to be the kind of being you are in virtue of where you're situated with respect to those norms. Norms for being a man. Norms for being a woman. Norms for being a student. Norms for being... Uh, a teacher, norms for being a roommate, norms for and so on and so forth. Those norms are already there, given to us and however you act will count as a way of taking a stand on yourself vis-a-vis those norms. And you'll turn out to be whatever it is that you are in virtue of what you do and how it's interpreted and how it's interpreted vis-a-vis those norms. So you don't have a choice about it. But recognizing that you don't have a choice about it already puts you in a different relation to it because it um, allows you to notice the way in which you're already doing something that you hadn't noticed that you were doing. Namely, acting in such a way as to be interpretable you know, uh, as a particular kind of student vis-à-vis the, new, the norms for studenthood and so on. Okay, so there, so there are these two... Different. So Heidegger, I think, is making this distinction on 116 between the ontic possibility for Dasein's being and the ontological characterization of Dasein as the kind of being that it is. And ultimately, it's this in virtue of which any, any, enti- any entity gets to be the entity that it is, any world gets to be the world that it is, and um, Dasein gets to be the kind of being that it is. Jackson, yeah. Um, in those examples you're just bringing up, um there were cultural examples that dealt with people around us and the norms which we've established. Um, but can you also, do you also take a stand on yourself just when you're, if 
you are completely alone, like a man on a desert island, in the way that he interacts with his environment and kind of, um, I feel like I feel like you almost have to take a stand on um, what kind of creature you are and what what it means to be a human being, even without a human being. It's true, um, and that's the sense. I mean, it's true in some cases and not in other cases. It's important to make a distinction. You can imagine Robinson Crusoe brought up in a culture. What sort of, so to speak, once you're brought up in the culture, then you're, then you're in the world and you're Dasein. And sort of once light has dawned gradually over the whole, it doesn't get dark again, right? So once you're, once you're Robinson Crusoe, having grown up in a culture and got, gotten these norms, then, then it, even if you're on a desert island, you're situated with respect to those norms. And those norms are developing in the context of the actions that you're performing. But whatever it is you're doing is taking a stand on the kind of being that you are. If, by contrast, you're not brought up in those norms, you're the wolf child or something like that, um, then it doesn't matter whether you, it doesn't matter after a certain point whether you're brought into the culture or not, you never, you never manage to get the world and you never manage to get the, underst- the pre-ontological understanding of the norms that's required to be the kind of being that gets to take a stand on its own being. So you can, so you can imagine both cases. Seriously, so if, if I'm the wolf child, I might not be as I am. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Sorry. Are you, are you, are you concerned about that, Jack? <laughs> some acculturation. It takes some developing into the culture and uh, getting a sense for a background, pre-ontological familiarity with how to go on in certain kinds of social circumstances in order to get up and running. Once you've got that and you're up and running, then there's no going back. But I think it is possible, even for physiologically human beings, not not to have that kind of background familiarity. And, and to the extent that they don't, I think it's probably not right to say that they're Dasein. And, I, and, I, and I'll, I mean, it doesn't make them not physiologically the same as us, but it means that they haven't got what Heidegger will think is the essential characteristic of the kind of being that, that we are. They've got a different mode of being. And I think he'll think that's a possibility. I think, um, I mean, it, it's hard because... Um, uh, because, you know, I wanted to claim at the start that from a very, very early age, children are already brought up into these cultural norms and responding to them and sensitive to them and so on. That was the story of the Japanese baby versus the American baby already in two months or something like that. So this wolf child has to be really isolated. I mean, I'm imagining really a child that was raised by wolves, not by humans. If there is such a thing, I mean, you know, there are these bizarre stories. <laughs> Who knows? Romulus and Remus, right? Exactly. <laughs> but but others uh, too. More Casper. What's his name? Who did Who did the famous film about the Hauser. Hauser. Yeah, Casper Hauser. So anyhow, if there were such a if there were such a case, um, you know, I, at least I think there's room for such a case. But I, I, I'll say something more about the relation between Dasein and animals and and, and non daseins Really, is what you need to say um, in a moment. But then first. Do we get the sense that there are kind of like preset types of cultural practices that kind of like say for instance you had you had these these you know kids raised by wolves out in the wilderness and they were, they were able to come together and form some type of you know pre <coughs> modern society I mean can you establish new cultural practice? I mean, does that count, or there are these ones that, you know, from the dawn of time kind of count as ones that you can realize? Good. 
Good. Okay. Thank it's you. really a di it's really a distinct a question about the distinction between early Heidegger and late Heidegger. Early Heidegger thinks that what he's telling us is the cross-cultural, universal, ahistorical story about what it is to be Dasein, and any culture that counts as a da as a human culture, any culture that counts as a human culture, he thinks here <laughs> will. Um, be properly characterized at an ontological level in this way. Now, uh, I think later Heidegger thinks that uh, the story about the referential whole of equipment just isn't sufficient to characterize uh, the pre-Socratic mode of being. Because equi because equi the Homeric mode of being, even. Homeric culture, very rich culture, standing at the foundation of Western civilization. And yet, later Heidegger will think it would be wrong to think that they understood their uh, swords or their, um, uh, you know, their helmets or their shin greaves or whatever in the way that we understand equipment as having a bearing on other equipment. It was already so caught up in their understanding of how it was made possible to act in the light of the god, goddess Athena in war and how it related to the, you know, the, the, the god Hephaestus sort of craft possibilities. And so it was already so caught up in a radically different understanding of what entities are. So that they weren't mere equipment. They were already imbued with some, some other kind of sacred significance. Um, it was already so different that this is the wrong way of thinking about it. And you could imagine other cultures coming out of nowhere. Um, but, but early Heidegger really thinks this is, this is going to do it. This is all you need. Although there are chinks in the armor. You can see. Uh, <laughs> does it mean that if you do not choose yourself, but rather go with the flow, mm. your mode of being is undifferentiated as ah. opposed to authenticity and authenticity? Well, we're going to get to authenticity and inauthenticity starting next week, in fact. Uh, there, there, it, he will use that phrase. He'll say, um, Dasein, on 33 already he uses it. Dasein can uh, be itself or not be itself. And the Dasein that really is itself is the Dasein that chooses its chooses itself, he'll say. But choice is a, a very weird and misleading verb. Uh, or noun in this case, Ch to choose is a, is a misleading ver uh, verb um, because the choice that he's talking about isn't anything that necessarily that you could be conscious of or aware of or notice or anything like that. So we'll get into authenticity starting next week and then even more in Division 2. Um, but yeah, that's it, the, the quite you can see if I'm the kind of being that takes a stand on my own being. And that's more than something like deciding I'm going to be a professor and writing out a plan and then getting tenure someday. And, uh, so it's more than just that. Um, in the sense that it's not an event that's in the future that I could achieve someday, and having achieved it, it'll be in the past. That's not what the for the sake of which is. That's because... Because I'm the kind of being that's always taking a stand on my own being. And if the stand I'm taking is the stand of being a teacher, then I might not even know that. Uh, and, uh, and, but nevertheless, it's going to be the kind of thing that, I, that I'm always doing. I'm not doing it in virtue of the fact that at some moment some you know, honor was accorded you. Right? You're, you're doing it in virtue of the way you're acting always at the moment. And that mode of acting has a temporal structure. Which, but it's not, it's not the structure of there being some event in the future that could happen and might determine that I count as a teacher and always hereafter count as a teacher. It's got to be something more than I, something that I'm doing all the time. And so the way you take that up will, be de will determine whether you count as authentic or inauthentic. There was one other question. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are, like, most of the previous questions, if I understand correctly, is, you know, the question what allows Dasein to be Dasein? Mm -hmm. Or like, is it culture that, that is a necessary condition that allows Dasein to be Dasein? I can say it in a, in, a sen in a sentence. It's familiarity with the background practices of a culture. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what allows Dasein to be Dasein. That's, without that, you couldn't be the kind of being that takes a stand on your own being. You've got to already have that know-how. Different from this question, can I ask, 
What is that which makes Dasan Dasan? Well, that it is the being that takes a stand on its own being. That's one answer. I'm not sure that's the kind of answer. Yeah, it, that it is the being that takes a stand on its own being. That's what makes it Dasan. Um, now, I mean, you might be asking some sort of scientific question like, you know, is it that we have brains or, you know, neurons that fire in certain patterns or something like that? And I think Heidegger will say, look, obviously there's some, ca- there's some causal <coughs> substrate that's required. But telling that story, Heidegger will say, isn't going to be sufficient to get the ontological story straight. Really, this is what it is that makes Dasein be Dasein, that it's the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being in ways that we'll, that we'll explore more. Uh, Max, yeah. Um, so, I, I was just trying to work out why you're making a distinction. Are you just saying that um, the ontic is so, so, uh, kind of a particular case? Of yeah, that's right. This is the ontic, um, it means it's a possibility for Dasein's being. There's some, some particular one. Yeah, and then this is the fact that we're the kinds of beings that do this. That's the that's the more that's the more fundamental thing. And when we're always the kinds of beings that do this, and it's in, only in virtue of that, then we sort of get this involve these involvements and equipment. So yeah, that's it. Um, right. Uh, the the distinction between ontic and ontological sometimes looks sort of crazy and scary, and some but a lot of the times it's really just this distinction when you get it. It's the distinction between a particular claim about a particular event or a particular way of taking a stand, and what has to be true about the kind of being involved in that in order for it to be for the particular thing to be possible. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, just, I wanted to ask a question about the kind of limits there are, the kind of object possibilities we, we can have. So could I be the kind of being that, you know, has as a possibility wanting to change the background practices? In particular cases, like maybe I want to change the practice of memory. I think this is something yeah. that came up in an earlier lecture before we had a lot of this on the table, and I yeah. just wanted to know whether there's something that's in principle impossible. Let's put it this way. You can be the kind of being <coughs> that acts in such a way as to change the background practices. That is one of the possibilities for Dasein. And in fact, we'll discover that that's the authentic possibility for Dasein. Because what's, because what's special about the relation between the background practices and us is that although the background, we experience the background practices as norms that are given to us from without, they're imposed upon us from without, in certain sense, we don't make them, we don't produce them, we don't uh, create them. Uh, we are not the ones who, uh, who determine in detail what they are. That we experience them as given to us. We're thrown into them, Heidegger says. And yet, there's an important sense in which those background social practices that we're thrown into are the practices that they are because of the activity that we find ourselves involved in. And so were we to be acting differently in the relevant, in the relevant way, those background practices could be changing. And, uh, and, the Daza, and, and so the background practices are sort of a foundation. They're sort of something given to us from without that's that in virtue of which anything makes any sense at all. And they're sort of not a foundation because foundations are stable and hold for good and are unchanging. And that's not what this kind of foundation is. This is the kind of foundation that that can change in virtue of the very activity that we find ourselves involved in. And so authenticity will, uh, just so you have in mind what we're heading towards, one of the things that authenticity will involve is relating to the background practices in such a way as not to take them as norms that are constant and unchanging, but as norms that are manifest in the very activity that we find ourselves involved in. I think it doesn't say exactly as you say that it cannot change, yeah. but it qualifies the way in which the change should take place. So I thought that maybe the, my, my good uh, image will be like Neuratian ship, yeah. So you have to be already on the sea and floating, right? But then yeah. you can make the thing that makes you float that you live in itself your subject, and you might say, you want to, I want to change this. But you cannot change this altogether as if you could be outside of ship. That's and right. And work it on it. You have to be in it 
and reforming it. So in a sense, if you, you cannot do it all together. Yes. You cannot do it as if you are outside of it. Good. There's no standpoint outside of it. It can change. Yeah. And even the change, it can be initiated by the, by the people in it. You can yeah. make the culture itself yes. your topic, and then you can say, I mean, think about the way in which we think about, I mean, the women and men and the sexuality issues. You know, yes. we work on them, we recognize exactly. them, and we're trying to change them. Yeah. But we are not doing it something in a, from a genderless culture point of view. That's we're right. doing it. That's, that's, that's the, the, probably the best example is the gender example. You're already thrown into a whole range of practices. You can't help but being thrown into them. Practices in the context of which however you act will get the meaning that it does. But those practices aren't constant and unchanging. They're themselves in sort of constant interplay with the way people actually act. They're <laughs> Norms are manifest in people's activity, uh, but that activity also, but and therefore that activity, that activity can change the norms. Yeah, exactly. And somehow, what, what we're heading towards is the idea that only when you act, only when the stand you take on the kind of being that you are reflects that about the relation between the norms and how you act. Um, will you be acting authentically? That's the, that's the thing. But for the moment, we're not there. For the moment, all we've got is the idea that this, what it is to be equipment and what it is for a world to be a world is ultimately dependent upon there being Daseins. That's to say, there being the kind of being that can take a stand on its own, on its own being. And, and once you've got that, then, uh, and only then, does the equipment and the world in which you find yourself take on the significance that it does? And that's what, that's what significance is. Significance is the other word in this chapter. I'll just read you the one passage where significance comes up on 120, I say. Is that right? Yes. Um. Yeah, so the, uh, the relational whole of this, I'm, I'm going to say whole instead of, signi- instead of totality, because totality is like just a collection of entities. The whole is something that stands on its own. The relational whole of this signifying we call significance. This is what makes up the structure of the world, the structure of that wherein Dasein as such, as the being that it is, already is. And Dasein in its familiarity with significance is the ontical condition for the possibility of discovering entities which are encountered in a world with involvement, readiness to hand, as their kind of being, and which can thus make themselves known as they are in themselves. In, in themselves means uh, given the place that they uh, hold in the referential whole, which is revealed in the most fundamental sense in, the, in their ready to hand mode of being. So that says, um, Dasein's already got this familiarity with the significance of um, the equipment and of the world. And uh, in virtue of having that familiarity already, though maybe not thematically and not knowing it, it's the ontical condition, that's to say, there has to be this kind of entity, Dasein, uh, for there to be any discovering of entities any showing them as the entities that they are, discovering, remember, has the as structure, uh, which show themselves in a world with involvement as their kind of being, and which can thus make themselves known as they are in themselves. All those words mean something special, and we've sort of got the special meaning of all of them. And that's what significant. That's what significance is. That's what meaning or significance, bedeutsamkeit, in its most fundamental sense is it depends ultimately on there being this kind of being, the being that takes a stand on its own being. That distinguishes significance in the full way that Heidegger wants to talk about it from anything like a semantic meaning that might have been attached to a syntactic string. Right? I mean, which is maybe what you think of significance or meaning. Uh, it, uh, like if you're doing philosophy of language, say. Significance here is a term that might well have been, might well have been uh, translated as, as meaning, 
right? And, and it's, it's, so to speak, what Heidegger is trying to get at, what, what philosophy of language or philosophy of mind tries to get at when they think about the significance or the meaning or the semantic sense of uh, a particular sentence or a particular string of syntactic elements. Okay. And Heidegger is going to try to say, look, once you understand what this phenomenon is, and the way in which it depends ontologically on understanding us as this kind of being, not as the kind of being that's a subject fully enclosed on itself that gives meaning to things, but as this kind of being, only once you understand that will you really be able to account for, the, for any notion of significance in, in any sense. And then he's going to go on and say, once you've got this on the, t- on the table, you can think about the meaning of a particular s- assertion or the meaning of a particular sentence. Uh, but, but it's going to be a very derivative form of meaning. This is the fundamental notion of meaning. Its significance is what you're familiar with when you have know-how in a world in virtue of being the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being. And that's the fundamental ontological sense. I just point out, this makes us radically different from the ground up from animals. That's to say, from non-Dasein kinds of animals. So we leave aside the empirical question which animals ought to count as Dasein and which not? Uh, that's, a, that's an empirical question, or you, you can go and, and try to figure it out. But we've got the criteria for determining the answer to that question right here. An animal counts as Dasein if it's the kind of animal that has this form of being. It's the being that it is in virtue of the fact that it takes a stand on its own being. So to do that... You've got to have some familiarity with a whole background set of norms in terms of which and in relation to which you get to be the kind of being that you are, the teacher or the student or the man or the woman or whatever. Those social categories are categories that you've already got to be familiar with and you've got to, be fami- and you've got to understand yourself in terms of your relation to them at least in some sense, in order to count as Dasein. So, assuming that animals haven't got this rich existential structure, that's much more than the question, you know, can animals have thoughts? Or can animals, uh, say, act differentially with respect to properties of objects? I mean, okay, pigeons can do that. They can act differentially with respect to red and and, and, and green uh, buttons. And then you, you might think, well, maybe that means they're representing redness and greenness. And then you might think, maybe they've got the belief that, you know, the button is red. And then you might be off and running and you think, well, we're, the, we're no different from pigeons. <laughs> Heidegger wants to say that's the wrong starting point. You've got to start with this existential phenomenon if you're really going to understand what it is to be our kind of being. Uh, to the extent that we can make sense of the idea that we've got thoughts or beliefs or make assertions with semantic content and so on, that's radically derivative of this much more fundamental ontological existential account of our kind of being. And if you're going to ask about pigeons, this is what, he, what you've got to be asking about. Rosa. So, so would he also say that we don't need to have thoughts in order to satisfy this ontological condition? We don't. Um, I think what he'll say is that... Um, in virtue of being this kind of being, we're the kind of being for whom it's possible that we can have thoughts. That doesn't mean you always have to have thoughts. When I'm asleep, for instance, on some interpretation, I'm not, I'm not making any assertions. Uh, maybe, uh, depends on what you think, maybe you think I don't have any beliefs when I'm asleep. Maybe you I think I do. But any thoughts, can I still fulfill that second condition? I mean, can I still take a stand on my own being without ever thinking about it, just in a sort of drastic I think Heidegger, uh, it depends what you mean by thoughts. I think we can imagine a society um, that's got no fully developed language, but that has pretty rich kinds of social practices, and that might still count as Dasein. So uh, I, I, think we, I think we can imagine that. What, what's required is the, is the social practices and the understanding of yourself in relation to them. Now maybe, I mean, maybe those necessarily come already with language. It's a little hard to tell. I'm not not quite sure. 
Um, but yeah, but that's the kind of question that one would ask. Yeah, Wendy. Could there be a, a difference between so something so this criterion? Can you break down to taking a stand on one's own being or being able to take a stand? So I think one thing that was happening in the, the wolf child case is yeah. that that's going to be a, a, a biological being that we think has the potential to take a stand on its own if it were you know steeped in some practices. Yeah. And I may hang out with you know maybe I have a dog and I hang out with the dog every day and we, you know we we'll read cartoons and, and this that dog is never going to be able to take a stand on itself no matter how much I steep it in the you know the background practices. Or so I, I guess like. The question I'm asking is whether there is any use to driving that wedge between those distinctions, or like which which of them is the criterion, the minimal criterion. Well, the being able to take a stand yeah. on one's own being and actually taking a stand on it. I see. Um, well, everything depends on what you mean by being able to. <coughs> I mean, uh, you know, the dog might be able to take a stand on its own being if it were transformed into a human. Uh, I mean, right, so yeah. so getting the constraints for for the modal claim, it, it are it, that's hard. Um, I mean, without begging the question. Right? So so I'm not I'm not sure. Um, I think. So you yeah, go ahead, Ellen. Yeah. I think you, you can't take a point in which you just have the ability, but you never take a stand on. So this is not a capacity like biking. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have the I have the capacity to bike, but yet you know I might never bike or sometimes bike. And yeah. Being a stand on is not like that. You have That's to be absolutely. always already taking stand on. That's true. It, it, the possibility we were talking about was not the possibility of taking a stand on your being. It was the possibility of making some assertion about it. I mean, so th this was in the context of the question about language, wasn't it? Oh, uh, in that okay. So about that, I was. I was a little bit. I saw you. I saw you nervous. Yeah, go ahead. But I, I just lost the thought. For that, I had something else. And for for this, um, it's like that. I have the biological makeup, but you know whether it will ever come to a point of being a taking stand on. Uh -huh. It puts in a certain temporal order, and that is that is disturbing me. I don't want to put it that way. But yeah. The uh, for the other for most, I had some other thought, but it's lost. So I don't. Okay. Know. I will tell you when I. I mean, I, I will say this, that there, what's, what's necessary, I think, Heidegger thinks, <coughs> to be this kind of being, even if you, is, is that even if you don't actually make assertions in some recognizable language, you're doing all this other stuff. You're discovering entities as entities. You're doing everything that's sort of essential for there being language there. You might not have managed to, you know, Maybe maybe it's a community of mute people or something, right? Maybe there's so there's no there's no language in the sense of you know verbally expressed audible assertions. I think sure that's uh, no problem, right? But I think that's just, that's just be, there's no problem there because you haven't got the richer notion of what counts as a language. So yeah, okay. Let's see. Let. Um, Okay. I'll just, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would. Let me just say. I just wanted to say. Let me just say one thing, and then I'll do the three questions. I mean, so you you can see that this means that even if animals or non-Dasein-ish kinds of things had what looked like readiness to hand for their equipment, the beaver when you know he's going to grab the stick to make the dam. Um, maybe you you want to say, but but the stick withdraws completely. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the ready-to-hand mode of being? It was defined in terms of withdrawal. And I want to say, no, no, no. It was, you know, in the first place defined in terms of withdrawal. But it doesn't get to be, and uh, you know, equipment in the ready-to-hand mode of being unless you've got this structure. And you don't get to have this structure unless you've got this kind of being in the mix. So that even if it's true that the beaver doesn't, isn't noticing the stick in his mouth, that doesn't mean it counts as equipment or it gets, or, or, or it gets to have a world in virtue of it. Once you understand this, the way everything depends on this, it sort of folds back and you have to understand, it sort of cycles back through and you have to understand all of these things in a different and, and, and richer sense. So animals turn out to be different from the ground up from us. Um, and that's in virtue of the fact that their ground isn't this. Okay, now I go. Ask about uh, Jackson. I actually think that Heidegger doesn't uh, suggest that design can be a purely practical being with just a bunch of, with a set of 
like you know know how and uh-huh. social uh, practice. <coughs> Page twenty seven in the very beginning yeah. says that this entity which each of us is himself and which includes the inquiry. Uh-huh. One of the possibilities of its being we shall denote by the term design, which means that we should not it, it doesn't mean that every one of us inquires, but yeah. that it's a possibility. Yes, so but what we're wondering about is what mean what it means to say that it's a possibility. Is it sufficient for it to be a possibility that the culture could develop so as to have language and by virtue of having language to ask about this? Uh, or is it or is something more required? Does it for it to count as a possibility of our being, do we have to already be far enough along to be able to, say, state the question of being? Um, if, that's the, if that's it, well, you don't have to go very far back before um, it turns out people didn't count as Dasein. And I think, I, so I mean, so, but anyhow, the point is, everything depends on what it means to say that this is a possibility of of, of the being in question. What has to happen for it to count as, you know, what kinds of developments in this being count as appropriate developments such that the thing counts as a possibility? That's, that's yeah. Uh, Jackson. I just look at this familiarity in social practices as necessary to take a stand. Because yeah. Because at least whenever I look at those two ideas on alone, I don't necessarily see them necessarily connected. I feel like I can take a stand on my being by observing the world around me, kind of getting an understanding of... I, I, don't, I, don't, I guess I don't understand why there needs to be context in order for you to take a stand on the RV. Or at least, at least other people, the context of other people. Because I think you can take it in the context of this the world in general. Yeah, okay. So, I, I mean, I want to agree in one sense because I'm, I'm happy with the Robinson Crusoe case. Robinson Crusoe, as we'll get some of this terminology later, Robinson Crusoe is, um, you know, is already with others. Um, despite the fact that there aren't any others around, in virtue of the fact that the way he acts is um, based on the know-how he has uh, with respect to a variety of social norms for how one acts in various circumstances. So he's, he's, he's a perfectly fine case. He, there doesn't have to be anyone actually around as long as you've got the familiarity for the social norms. What I want to resist is the idea that you'd count as the kind of being that, that we are. If you didn't already have this pre-ontological understanding of the background pra- of some set of background practices, if you didn't, if you didn't ha- that's required. I mean, that's what he says on 117. Dasein, in its familiarity with significance, with this meaningful set of background practices, um, is the ontical condition for the possibility of all this other stuff. Can you, can you have pre-ontological understanding that's not culturally based? I mean, like, I, I feel like just by virtue of, like, our, our biological system, you kind of have an understanding, you're born with an understanding <laughs> of things, at least a particular understanding, or a particular um, interpretive um, well, the, the claim is that what you've got to have a pre-ontological understanding of is social norms. That, that's the claim. I mean, I take it this is a version of... Sort of Heidegger's version of the Aristotelian idea that man is a political animal. Man is an animal that lives in a community. Man is a social animal. Human beings wouldn't be human beings if, in some radical sense, they were separated out from all other human beings. Uh, I think I think that Heidegger thinks that just isn't going to be sufficient. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, next time we'll move on to whoop, the thing that was there, which is to say. Uh, Sections 25 to 30 for next week. We, we spent last week um, extending our discussion of involvement and significance, and I think it was worth I think it was worthwhile um, because I think we uh, I think we learned something about the structure of worldhood that couldn't have been clear if we'd left it with what we said the week before. So just to remind you, we learned that the structure of worldhood, uh, which Heidegger is discussing in sections 16, 17, and 18, is something that gets pointed out when certain kinds of entities within the world, uh, equipment and signs, uh, 
present themselves in a certain way to us. So when equipment breaks down and it's unready to hand, it, uh, it presents something about the structure of the world. And when signs are uh, ready to hand in the way that signs can be, namely by uh, jumping out at you and pointing you towards some aspect of the environment. In both of these cases, we get something about the structure of the world pointed out to us. We get pointed out to us that equipment has bearing on other equipment or is involved with other equipment. We get pointed out to us that uh, the other Daseins are involved in certain kinds of activities that make sense in the context of the environment and that draw us to perform other activities. And we get pointed out to us in general that the world uh, has a structure of equipmental relations and involvements of equipment with other equipment in our activities and ultimately involvements with us in our being the kind of being that we are, the kind of being that takes a stand on our own being, um, in the context of which a world gets the kind of significance that it does. So that's that. I'm saying that in sort of shorthand and rather cryptically because we spent two weeks, two weeks talking about it. <clears throat> but it's meant to be a story about the kind of significance and the kind of meaning that's available to us in the world in virtue of our being the kinds of beings that we are. Uh, and it's meant to be a story that starts from the assumption that in the most basic cases, uh, we're already unified with, or we're already together with the equipment in the world that we find ourselves using seamlessly and transparently so that it withdraws, and with other signs, uh, and with our activities, and that this unity is something that, although it can break apart, in the normal case, it's, it's not broken apart. That unity, which, which Heidegger in the most basic case uh, identifies as the unity of being in the world, um, is a starting point that's very different from the starting point that you find in all the philosophers from uh, Plato and Aristotle up to Descartes and, and Kant. And so it's not surprising that you ought to be able to build a critique of uh, the Cartesian metaphysical picture uh, if you've got this story on the table. And what, the way this critique is supposed to work is it's supposed to start from the idea that Heidegger's pointed out to us certain phenomena that once you see them, you just can't deny and then he's going to try to show that if you've, got, if you've got those undeniable phenomena on the table, uh, he's going to try to point out how if you, have, if you start out with the Cartesian metaphysical picture, uh, you're never going to be able to regain those, regain those phenomena or account for them. And so the critique of Cartesianism, which I only want to go through very briefly because... Uh, I want to move on to the next chapter. But the, the critique of Cartesianism, you, ought to, you almost ought to be able to predict at this point, insofar as you understand Cartesianism, uh, as based on the fundamental idea that what there is in the universe is substances. Now, in Descartes, we have two kinds of substances. But what really matters is that what there is is substance of some form or another. And that matters because, as we started off saying at the very beginning of the lecture course, substances have the following metaphysical feature. They don't depend on anything else to be the kinds of things that they are. They're completely self-sufficient. They're completely independent. And they, can, they don't depend for their existence upon anything else. Now, modulo certain kinds of assumptions, like in Descartes, substances depend on God, uh, but there's a sense in which they're relatively independent anyhow. They certainly don't depend on 
other substances. So it resists the kind of holism that we found in Heidegger's characterization of the equipmental whole and the whole of involvement. Now, the Cartesian metaphysics, uh, although in some ways many people try, try to claim that they, they, they resist it nowadays, it's nevertheless still, I think, at the foundation of most of the going positions, maybe even all of the going positions in philosophy of mind, for instance, where you have attempts to account for the kind of being that we are in terms of our various aspects of our mental, of our mental capacities. So I take it that three going positions, I won't do a sort of full analysis here, but just to give you the flavor of it, three of the going positions in contemporary metaphysics of mind are the positions of natural, well, I'll call them generically naturalism, uh, kind of dualism, and what you might call a kind of pantheism. And it seems to me that the Cartesian commitment to the metaphysics of substance, to the idea that what there basically is in the universe is independent, self-sufficient stuff that can uh, exist without, uh, without reference to anything else. That basic idea of the metaphysics of substance lies at the foundation of all three of these positions. So let me just remind you briefly of what, what these positions might look like. So let's take naturalism. There's an awful lot of, generically speaking, uh, naturalists in the philosophy of mind these days. A canonical kind of example might, might be someone like Patricia uh, Churchland, who holds a position or has held a position that she called eliminative materialism. It's materialism because it says that all there really is in the universe is matter, and it's eliminative because it intends to explain away or eliminate the appearance of any kind of substance other than matter, like mental substances. So eliminative materialism is what you might generally call a kind of naturalism. It's devoted to a kind of uh, scientific worldview that takes it to be obvious that science tells us what there is. And uh, therefore, sooner or later, science is going to tell us, that's to say, the objective, dispassionate, independent study, uh, scientific study of um, the physical features of the universe is ultimately going to tell us, is going to explain to us what it is for, my, for there to be minds. Um, I take it what matters here is the idea... I, I want to say this depends ultimately on a kind of Cartesian metaphysics because it depends on the idea sort of at the basis of most sci scientific inquiry that what we study is independent of us and independent of everything else that it might be, uh, it might be thought to be related to. So the stuff that we find out there in the universe is self-sufficient and independently characterizable. And we're just fine. It's certainly independent of us. Uh, it's certainly independent of God or anything like that. But ultimately, it's got its independent constituent parts, its atomic units. And those are, inter those are sort of movable. You can move the atomic, uh, the, you can move the atoms, substitute one atom of a particular sort for another atom. They're completely independent of one another. They form these bonds, which are ways of bringing them together. But roughly speaking, in their essence, you can, you can catalog the, the structure of the universe uh, in the periodic table of the elements. Okay, that's kind of naturalism. It's certainly not the view that Descartes held, but what I want to point out is that it's, it's based on a kind of Cartesian understanding of the notion of substance as the basic metaphysical constituent of the universe. Uh, dualism, which is sometimes attributed to Descartes, and though lots of, I think, contemporary... Uh, uh, scholars of Descartes like to resist the idea that Descartes was a classic 
Cartesian dualist. Nevertheless, it's often attri- this view is often attributed to him, not without some reason at any rate. And I think there are some contemporary dualists as well. Uh, someone like Dave Chalmers is sometimes thought to be a dualist. He's sometimes thought to be a guy who thinks, yeah, there's material stuff in the world and there's conscious stuff in the world. Um, and someone like Joe Levine seems to hold a kind of dualistic position uh, in the philosophy of mind. Dualism is devoted to the idea that uh, what there basically is is substance, but it comes in two kinds. What there basically is is stuff that's completely self-sufficient and independent, uh, stands on its own, but there are two different, sort of essentially different kinds of substance. One is the material kind and the other is the so to speak, uh, thinking kind or conscious kind or mental kind or something like that. Okay, dualism, going view nowadays in the philosophy of mind. Not surprisingly, it's related to Descartes' views, but what I want to emphasize is that it's related to this background assumption that what there is is substance. There are also nowadays, I think, um, or at least there have been, Uh, recently, uh, a range of views that you might call um, pantheistic views. Views that are devoted, like naturalism, to the idea that there's only one kind of substance. Uh, But unlike naturalism, they think somehow that the one kind of substance that there is is a spiritual substance, or uh, uh, some kind of conscious substance. Uh, Spinoza was famous for having held a view like this. Uh, sometimes Davidson, Donald Davidson, uh, who in, uh, in his characterization in the, uh, in the philosophy of mind of the view that he calls anomalous monism, is taken to believe that there's only one kind of substance and it's a, it's a kind of mental substance. Sometimes David Chalmers seems to hold a view like this. Uh, sometimes he seems to think that he at least flirts with the view that he attributes to Bertrand Russell in a certain period. Uh, the view that says that there's only one kind of substance and it's a conscious kind of substance. Uh, At any rate, there's a view like this running around also in the philosophy of mind, traditionally and even nowadays. And again, what I want to point out is that it's based on the, the assumption that what there is is some kind of substance. And then what we're arguing about is whether there's one of them, two of them, what its features are, and so on and so forth. The metaphysical fact about it is that it's self, self-subsistent and independent of all other things. Uh, and that's what, the, that's what Descartes really clarifies, it seems to me. Descartes really clarifies the idea that what there is out in the world is uh, extended substance, race extensa, extended things, things that are spatially extended. Um, and uh, the notion of being that's sort of motivating this view is the notion that says that what there is is self-independent and self-standing stuff. So let me let me start to read that, read some passages where Heidegger is attributing, it seems to me rightly, this metaphysical position to Descartes. Because it's this metaphysical position that he wants to he wants to resist. Heidegger, of course, doesn't think that there's only, that what there is um, is necessarily self-sufficient and independent uh, and self-standing. And he certainly doesn't think that it's right to presuppose that. That's to close off the question of being altogether. So on 125, if you look at 125, Here's Heidegger laying, laying the ground for this view. Uh, so Heidegger says, right at the beginning of section 20 on page 92 in the German, Heidegger says, Substantiality is the idea of being to which the ontological characterization of the race extensa harks back. Substantiality. That's the notion of being that Descartes presupposes. And then I won't read the Latin, but it's translated by substance. This is from Descartes now. Uh, By substance, we can understand nothing else than an entity which is in such a way that it needs no other entity in order to be. Okay. So this is a metaphysical position that Descartes is developing 
clarifying, articulating. And it's a position about what there is. And it says that what there is, is whatever it is that needs no other entity in order to be. That's the self-sufficiency and the independence uh, that, we're, that I've been talking about. The being of substance, Heidegger tells us, is characterized by not needing anything. That whose being is such that it has no need at all for any other entity satisfies the idea of substance in the authentic sense. This entity is the ens perfectissimum. That's, that's who is, what is the ens perfectissimum, do you imagine, in Descartes? God. God, right, exactly. God is, and why is God the perfect entity in Descartes? What's that? He, he lacks nothing, and in particular, he depends on absolutely nothing else for his own existence. That's right. Also for his creation. And for his own creation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so he's the perfect entity. He's completely independent. Of course, in the, in the, in the Cartesian, in the actual Cartesian worldview, other entities aren't completely independent. They depend for their existence on God. God is the perfect entity in virtue of the fact that he's as independent as anything could possibly be. He's completely self-sufficient, depends on nothing else. Okay. Um, if it's... Okay, so that's, that's Descartes holding the view that Heidegger's going to be against. Um, one of the reasons that Heidegger's against this view is that he thinks that Descartes doesn't so much argue for it as presuppose it. In fact, he thinks in a certain way the Western tradition has presupposed this understanding of what there is, this understanding of being. Uh, and so, essentially, it's foreclosed the very question that Heidegger wants to ask, the question of being. Right? He wants to ask, uh, in what ways are there things? Without presupposing that there might be a, a single unified answer to that question, and certainly without presupposing that the answer to that question is going to uh, be devoted to the idea that what there is is independent and self-sufficient. But Heidegger starts out then by pointing out certain kinds of problems with the Cartesian view. And the first problem, at least you'd have thought it's a problem, is that on this account of substance, substances are so independent and so self-sufficient that it turns out we haven't got any direct access to them at all. And you can sort of imagine, just intuitively, you can sort of imagine why that is. I mean, you, you, you want to ask, what is it to be the stapler? And you've, and you've got this idea that if you're going to figure out really what it is to be the stapler, you're going to figure out the essential facts of the stapler that characterize it independent of everything else that there is in a way that it stands on its own in its staplerhood. That's what you're going to do, right? And so you start thinking about the things that you could take away and still have it be the stapler. And you wonder, can you take away, you know, its color? Sure, seems like it. Can you take away its shape? Yeah, sure, seems like it. Can you take away, you know, its material? Well, sure, seems like it. Those are all contingent features of it that don't get you to its, to its true staplerhood. And, and, and then you're, you're, you're left wondering, well, what is it? What is that in virtue of which it gets to be the stapler? And insofar as you can come up with an answer to that question, it doesn't look like an answer that you can get by, by looking at the thing at all or by accessing it, accessing it at all. It looks like something like that core element of the thing uh, in virtue of which it gets to be the thing that it is, that is whatever holds on to all these other contingent properties. And you get a notion of substance and all the accidents that adhere to, to the substances. So you could, yes, when? Not that this will make Descartes' position better, but to be like a little, I guess, it seems like he does think that some substances have principal attributes. So like when he gives yeah. examples about stones or, or wax, like yeah. there's a point at which he sort of elides the distinction, like the distinction that he's drawing. So he'll say like, I can take away all these things from the stone, yeah. 
but he doesn't call it a stone anymore. At the end of those passages, he usually calls it a body. And so, like, all he commits himself to is that there's this body here. But it's it's hard to say. I, it's hard to say that he's going to say that's still a stapler rather than just an extended substance that was once before we melted it a stapler. Uh huh. And so there's. I, I don't know. I think that's like. Okay, good. So that's helpful. I mean, that's the sense in which really what there is isn't staplers, because staplers aren't independent substances. Really, what there is is. Race extensa, right? Yeah. Extended things. Yeah. And then you have to ask the question do I have any direct access to things in virtue of which they are whatever it is that, that's really independent and self sufficient? That is, do I have any access to things insofar as they're things that are merely extended? And then the answer, look, at that point, it really does look like the answer is no, I take it. Yeah. Ayla. I think you're right in the sense that he doesn't think that you can't access them by perception. Yeah. So if you take by, if you're saying by looking at it, because yeah. that's where you talk. Yes. Ago. Yeah. Yes. I mean, in terms of perception, you cannot access the room because yeah. the way to go is to do mathematics. For that's exactly right. And that's what Heidegger's going to say. And I'm, I'm just about to read, read the passage where Heidegger says that. Yeah. So if you look at uh, the bottom of 126. Uh, Heidegger's going to say, look, for Descartes, substances are so independent that we actually have no direct access to them. And he's going to say this inaccessibility of substances is the result, Heidegger's going to say, of treating being as an entity that we can perceive by looking at it and then showing that uh, substances, you, you can't get to substances that way. So on the bottom of 126, 94 in the German, Heidegger says, Descartes not only evades the ontological question of substantiality altogether, he also emphasizes explicitly that substance as such, that is to say, its substantiality, what it is in virtue of which it's a substance, is in and for itself inaccessible from the outset. Uh, being itself does not affect us, he says, and therefore cannot be perceived. This being is something that you can't perceive. Being... Uh, Kant says later is not a real predicate, and Heidegger suggests that Kant here is just repeating Descartes' principle or developing it. Thus, the possibility of a pure prob problematic of being gets renounced in principle, Heidegger complains, and a way is sought for arriving at those definite characteristics of substance uh, which we've de designated above. Uh, because being is not, in fact, accessible as an entity, now he's talking from Descartes' point of view. It's not something that you can see. Uh, it's expressed through attributes, definite characteristics of the entities under consideration, characteristics which themselves are. Beings not expressed through just any such characterizations, but rather through those satisfying in the purest manner the me that meaning of being and substantiality, which has still been tacitly presupposed. So, so, you're, so you're presupposing the idea of substance as something that's self-standing and independent. Yeah. But, but he agrees with actually both Kant and Descartes in the fact that in fact it's being is not accessible as an entity, right? This that's is right. Common, but then, then the conclusion they draw from that, then we have to get access to it in terms of some attributes of it. And then which attributes are the salient ones? Yes. To be what they're discussing I mean Kant and Descartes and disagreeing about. That's exactly right. Yes. But the first part he agrees that being is not an entity. That's exactly right. He agrees that being is not an entity, and, but what he's going to disagree with is that that means you're, you're the perfect straight man, straight person. You're <laughs> leading me on to every point. So what that, what that means, no, it's great. So what that means is that uh, that's what draws Descartes to think that since we can't see being in its substantiality, there must be some other access to it, and the other access to it is through mathematical knowledge. And that's what Heidegger's going to, that's what Heidegger's going to complain about next. And he's going to say that that idea, the idea that you get to th figure out what there is by thinking about it, and not just thinking about it in any way, but thinking about it in the way one thinks about things when one does, say, mathematical physics, um, that idea is just going to have built into it a certain kind of presupposition that Heidegger wants to resist. So Heidegger's saying that on... Um, 128, um, 95 in the German, right in the middle, it's the second paragraph of section 21. Uh, 
this the uh, part I want to read? Yes. In our exposition of the problem of worldhood in section 14, we suggested the importance of obtaining proper access to the phenomenon of worldhood. And and we've seen what he thinks proper access is. You look at the breakdown conditions, and you look at signs, and you see what's pointed out by them. So in criticizing the Cartesian point of departure, we have to ask which kind of being that belongs to Dasein we should fix upon as giving us an appropriate way or mode of access to those entities with whose being as extensio Descartes equates the being of the world. So Heidegger wants to say, look, Descartes right that there are these extended things out there in the world. But there's a real question whether the extended things get you the actual structure of the world. And in order to answer that question, we've got to figure out what's the right mode of access to those entities. A question to which Descartes had an answer, uh, but Heidegger thinks not a sufficiently well thought out answer. Uh, the only genuine access to them lies in knowing intellectio, in the sense of the kind of knowledge, erkentness, uh, w- uh, that we get in mathematics and physics. That's to say, that, that kind of, that only, gen- that genuine, that's Descartes' view, that the only genuine access to them lies in, in uh, knowing. Mathematical knowledge is regarded by Descartes as the one manner of apprehending entities which can always give assurance that their being has been securely grasped. If anything measures up to its own kind of being, uh, in its own kind of being, to the being that's accessible in mathematical knowledge, then it is in the authentic sense. This is Descartes' presupposition about what there really is, sort of building itself into his story about what stand we need to take with respect to entities in order to figure out what they are in the most basic sense. Um, So if... uh, Such entities are those which always are what they are. That notion that the entities whose identity doesn't change over time are the entities that really are. And of course, substances will be like that. They don't change over time because they don't depend on anything else for their existence. Um, Such entities are those which always are what they are. That's Descartes' view. Accordingly, that which can be shown to have the character of something that constantly remains makes up the real being of those entities of the world which get experienced. That which enduringly remains really is. This is the sort of thing which mathematics knows. And that which is accessible as an entity through mathematics makes up its being. That's the Cartesian picture. So... If you start with the idea that what there is is substances, and you allow that idea to guide you in your thinking about uh, how you're going to figure out what the ultimate structure of the universe is, then you're going to be led, he thinks, sort of inexorably to the idea that the only way of figuring out what there is is the, is the mode of thinking about what there is that you find in mathematics. Because what there is is constant and unchanging. And mathematics gives us the constant and unchanging features of the universe. So mathematical knowledge is going to be the paradigm of so to speak, metaphysical thought. Mathematical physics, in particular, is going to be the paradigm of metaphysical thought. Okay, Heidegger thinks um, that's what Descartes committed to. But he thinks that this that this gives a lot of problems for Descartes. The first problem is that he can't ask the question that Heidegger thinks is the most basic question. He can't ask the question, what is it for something to be? And he can't ask it because he's already presupposed an answer to it. So Heidegger's way of saying this is to say that the problem of appropriate access to entities, the problem of trying to think about in which mode of intelligibility the entities present themselves as they really are, that problem can't arise for Descartes, even though that's really the problem that you ought to start your metaphysical project with. So Heidegger's saying this on 129, 96 in uh, uh, the German. The problem of how to get appropriate access to entities within the world is one which Descartes feels no need to raise 
because he's already presupposed an answer to it. Appropriate access is through mathematical knowledge because mathematical knowledge gives you what's constant and unchanging and what's constant and unchanging in the world is what there really is in the world. Under the unbroken ascendance of the traditional ontology, the way to get a genuine grasp of what really is has been decided in advance. It lies in knowing, which is a kind of thinking or beholding in the widest sense. Dia knowing or thinking is just a more fully achieved form of knowing and it's founded upon it. And sensatio, aesthesis, which is perception, as opposed to intellectio or thought, still remains possible as a way of access to entities by a beholding which is perceptual in character, but Descartes presents his critique of it because he's oriented ontologically by these principles, by the principles we've just laid out. Okay. So that seems that seems like a pretty fair characterization of Uh, as far as I can tell, a pretty fair characterization of the background presuppositions that are motivating Descartes and why those background presuppositions don't allow him to ask the question that Heidegger thinks is the, the basic question that you need to ask before you get started in thinking about being. But it's worse than that because it turns out that having presupposed an answer to the question, what there is, Heidegger's going to argue, Descartes is unable to account for what we can really see there is if we just look at the phenomena. Heidegger's going to argue that Descartes is unable to account for equipment, is unable to account for worlds, is unable to account for the structure of the world as worldhood. And ultimately, he's going to think, although he won't say it here, Descartes is unable to account for Dasein, unable to account for the mode of being that characterizes us. So Heidegger is going to say this in uh, a couple of um, attempts. The first place he says that we read already on 122, Um, that's 88 in the German. He's talking about these involvements, uh, these these, uh, relations uh, that equipment has with other equipment and equipment has with activities and ultimately equipment and activities have with Dasein, the in order to, the for the sake of, the with which, and so on. All these involvements resist any sort of mathematical functionalization. This is him saying, you can't do it. You can't account for these phenomena that I've just showed you. You can't account for these phenomena if you've got Descartes' mathematical method. Uh, Nor are they merely something thought first posited in an act of thinking. Um, I'm going to say something about that in a moment. They are rather relationships in which concernful circumspection as such already dwells. This system of relation as something constitutive for worldhood is so far from volatilizing the being of the ready to hand within the world, that the worldhood of the world provides the basis on which such entities can for the first time be discovered as they are substantially in themselves. So here he's putting substantially in scare quotes because he's using it in just the opposite of the sense that he's going to later tell us Descartes uses it. The way things are substantially and in themselves isn't as independent self-sufficient entities but as already tied into a unified world that we're already involved with and familiar with in a pre-ontological sense. Okay. And any attempt to get an account of that phenomenon by giving a sort of mathematical account of what's certain and unchanging in it is guaranteed to miss the facts. Um, so that's he's preparing you for the critique of Descartes right there. But he also says it's on 128. Uh, Now he says it, I think, as a series of sort of rhetorical questions. So we've got the idea that Descartes, insofar as Descartes familiar with the phenomenon of world at all, he understands it as made up of a whole bunch of extended substances. And so... Heidegger says at the top of section 21 on page 95 of the German, the critical question now arises, does this ontology of the world, 
uh, that's to say Descartes' ontology of the world, seek the phenomenon of the world at all. I've just told you what the phenomenon of the world is. Does Descartes' ontology get at that phenomenon in any way at all? And if not, does it at least define some entity within the world fully enough so that the worldly character of this entity can be made visible in it? What's he, th- what's he thinking about there? Some entity within the world. Which entity? What? Dasein or or the world or maybe just equipment, right? I mean, could you even, if you can't build the whole world out of these extended things, could you at least get the character of equipment in its ready-to-hand mode of being out of these extended things? Could you at least get that? I think that's the thing he's thinking of here. Later we're going to talk about Dasein. Uh, and, and I think earlier in the sentence he's asked about the phenomenon of the world. So the other entity that's left is equipment in its ready-to-hand mode of being. And the answer is going to say, he's going to say, to both questions, we must answer no. The entity which Dasein is trying to grasp ontologically, and in print, oh sorry, which Descartes (laughs) is trying to grasp ontologically, and in principle with his extensio, is rather such as to become discoverable, first of all, by going through an entity within the world which is proximally ready to hand. So that's to say equipment, the hammer. That's most itself when you're hammering with it, and that's transparent and withdraws from view. So this is Heidegger saying, uh, once you've started out with Descartes' metaphysics, this is just him asserting, really, that once you've started out with Descartes' metaphysics, uh, you're never going to be able to gain back the phenomena that he's now shown you uh, are really there in the, um, in the mode of intelligibility that's most natural to Dasein. Um, he's going to try to give an argument for it, although I'm not sure... There really is an argument for it. I, I, I have to confess, I sort of think that what I think... I think really Heidegger's method is something more like this. He's going to show you that there's a whole bunch of phenomena that are really phenomena of existence and that are really modes of intelligibility of things to us and ourselves to ourselves that once you recognize them, you realize you've got to account for. And then he's just going to say, I think, that it doesn't seem likely that you're going to be able to account for them if you start with present hand entities. And look, my system is tailor-made to account for them. I think that's really about all he can, all he can do. He's hoping that you'll just see that his, since his question, since the phenomena he's pointing out are so central, so important to our existence, to our understanding of the kind of being we are, and therefore to our understanding of what there is out in the world. And since his system is tailor-made to explain all those phenomena, and since it looks very, very hard and unlikely that you'll be able to explain those phenomena using something like Descartes' system, um, he's hoping you'll get a kind of gestalt switch, I think. But I'll read you a place where he's started to give an argument. Um, Alan, yeah. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm about to read, yeah. What I'm going to suggest is, uh, I don't, I'm not sure uh, that it works as an argument. I think it works as an intuition, but it doesn't seem to me a knockdown argument. But you're right, that's what I'm about to read at the bottom of 131 and over to 132. Uh, the issue here, so here's the issue. Um, Heidegger says, look, I've given you a story about uh, the structure of the world and about equipment. The hammer is most itself. When I'm skillfully hammering with it and it withdraws, and when it breaks down, it points out that it had bearing on the nails, was involved with the nails, and they had bearing on the the, uh, 
on the boards, the planks, and all of that had bearing on the activity of providing shelter, and all of that made sense in the context of Daseins being the being that takes a stand on its own being. I've given you this whole story about significance. Um, I've given you all that, and it's based on the idea that there has to be a whole of relations among all the equipment. Uh, and you might, you might try to model that mathematically, Heidegger's going to say, and he's going to suggest that maybe Descartes would. But once you model it mathematically, there's going to be this kind of predicate in there that he's going to call a value predicate or a function predicate. You're going to predicate of the hammer that it's for hammer. And the question is whether this abstract function predicate uh, is going to gain back all of the significance that he's uncovered in pointing out the phenomenon as it shows up in the case of signs and in the case of breakdown of equipment. So this is um, what's happening at the bottom of 131. Uh, one might retort, however, and this is sort of Descartes retorting, that even if in point of fact both the problem of the world and the being of the entities encountered environmentally as closest to us remain concealed, nevertheless Descartes has still laid the basis for characterizing ontologically that entity within the world upon which in its very being every other entity is founded, material nature. You might think that Descartes, in other words, can explain the phenomenon that I've pointed out uh, just by adverting to material nature and other bits that, other, other things that are made out of material nature. Here's how it would work. Material nature is the fundamental stratum upon which all the other strata of actuality within the world are built up. The extended thing as such, then, would serve in the first instance as the ground for those definite characters which show themselves to be sure as qualities, but which at bottom are quantitative modifications of the modes of the extensio itself. This is going to be sort of Descartes' account. You get, these, you get these modifications of the mode of extensio that are um, qualities of the basic extended substance, uh, and those uh, modifications themselves are mathematically characterizable. They're quantitative modifications. And these qualities, which are themselves reducible, would then provide the footing for, and this is supposed to be the magic move, such specific qualities as the beautiful, the ugly, the in-keeping, the not in-keeping, the useful, the useless, the appropriate, the good, the valuable, the forehammering, and so on and so forth. That, you might think you could do it that way. You might think you could say, look, uh, ultimately what it is to be a stapler is to be for staplering. And for the for staplering is something that I can that I can characterize in terms of these quantitative modifications of the modes of the extended stuff in the first place. If one is oriented primarily by thinghood, these la as Descartes is, these latter qualities must be taken as non-quantifiable value predicates by which what is in the first instance just a material thing gets stamped as something good or something beautiful, or something ugly, or something for staplering. I need a better example. That's hard to say. For hammer, for draw, stapling, is that better? <laughs> okay. uh, that's easier, thank you. Uh, but, with this, so, but with this stratification, now here's the criticism. We come to those entities which we have characterized, which we have characterized ontologically as equipment ready to hand. Haven't we just done it, he's saying. We've gotten the four stapling, and we've added it as one of these quantifiable modifications of the extended substance um, that turns out to be a, a value predicate. Uh, haven't we just gotten back the equipment ready to hand? The Cartesian analysis of the world, uh, this, the quotes there... Um, are sort of ironic. Remember, I, I don't remember the... Uh, they're either ironic or wrong. What's the that? World, it, when it's in this quote, refers to the world in the first sense. 
That's what he says. Yeah, that's right. Or, or the second sense. In either of the categorical sentences. So he says in, in, on page 93, when he tells us about the four uses of world, two categorical and two existential, he says, look, the third and the fourth, the existential uses are the real uses. Those are the ones that I'm going um, to point to by using the word world. And I'm going to put it in quotes when I mean either of the categorical senses. World considered as a collection of, en- of substance type entities entities or the substance type entities themselves or, or what it is to be uh, that, that collection of substance type entities um, so this should be the categorical stuff the Cartesian analysis of the world I think the way to read it is he, that's what all Descartes can get he can just get the categorical analysis but what I had was the real phenomenon and he hasn't been able to get that back The Cartesian analysis of the world would thus enable us for the first time to build up securely the structure of what this proximally ready to hand, of what is proximally ready to hand. All it takes is to round out the thing of nature until it becomes a full-fledged thing of use, and this is easily done. I want to point out here, you should mark it in in the margins. This is Heidegger, it doesn't happen very often. This is Heidegger being ironic. This, it doesn't, he was not a, really a man full of irony, this guy. Um, but this is page 132. In the German, it's uh, 99, at the beginning of 99. He doesn't think that this is easily done. In fact, he doesn't really think it's doable at all. So it's a kind of rhetorical, ironical state. Of course. And if that's all you have to do. You have to round out the... Th- you, you just have to add the right number of value predicates, and then you'll have rounded out the thing of use. And this is easily done. The full-fledged thing of use. And this is easily done. But of course, he doesn't think it's easily done. And he says um, a few... Uh, lines down into the next paragraph, adding on value predicates cannot tell us anything at all new about the being of goods, about the being of whatever it is that has value or that's for hammering for something in the genuine sense in which significant equipment is, but would merely presuppose again that goods have pure presence at hand as their kind of being, because the value predicates themselves have pure presence at hand as their kind of being. They're self-sufficient and independent, and they stand on their own. They're definable, independent of everything else. Okay. So, this is, at the very least, this is Heidegger's sort of intuition. You're not going to be able to do it. It's an intuition that I think has been borne out uh, uh, in certain kinds of research programs, uh, like, for instance, the the traditional kind of artificial intelligence research program, which I think I mentioned early in the semester, uh, which was based on the idea that uh, you might be able to characterize what there is out in the world in terms of a whole set of predicates that that tell us what we know about what there is out in the world. And it looks like even that uh, project uh, was was doomed to fail. I mean, it has failed. Uh, And that's that's the kind of project that takes the Cartesian metaphysics and builds it into a research it builds it into a research program. But I don't think this is I don't think there's a knockdown argument here. I think there's just the intuition that if you start with something that's sufficiently unlike the phenomenon that you're trying to characterize, you're never going to be you're never going to be able to build it back up. Um, And you, anyhow, you can you can sort of see why that why that might work. Um, Okay, that's that's what I want to say for the moment about Descartes. Are there questions about that or things that we should? Like I say, you could sort of have predicted that that's what he was going to say. But it maybe is helpful to see it spelled out a little bit. Questions about that? Concerns? Okay. That's, it's, it's obvious enough. I w- now I want to move on to the being with chapter. So we're, we're moving on to chapter four of division one. <coughs> and you remember I gave you a kind of schematic uh, at the beginning of the semester... I said there's going to be a chapter on the world. There's going to be, that's chapter, chapters two and three. There's going to be a chapter on being in. 
That's chapter 5. And then there's going to be this chapter in the middle that I said was devoted to the who of everyday Dasein, which is a maybe a, a bizarre phrase. I mean, it's a little hard to... Not, it doesn't sound like uh, a normal phrase. But I, <laughs> as if anything in Heidegger sounds like a normal phrase. But there's... but. But I think it's a kind of traditional question. His answer is going to be radically untraditional, as you could have expected. But the question that he's interested in is a version of the question, uh, who am I? That's to say, what is it to be the kind of being that I am? Uh, And in particular, what is it to be the kind of being that I am when I'm normally whoever I am? That's the everydayness. In the normal case... What is it to be the kind of being that I am? Uh, that's a version of a traditional question about, say, personal identity, for instance. Who am I, or what is it to be the being that I am? Uh, and I'm going to spell that out in just a second, but let me show you Heidegger posing the questions. Um, so if you look on uh, page 149... Uh, which is the very beginning of chapter 4. It's page 114 in the German. <laughs> just about 10 lines, or 113. Well, just exactly one. Well, 113. Um, uh, one, the last two lines of 113, it says, uh, um, Dasein is absorbed in the world. That should be familiar. Dasein finds itself already uh, concerned with and circumspectively taking account of the equipment that it finds in its world and transparently using it. The kind of being which it thus possesses, which Dasein thus possesses, um, and in general the being in which underlies it are essential in determining the character of a phenomenon which we are now about to study. We shall approach this phenomenon by asking who it is that Dasein is in its everydayness. So you want to think about uh, your everyday activities, the activities in which you already find yourself absorbed whenever you're doing anything. And then you want to ask the question, who am I when I'm like that? Who am I in, when I'm hammering with the hammer? Or who am I when I'm walking through the door? Or who am I when I'm sitting in the chair? Or who am I when I'm getting into the elevator? And so on. Those are the, that's the kind of question he wants to ask. All the structures of being which belong to Dasein, together with the phenomenon which provides the answer to this question of the who, are ways of being. Uh, ways of its being. Okay. Well, never mind that. We'll, we'll just. We all I need is the question. I think he asks the question again on one fifty three, <coughs> in the beginning of section twenty six, on page one seventeen of the German. He says, the answer to the question of the who of every da, every, every day Dasein is to be obtained. By analyzing that kind of being in which Dasein maintains itself proximally and for the most part. So, proximally and for the most part, this is this phrase that he takes from Aristotle. It means normally and usually. Think about whatever it is that you're normally and usually doing. It's so normally and usually, so maybe banal, that you don't even think of yourself as doing it. Walking on the ground or uh, sitting in the chair, and so on. Uh, eating, your, eating your meal in the way, in the way that you do. Uh, so it's analyzing that kind of being in which Dasein maintains itself proximally and for the most part that we're going to try to answer the question of the who of everyday Dasein. You can see already, if you try to think about the traditional question of personal identity, that this is a departure. And it's a departure that's exactly analogous to the departure that Heidegger used when he was thinking about the being of equipment. Now he's going to think about the being of Dasein, what it is to be Dasein. And he's going to talk about what it is to be Dasein, not by focusing on, um, well, what? Not by focusing on what? what? 
Think of, think of the traditional question of personal identity. How many of you have had philosophy classes where you talk about personal identity? Okay. So who, well, when you're asking the question of personal identity, um, who's a figure that you might think about? Parfit. Parfit, a very recent figure. Who's a classic figure? Locke. Locke. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> so we've got Locke on, on personal identity. Tell me in three sentences, what, what, what kind of thing does Locke think? Um, like getting him right, he yeah. was worried about like, continuity of, of, of personhood. Yeah. Right, exactly. So he's worried about the question, what is it to be the same individual across time? And he gives a kind of criterion, or he, he's sometimes interpreted as giving a kind of criterion. Anyone remember what the criterion is for Locke? You can remember having been that person. The memory criterion. So I, I count as being the same person now as I was earlier if I can remember the experiences that that guy earlier had. Generates all sorts of problems. Right? Uh, Counterexamples flood the mind. And, when, you know, and you can, you're often running in a research program devoted to answering the question on those grounds. Right? On the grounds that suggest that the clue for thinking about who I am is going to be, um, is going to be that I should think about who I am in those contexts in which I'm wondering about who I am. Those content. I'm wondering at this moment whether I'm the same as this person in the earlier, who 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 existed at some earlier time, and now I've got a criterion. I can I can uh, think. I can reflect uh, on my on my own memories, my own internal states, and try to determine whether I remember the experiences that that earlier that that earlier person had. If I do, uh, if I am capable of, of remembering those experiences, then I get to count as the same person. Right? Okay. Is that the kind of is that the kind of approach that Descartes is gonna is gonna take? I'm sorry, that Heidegger is gonna take. <laughs> Heidegger. Heidegger. <laughs> Obviously not. Right. Obviously not. And what's different is that Heidegger's not going to be at all interested in thinking about the question of who I am by thinking about what it's like to be the kind of being that I am when I'm asking the question, who am I? That's not going to be the central issue. The central issue is going to be to think about who I am in just those situations when I'm not asking the question who I am, but rather going along and doing whatever it is I do normally and usually. Those are the situations where, for the, in the first place, he wants to think about who, <coughs> who Dasein is. So, you could, do, um, you could do a version of it by thinking about, and Heidegger does a version of it, by thinking about the contrast between him and Descartes. Descartes, of course, thinks that what characterizes me as the individual that I am is like what characterizes uh, the stuff out there in the extended world as the stuff that it is, except different, <laughs> like it, but different. It's like it because I'm a substance, but I'm a very different kind of substance than the extended substances. I'm a thinking substance. And Descartes, of course, famously, uh, comes to discover this by asking himself uh, what he can be certain about when he thinks about who he is. And the answer is that he can, when reflecting upon himself, he can always find that there's an I who's thinking. Okay. All sorts of questions and concerns about whether the methodology in Descartes is right, and but all the most of those questions arise in the context of presupposing that Descartes got the general project sort of right, and that's what that's what Heidegger wants to resist. So Heidegger's giving Descartes' version of it on page one fifty one. So. We've, uh, we've got the idea, Heidegger's got on the table the idea that we're going to ask who we are when we're involved in the activities that we normally and usually find ourselves involved in. 
And someone's going to respond. We could call this on 151. This is 115 in the German. Um, we could call this response the response of the Cartesian interlocutor. You've you got to be careful with Heidegger. The way you have to be careful with, with Wittgenstein, although he's not usually ironic, occasionally it happens. Um, and, but more often it happens that he's not talking in propria persona. He's not speaking for himself. He's speaking from the point of view of some interlocutor who might naturally pose a kind of objection. He's not always all that great at highlighting the fact that he's not speaking in propria persona. And Wittgenstein has the same kind of uh, style to his writing uh, with the same kinds of problems. But it, here's a case where Heidegger is not speaking in propria persona. He's speaking in the voice of the Cartesian interlocutor. And he says, but is it not contrary to the rules of all sound method to approach a problematic without sticking to what is given as evident in the area of our theme? And what is more indubitable than the givenness of the eye? I reflect on it. Through my reflective awareness, I discover an eye that's reflecting. And in discovering that, I discover that there's a thinking thing and it's the eye. And does not this givenness tell us that if we aim to work this, work this out primordially, we must disregard everything else that's given, quote-unquote, not only a world, quote-unquote, that is, but even the being of other eyes. This is the Cartesian position. If I'm really going to think about what's given in the most basic sense, then what I've got to do is reflect and find out what's most certain. And what's most certain is that there's thinking going on and maybe even that I'm the one doing the thinking. And what's apparently given, but not given in this very certain sense, is that there's stuff out there in the world and that there are other people and so on. But... But that stuff we can all bring into question on the Cartesian view of things. Uh, you get a kind of skeptic, possible skepticism about the external world, possible skepticism about other minds. And, uh, and uh, Descartes says, but you can't have skepticism about the existence of yourself uh, in virtue of the fact that you're asking the question, what is there? Uh, you've already got the answer that there's a thinking thing and it's me. Okay. The kind of giving we have here is the... Me so, so now Heidegger, I think, um, switches uh, to... Let me see. I think this is now Heidegger switching to his own voice. The kind of giving... Now, it, whether there's a distinction between the single quotes and the double quotes around given and giving... Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. There might be. Is, uh, is there a distinction in the German? They're the same thing? Well, there's just one kind of quote. There's just one kind of the double yeah. quotes. Okay, yeah, then there shouldn't be. Okay. So, um, the kind of giving we have here is the mere formal reflective awareness of the eye. And perhaps what's, what it gives is indeed evident. In other words, he doesn't want to deny that Descartes found something. But he doesn't think what Descartes has found is the most fundamental thing to find. This insight even affords access to a phenomenological problematic in its own right, which has, in, which has the signification of providing a fundamental framework as a formal phenomenology of consciousness. You could do that. Husserl sort of did that. Uh, but it's not, the, it's not the existential project that Heidegger's interested in. So there's the traditional answer. Descartes thinks that if you want to figure out who you are or what it is to be the kind of being that you are, you should, do, you should perform this kind of reflective awareness. You should involve yourself in the Cartesian method of asking what you can be most certain about. And in the reflective awareness, you discover necessarily that there's thinking going on and an I that's doing the thinking. And that's the thing that's given and isn't it obvious that when you're given something like that, uh, in that kind of certain way, it tells you what there is? And Heidegger's going to say, uh, no, it's not obvious. So Heidegger's going to sketch a different account. And the different account is going to have some advantages that he thinks 
are going to st- uh, sort of push, push, in it, push in its favor. One of the advantages that we'll see, although we may not get to it um, today, is going to be that uh, these traditional, two of the advantages are going to be that these traditional problems that you're left with if you start from the Cartesian um, metaphysical standpoint, the traditional pro- epistemological problems, skepticism about the external world and skepticism about other minds, which pl- have plagued philosophers ever since Descartes uh, sort of initiated this kind of, uh, this particularly modern way of thinking about those issues. Those problems, which are thorny and nearly impossible to get around, these two kinds of skepticism, turn out not to be problems at all if you start with Heidegger's way of thinking about it. So, and we'll see um, probably next time something about what Heidegger, what Heidegger has to say in response to the problem of other minds. We'll have to wait until section 43 to get Heidegger's response to the problem of skepticism about the external world. But of course you can see how those kinds of problems arise. How many are familiar with these kinds of skeptical problems? More or less. Okay, so um, just a word. Of course, if you're in Descartes' sort of worldview, it looks like you can't have the kind of certainty about chairs and tables and other people, and especially the thoughts of other people, that you've got about your own thoughts and your own existence. Uh, And not being able to have that kind of certainty ensures that you could always doubt that the chairs and the tables and the books and the other people, uh, you could always doubt that they are the way they seem to be. You could even doubt that they exist at all. Uh, though you can't doubt that about yourself or about, uh, or about the thoughts that you've got. So from the Cartesian point of view, you're left with a very disconcerting kind of problem. The problem that it might turn out that the only thing that there is is, your, is you and, and the thinking that's going on. I mean, you could even doubt the existence of your own physical body on Descartes', on Descartes view. Um, this turns out to be a deeply thorny set of issues. Whole central areas of philosophy up to the present day are devoted to thinking about how one uh, could possibly give answers to those questions. And we're going to see that what Heidegger thinks is not so much that he can give an answer to the question, but Heidegger thinks uh, there's something, you, you know there's something wrong with your metaphysics if it turns out to need an answer to that question. Because that kind of question is the kind of question that, a- that ought to answer itself, and it does in his, in his worldview. It's not going to be so much that he answers the problem of other minds, or the question of skepticism about the other world. He's going to complain that you shouldn't be asking that question, and he's going to show you how, if you've got the worldview that he's got, you don't need to ask that question. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but at the moment, we're thinking about uh, who Dasein is when uh, he's doing what he does normally and usually. And, and we've seen that the traditional answer is an answer that isolates you from, every, from everyone else and gets you and your own uniqueness and your own individuality and tells you how it is proper to characterize you as independent from everyone else. You've got the memories that connect you to the earlier experiences. You're uh, capable of reflecting on your own self through a kind of inward turning, um, uh, reflective awareness, and, and various other kinds of things. So the traditional answer to the, to the problem of personal identity is an answer that tells you um, the, how to characterize yourself as independent from everyone else. So you should notice the you should notice the parallel here. Just as Descartes wants to um, wants to characterize entities as self sufficient things, so he wants to characterize us as self sufficient and independent. And the whole tradition thinks that unless you've 
told the story that way, you haven't, got, uh, you haven't really posed the set of problems right. And that's exactly what da- uh, Descartes is going to resist. And he tells you right up front that he's going to resist it. He says, normally and usually, who Dasein is, is determined by others, not by myself. And he's saying it right at the right at the beginning of uh, of chapter four, <coughs> uh, on page one forty nine, uh, which is uh, page one fourteen in the German. Heidegger says six lines from the bottom of of um, one forty nine. By directing our researches towards the phenomenon which is to provide us with an answer to the question of the who. We shall be led to certain structures of Dasein which are equiprimordial with being in the world. They are co-constitutive of being in the world. And those structures are being with, that's to say being with other Daseins, and Dasein with, which is the mode of being that other Daseins, Daseins other than myself, have. In this kind of being is grounded the mode of every day being oneself. Every day being oneself, who you are normally and usually is grounded in uh, these relations with others. The explication of this mode will enable us to see uh, what we may call the subject, quote unquote, of everydayness. Subject, quote unquote, because there's nothing subjectum about it. There's nothing, it's not, a, it's not in any way a subject of the sort that Descartes or Locke or Leibniz or Spurgeon, any of the traditional philosophers, modern philosophers would have understood it, precisely because it's not a self standing, independent entity, far from it. It's characterized as, now he says, the they. Um, the German phrase is das Mann, and Probably a better translation of it is the one. Who you are in your everyday activity is just whoever one is. When one is walking around, going through doors, sitting on chairs, uh, eating at tables, and so on and so forth. The characterization of Dasein in its everydayness is is a characterization of Dasein as receptive to the norms for what one does. And that's who we are normally and usually. Normally and usually, there's nothing that individuates me from anyone else. Part of what it is to be me, in fact, (coughs) the very condition of the possibility of me being me in in any more authentic sense, is that I'm already, in all of the normal and usual cases, involved in activities that uh, get the meaning that they do in virtue of the social norms for what one does in those, in those kinds of activities. So, so, so Heidegger's answer, sort of projected answer, is going to be that normally and usually who we are is determined precisely by others and not by ourselves. He's saying it a little more explicitly, I think, on 163. Uh, which is 125 in the German. Uh, At the very end of section 26, uh, he says, one's own Dasein, like the Dasein with of others, is encountered proximally and for the most part, normally and usually, in terms of the with world, with which we're environmentally concerned. We already find ourselves in a world with others, and that means we already find ourselves in a world in which we're open to, sensitive to, and responsive to the social norms for what one does in whatever situation we find ourselves. That's that's the story that he's going to try to tell. Um, You might think that this story is, stands in tension with, maybe even in contrast with, something that we've already seen uh, in the beginning of chapter, uh, of Division 1, uh, way back in Section 9 on page 68. So 
So I'll just go back and remind you. This, maybe this jump leapt to mind for some of you. Or 67 even. Um, um, yeah, 67, 42 in the German. Section 9. Remember we made something of this early on. That being which is an issue for this entity. This entity is Dasein. That being which is an issue for our Dasein in its very being is in each case mine. Heidegger insists. So Heidegger is telling us in some way what it is to be me is special. I mean, it's mine. I said earlier that whatever that means, it's not going to mean I have some special reflective awareness to my, uh, with respect to my internal states. Mindness which is going to be spelled out later in terms of uh, what Heidegger calls authenticity. Mindness is going to be something special that doesn't involve the reflective awareness that I've got of my own internal states. But you might think that it's inconsistent to say that Dasein is in each case mine, and to say at the same time that normally and usually who I am is determined by others. That inconsistency is apparent inconsistency is something that we're going to have to think about uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit next time. But what I want to highlight here is um, the idea that uh, well, let me just see what I say I want to say the right now. Um, what I want to highlight here is just the idea that so far, Heidegger is telling us that if you think about who Dasein is normally and usually in its everyday activity, then who it is is going to be determined by others and not, and not by itself. And that's going to turn out to mean that normally and usually, Dasein uh, isn't disclosing itself as uh, uh, in its own most, he'll say, isn't disclosing itself in the way in which it is mine. But nevertheless, what I do normally and usually when I'm determined by the social norms that are out there uh, and manifest in others, what I do normally and usually is the condition of the possibility of my, in any other situation, doing something that's authentically mine. That's the position we're going to aim for. Uh, and that hopefully we'll get to that position um, to be position on Thursday. Um, let me pause. There's a couple minutes left. I didn't give anyone a chance to say anything. I feel sort of bad about that. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that's yeah. Uh, so we'll, let me give you a couple minutes to catch your breath and, and see if there's anything that that came out as uh, sort of requiring uh, a question or clarification. Yeah, Jackson. Um, I agree with this project by talking about look at ourselves in our everydayness. Yeah. Um, where does that leave us when we're not in our everydayness? Does he, does he admit that, there's <coughs> that we can be in, any, in a different kind of mode other than everydayness? Sure. Absolutely he does. Um, and there's a lot of different ways uh, uh, that that can happen. One way that it can happen is you can uh, uh, be in one of these special sort of Cartesian reflective states of awareness. That's one way. Uh, but there are other ways Heidegger is not going to think that that special Cartesian state of reflective awareness is one that tells us anything particularly interesting about us. Um, but he's going to look for the uh, authentic mode of being of Dasein. He's going to look for the mode of being of Dasein that really reveals what it is to be Dasein. And that mode is not going to be the mode of everydayness either. Um, uh, it's going to be something else. And I can say, I mean, well, we, we will devote a lot of chap, a lot of division two to figuring out what that is. But whatever it is, it's going to be, it's going to, you're going to be led to think about it by having the right mode of access to Dasein instead of the wrong mode of access. What he thinks is this special Cartesian reflective awareness. That's a mode of access to Dasein, but it's not especially revealing one. And you've got to ask the question: What is the best mode of access to Dasein, the one that really reveals what Dasein is? Just as you asked about the equipment, what's the best mode of access to it that really reveals what it is? And I'll just read you a passage where he's saying what it is. It's, you're going to think about Dasein, the existing Dasein, rather than the thinking Dasein. Um, 
he says um, at the bottom of 152, <coughs> um, 117 in the German, he says uh, rhetorically, but does this mean that there are no clues whatever for answering the question of the who by way of existential analysis? Certainly not. That's what we're going to do. Of the ways in which we formally indicated the constitution of Daseins being above, the one we've been discussing doesn't, of course, function so well as a clue. The one we've been discussing is the Cartesian one, I think. Um, uh, uh, as a clue, as does the one according to which Dasein's essence is grounded in its existence. So it's 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 its existence that we're going to have to think about. If the I is an essential characteristic of Dasein, then it's one which must be interpreted existentially. So in the case of uh, in in that case, the who is to be answered only by exhibiting phenomenally a definite kind of being which Dasein exists. You've got to look at Dasein in its existing rather than Dasein in its thinking for instance. That's the, so when you're going along being the, the kind of being you are without noticing that you're being that kind of being, that's when you're most going to be the kind of being that you are. That's paradoxical, but we'll, but we'll have to spell that out. Okay, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Uh, okay, great. So what I want to do today is I want to move on to... Uh, well, we, we were heading towards uh, uh, the introduction, the first introduction. Um, there are two introductions to the text, and I've explained to you before that um, Heidegger clearly wrote them after he'd written at least Division One of the book, um, and so we really haven't been able, haven't been prepared to understand what they say until now. Uh, but now that we've read. Division one, I think, or most of it, talked about most of it. We're close to being ready. So I want to work my way towards uh, talking about the first of the introductions, which is usually called the substantive introduction. It's about the question, what is the question of being? Which is the question that the book is supposed to be um, uh, devoted to. The second introduction is usually called the methodological introduction. And that's the introduction that goes over what method Heidegger intends to use in trying to uh, give an interpretation of or an answer to the question of being. And of course that method is the phenomenological method, which he defines in section 7 of um, the, the second introduction, the methodological introduction. We'll talk hopefully about the methodological introduction uh, next session. Uh, today I want to get to the substantive introduction. But before we get to it, I want to wrap up some things that we didn't quite finish last time when we were talking about uh, truth and truth and reality. So just to remind you where we did get to last time, uh, we started talking about uh, truth. And we started out with Heidegger's criticism. I think I mentioned this criticism isn't unique to him. But his criticism of the traditional theory of truth, which is called the correspondence theory of truth. Um, the criticism isn't unique to him, but his response to the criticism uh, is unique. Uh, the criticism, remember, says that if you think about truth as a matter of the correspondence between some representation that's hold, held in the mind and some object or event or state of affairs that's out there in the world, then you've got to ask what this correspondence or adequation in the Latin or likening, homoiosis in the Greek, what it could amount to. If it's a correspondence or adequation or likening between things that are so radically different than what, that one lives in the realm of the mental and one lives in the external realm, however that's characterized, either the realm of extended things in Descartes or maybe the realm of physical things in a sort of physicalist characterization of the universe and so on. How could these things that, are in su that live in such radically different domains 
correspond to one another in, in a relevant way. Now, Heidegger doesn't work out this kind of criticism very much, in very much detail. He asks it as a kind of rhetorical question, and I read the passages last time. Uh, but he thinks that this kind of criticism is sufficiently difficult to, to deal with, that even if you started at the project of being from the question of truth, you'd be driven to something like a, the kind of characterization, the kind of project that Heidegger's driven to, which is the project of starting by asking what kind of being we are, what kind of being Dasein is, such that um, we can do things like uh, be directed towards entities uh, and make assertions about entities and ultimately do things like ask the question of being. So Heidegger thinks that the typical story that you get that, uh, that characterizes truth in terms of the correspondence theory is, under, is undercharacterized because it depends on a sort of background assumption about what the being is that has these mental states and what kind of being the entities in the world are, such that we can have thoughts about them, and then it just sort of uh, bootstraps itself from there and, make, and helps itself to an inadequate account of correspondence. So Heidegger thinks, of course, but, you know, in general, if you mean this in a very empty and vague way, there's nothing, nothing particularly wrong with it. But insofar as you've got built into your story about truth, these background assumptions about what kind of being we are and what kind of being, uh, being the entities in the world have, as long as you think of it that way, then you're going to be in trouble. So Heidegger says you've got to think about it in a different way, and we're ready to think about it in a different way. We're ready to think about it in a different way precisely because we've got on the table now a story about the kind of being that we are, Dasein, that doesn't reduce us to uh, uh, an imminent sphere of mental representations, but thinks of us as the being that takes a stand on its own being by uh, take, uh, putting itself in uh, r relation to and dealing with and taking up and coping with entities in a skillful way so that they can withdraw and reveal themselves as they really are in themselves. Once you've got that story on the table, then there is a notion of truth that makes sense, and it's got two parts to it. There's a kind of ontic part and an ontological part, and I sort of named these last time, but I want to, um, I don't think I really read the passages for them. So the ontic kind of truth is the truth that says that uh, there's a phenomenon called being uncovering or uncovering of entities, which is the phenomenon that goes along with what happens when entities show themselves as one thing or another. And that's uh, the condition of the possibility of any entity showing itself as the thing that it really is. And so that's the condition of the possibility of truth. And so, by means of our little Latin principle that the name goes to the stronger, um, we, can call that a, we can call that a phenomenon of truth. That's the ontic version of truth. And Heidegger's naming it on 261. Uh, towards the bottom of 261, 218 in the German, he says, <coughs> to say that an assertion is true signifies that it uncovers the entity as it is in its self. Such an assertion asserts, points out, lets the entity be seen, apophansis, that's the notion of the first signification of Logos in its uncoveredness, the being true of the assertion, what it is for an assertion to be true, uh, is in the first instance understood as being uncovering. Thus, truth has by no means the structure of an agreement between knowing, which is usually thought of, and he means here to, for it to be thought of as uh, an internal me mental representation of the way the world is that uh, 
that's justified and, and true, say, between knowing and the object in the sense of a likening of one entity, the subject, to another, the object. Because that's got a bad metaphysical presupposition about what's, uh, what the entities are. Rather, the real phenomenon of truth is the one according to which entities can show themselves as they are in themselves, which is what happens when they go from being withdrawn to actually showing themselves as one thing or another. So that's the, that's the first thing that you might properly call a phenomenon of truth. Um, and there's an important sense then in which truth is the kind of thing that's only available to our kinds of entities. Truth is the kind of thing that's only available to Dasein because if truth involves uncovering entities, letting themselves show themselves as they are, and if that involves already having disclosed entities, which you do by using them skillfully and dealing with them so that they withdraw, then only Dasein has the ability to, to um, let entities show themselves as they are. So only Dasein has the ability to, um, uh, to be in the truth. So it's going to turn out, although Heidegger doesn't say this, uh, that if you had an entity that wasn't of the being of Dasein, say if you had like a, you know, a computer that made... Uh, that sort of printed out statements about the weather or printed out statements about um, you know, the room that it was in, something like that. Even if it printed, suppose it printed out those statements randomly. Uh, you have the computer that prints out the statement, it's raining now. Uh, suppose it happens to be raining now. On this kind of account, Heidegger's going to say, if you thought what it was for the assertion to be true was just for it to represent the world as being a certain way and for the world actually to be that way, then that statement would count as a true statement. But on the way that I want to think about truth, truth is inexorably tied to a much more fundamental phenomenon. It's tied to the phenomenon according to which we disclose a world by using the entities in it so that they can withdraw um, and be as they are most in themselves. And it's only because we're already doing that that the entities can show themselves as they are. Uh, so you've got to have all that structure up and running before you can have it, the genuine phenomenon of truth. So if this counts, if this computer printout thing counts as uh, a kind of true statement at all, it counts only in the most, only in the most derivative sense and, and probably not even in that sense. Uh, okay, so we have the ontic notion of truth, according to which entities can show themselves as they are. Uh, um, and he says, I say that I should read also a passage on 263. Um, at the top of 263. Being true, the second paragraph, 220 in the German. Being true as being uncovering is a way of being for Dasein. What makes this very uncovering possible must necessarily be called true in a still more primordial sense. Uh, and then he goes on. Uh, I think this next sentence is a transition. The most primordial phenomenon of truth is first shown by the existential ontological foundations of uncovering. So you've got this ontic phenomenon in any particular case uh, an entity can show itself as the entity that it is. The hammer can show itself as too heavy to you, or it can show itself as weighing 16 ounces to you. And it can do that uh, only in virtue of the fact that uh, entities can show themselves as the kinds of entities they are to you. But that can happen only because you're the kind of entity that discloses a world in the first case. So that's why he says the most primordial phenomenon of truth is first shown by the existential ontological foundations of uncovering. So beneath uncovering, you've got this phenomenon according to which Dasein discloses a world in the first instance. And it's only because Dasein's already doing that that there's any, uh, there's any phenomenon of being true at all. So the... On, so 
the ontological notion of truth is the most primordial phenomenon of truth. Uh, and that's just based on the fact that Dasein is a disclosive entity or that Dasein is being in the world. He says it that way uh, at the bottom of 261. Uh, reading on from where I stopped earlier, being true as being uncovering, that's the ontic version, is in turn ontologically possible only on the basis of being in the world. The latter phenomenon, which we've known as a basic state of Dasein, is the foundation for the primordial phenomenon of truth. So, you've got ontic truth, which is this phenomenon of entities being uncovered, showing themselves as they are, having an as structure. And you've got ontological truth, which is the phenomenon of uh, uh, essentially Daseins disclosing a world in such a way that although in the most basic case when you're disclosing a world, entities don't show themselves as they are in themselves, nevertheless, they present themselves to you in such a way that they can uh, show themselves as they are in themselves. That's a possibility even in the basic case where the hammer's completely withdrawn. Uh, and that fundamental state is the most, most basic notion of truth, uh, Heidegger thinks. So I'll just... I'll just uh, and, and this, of course, is a notion of truth that's supposed to get at the original Greek sense of the word... Uh, where truth is a letting out of hiddenness. Truth is an aletheia, a not hiddenness. Uh, and the not hiddenness is um, available to Dasein, even in that moment where the entity is completely withdrawn. It's available as a possibility. That's the issue that, that Heidegger is talking about on 262. So um, I think I read the... Logos, um, I think I read this little passage last time, but I'll just read it again. It's three lines. Um, in the middle, in the two thirds of the way down, 262, just at the end of 219 in the German. Um, Thus to the Logos belongs unhiddenness, ah, letheia. To translate this word as truth, and above all to define this expression conceptually in theoretical ways, is to cover up the meaning of what the Greeks made self-evidently basic for the terminological use of aletheia as a pre-philosophical way of understanding it. Um, I guess... I guess that's... Well, okay, I mean, what he's sort of hinting at the fact that he's already... Uh, the, Okay, in the parts before, he goes through and gives you the privative definition of aletheia. Uh, so, aleth, so the idea here is something like, look, there was an original phenomenon that the Greeks had a sense for. Their sense for it was built right into the etymology of the original Greek words. The, these words have been translated over the course of millennia, and it's like a game of... Um, you know, of telephone or something. By the time they've come down to us, they mean something totally different uh, than what they meant when the Greeks, who were originally in touch with the phenomena, used the words to name. And Heidegger's got this idea that he's recovering the original, the original sense of the Greek. That's the base. That's the basic idea. And the original sense of the Greek involves truth as a matter of things coming out of hiddenness. And it's. I, I mean, I think I got. I think I got maybe overexcited, but at least very excited last week about this notion of um, assertion and truth, the, the ways in which these are related to notions of hiddenness for Heidegger. I think the thing I was most excited about last time was the idea that when you make an assertion about something, it not only shows the thing as it was, as it is in itself, it hides or covers up the way in which that thing was available to you when it was most itself. That was the thing that seemed so striking to me before. This is I. I think I can say a little bit more. Someone, I think Eric asked me why this why this is so exciting. I could say a little bit more about the context in which Heidegger thinks this is an exciting notion. Heidegger thinks that starting with the Greeks, starting with uh, Plato and Aristotle, but not before Plato and Aristotle, um, 
the notion of being, the notion of what it is for anything to be anything at all, was started to become tied up with the notion of things being present to you, or things being present, full stop. Uh, And Heidegger has an interpretation of the Greeks, according to which the classical Greeks, from Plato and Aristotle forth, according to which being is presence. Being is a matter of things being present before you, things being present to you. And Heidegger thinks that uh, the notion of being as presence is tied up with the notion that being is the kind of thing that can be characterized as an entity. If it's just, if for the table to be is for it to be present, if for the person to be is for them to be present, that's to say right there before you, uh, then being looks like just another property uh, that entities can have. They can have the property of, you know, wearing a white shirt, the property of sitting at the front of the class, and the property of being. That's another property that entities can have. And if you think of being that way, as a property that's definable, that you can give definite characteristics to, um, uh, that amounts to an entity's being present in a situation, then you've essentially thought of being as an entity, And that's exactly the thing that Heidegger wants to be against. And his way of being against it is to say that in the most basic cases, what it is for something to be is for it to be absent, not for it to be present. And I I think there's something sort of fascinating. And the way in which something can be absent one of the ways in which something can be absent is by its hiding itself from you or withdrawing from your notice rather than presenting itself to you uh, the way the color of the table does when you stare at it. In the tradition, if I want to know about the color of the table, then I've got to stare at it. I've got to get it in the most present form possible. Uh, And Heidegger wants to say, and in a certain sense Merleau-Ponty wants to say, look, what it really is for the table to have redness is for that redness to direct your activity with respect to the table, even and especially in those circumstances in which you're not noticing that it's the redness that's doing it. So this kind of hiddenness uh, or absence seems to me to be central to Heidegger's characterization of what it is for anything to be. And it's tied into his interpretation interpretation of truth as bringing out of hiddenness. Um, but the most basic sense of truth, he wants to say, has to do with the fact that we're the kinds of beings that can have it given to us that something is brought out of hiddenness. And we're that kind of being because in the most basic case, the way in which we're out among entities is by their withdrawing from us so that we can use them transparently and skillfully. So this notion of um, being as a kind of absence or being as a kind of withdrawal seems to me absolutely absolutely central to Heidegger. Um, I'll just say, I'm, I'm sort of hoping to sneak in something from this lecture. Maybe this is the right place to to do it. Uh, Heidegger, I think I've mentioned that Heidegger um, gets uh, a lot of this out of his uh, out of his readings of and engagements with well, he gets all of it really almost all of it, out of his readings of and engagements with uh, other philosophers, and in particular, the um, the philosopher who was super important for him during during the period leading up to being in time was Aristotle. There's sort of two philosophers who were super important. One was a late comer, I think. Um, the late comer was Kant. Uh, in the, during the ten years leading up to being in time, Heidegger was constantly giving lectures on Aristotle, and the lectures are slowly coming out through uh, transcripts. I, I used to think, my God, how could he... This, this, these are his lecture notes? If my lecture notes looked like this, I would be delighted. Uh, my lecture notes don't look like that. Uh, but they're not all his lecture notes. Some of these are student transcripts of his lectures, it turns out. So 
Now you have something to aspire to in note taking. <laughs> Uh, but anyhow, so so, uh, and I've been reading. This is one of the one of the lecture courses that's just been translated. The basic concepts of Aristotelian philosophy, and this is from 1924. And I'm, I've been reading it because it seems to me to give really good, often clearer characterizations of some of the phenomena that we've been struggling with in being in time. Um, one of the phenomena that seems to me, I won't revisit it, but I'll tell you so you can go look. Um, one of the phenomena that seems to me slightly, at least, um, at least better exemplified in here is the phenomenon of the force structure, which is talked about in quite a lot of detail. Um, but even more interestingly is the phenomenon of, of logos, uh, which is talked about in here in a lot of detail. And just to, I mean, I, I tried to say logos is a matter of pointing out that's what logos as apophansis means. Uh, but that's a little, it, it's a, that doesn't look like such a robust notion. Of course, it's at the, at the root of truth, avaletheia, as I've been trying to say. Um, but I'll just read you a paragraph where Heidegger is talking about, is talking about this. Um, this is supposedly one of, the, um, one of the lectures that Heidegger gave um, that, uh, that led Hannah Arendt to describe him as having been understood by the sort of German students of the day as this guy who was going around making these boring old dead texts come to life again. And he's making these boring old dead texts come to life again because on his view, at any rate, what he's trying to do is get at the original meanings of the Greek words that have been covered up by millennia and millennia of, um, of translations. And one of the words is, is logos, and he's trying to explain here what it means for when Aristotle says, taking up what earlier Greek philosophers have said, what it means to say that, um, uh, that uh, human beings are the zoon logon echon, or the animals having logos. Um, and he says... Um, well, uh, uh, well, I won't start there, but he says, well, we, we don't have a good way of saying what the Greeks really said there uh, when they said that human beings are the zoon logon echon. At best, an approximately corresponding definition would be the human being is a living thing that reads the newspaper, <laughs> which seems a little odd to me. <laughs> But what he's trying to get at is the idea that um, human beings for the Greeks living in the polis are, are human beings in virtue of the fact that they're brought into the discourse of the polis. They're brought into discourse with one another about the daily affairs of the polis and they get their identity out of the way they understand themselves in the context of these conversations that this is a sense in which language was hugely important for the Greeks. Um, and when the, at first this may say, sound strange to you, he says, but it's what corresponds to the Greek definition. When the Greeks say that the human being is a living thing that speaks, they don't mean in a physiological sense that he utters definite sounds or that he does the kind of thing that the computer could do when it prints out you know, random letters that happen to make up a sentence that corresponds to the way the weather is. Rather, the human being is a living thing that has its genuine being there, has its genuine Dasein, has its genuine existence in conversation and in discourse. The Greeks existed in discourse, and the orator is the one who has genuine power over their existence. The ability to discourse, he says, is that possibility in which I have genuine dominion over the persuasion of human beings in the way that they are with one another. So in this basic Greek claim, the ground for the definition of the human being is to, sought, is to be sought. And in addition, when the Greek reads, he also hears, and it's no accident that all the texts we have from Aristotle are lectures, the spoken word. This, this is meant to make sense of the claim that I made before. A large part of this lecture is about the rhetoric. This is meant to make sense of the claim that I made before, that Heidegger really thinks that the rhetoric, rather than the logic, is the central text in Aristotle. Because it's the one that explains, from Aristotle's point of view, 
what orators are doing when they're leading and guiding people in a certain kind of discourse. And it explains the various ways in which people can engage with, can resist, can stand against, or can be drawn along by the orator. And it's a phenomenological investigation, Heidegger thinks. It's the basic phenomenological investigation for the way of being of the Greek polis, he thinks, because that's what was central, that's what was central to their existence. And it's that notion of Logos that's supposed to be that he's supposed to be explaining when he talks about Dasein as a disclosive being that ultimately can uh, make assertions about the way things are. The kinds of assertions um, at stake are the kinds that, uh, that you find in rhetoric. Okay, I, I'm just excited about this <laughs> book because I'm, I'm, I've been reading it. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, Ayla, go ahead. Yeah. But to those who are lacking in understanding, what they do, what they do remains hidden. They forget it, right? Yes. And so I was thinking about this whole uncovering thing and like about Greeks. So I take Plato in mind. Yeah. And then it, I could map to his view, right? What this forgetting I might see. be. Oh, okay. What does it mean with the entities already there, right? Yeah. Certainly, it cannot be Heidegger's. Right. So can you, I mean, if it's not just passion, but if you can, you help me to, to see the same kind of structure that we see in Aristotle, in Plato, in Aristotle's case, how could that be? So in probably that would be much closer to what Heidegger thinks, right? Because one notion of forgetting <coughs> and being already there is like the theory of reminiscence, and yeah. Plato, it shouldn't be that, I suppose. That's right. I think, let me see, I haven't really thought about it, so I would have to do it on the fly. I think what Heidegger thinks is that it's not theorized, it's not theorized for Aristotle, but um, that's what Aristotle takes. That's what Aristotle ends up doing when he does philosophy in the right way. He's recovering from hiddenness the phenomena that are so close to us that um, we can't, we have trouble even noticing them. So, for example, so it's not as though Aristotle's got a theory that knowledge is a matter of bringing out of hiddenness, or, you know, or like Plato does. Knowledge is a matter of remembering what you already knew. It's not like Aristotle's got a, a theory like that. It's that Aristotle's method, especially, for instance, in the rhetor rhetoric, but maybe in lots of other cases, too, Aristotle's method is the method of laying out for the people who are already involved in um, an understanding of how one goes on in a certain situation, what it is they what it is they've mastered when they're doing it well. So, what the orator's mastered when he's uh, doing well, the practice of giving a great speech that people respond to and that people are drawn by and that people understand and are persuaded by. That's a speech that, if it's real rhetoric and not sophistry, is guided by the way things actually are rather than by an indifference to the way things actually are. The, um, well, whatever the, the, the master orator is doing, when he's doing that well, Heidegger thinks, that's what Aristotle's describing in the rhetoric. And that's, uh, right, and, so, and, and then he's, uh, Heidegger has an interpretation of what that description amounts to that makes the rhetoric look like you know nothing you ever thought the, the rhetoric was. The pathé aren't just emotions, they have to do with other things, and the piste aren't just beliefs, they have to do with other things, and so on. Yeah. But that's, but that's the kind, I think that's the kind, so it's not as though Heidegger thinks that Aristotle's got a theory like the theory that he's got. But he does think, I think, that one of the things that was great about Aristotle was that he was in touch with and had this kind of amazement at and this sort of wondering relation to the, um, the phenomena of everyday existence, including the phenomena of persuasive speech. 
That's, I think that's what he find, I think that's what he finds modeled well in. Well, no, even in the, well, right, but even in the physics and the metaphysics, maybe, maybe it's time now, maybe we'll skip the realism stuff, because... I don't see it properly in the ethics, for instance, in the figure of the Yeah, yes. I mean, that's poetic. Yeah, that's right. But it's hard for me to think about that in the metaphysics. Well, here's a, here's a place to think about it in the metaphysics. Um, uh, Heidegger says, maybe we'll move to the, to the first introduction. Um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll blurt it out, but I'll come to it again more clearly in a moment. So the, what's the metaphysics concerned with in Aristotle? The metaphysics is, among other things, well, most fundamentally probably, concerned with being. That's what the metaphysics is about, if it's about, it, if it's about anything unified. Um, and, uh, and Heidegger... Uh, Heidegger thinks, as we'll see when we read the passage, that one of the great attributes of Aristotle is that he could see that whatever else you were going to say about being, if it was a unified phenomenon, it was a, the unity was only a unity by analogy. So that there, it'll turn out there are actually different ways that things are in Aristotle, according to Heidegger's reading of Aristotle. And Heidegger was very influenced in this, uh, evidently, or so he claims, by, um, by Brentano. So Brentano, we think of Brentano as the guy who invented the theory of intentionality, and he's important for Husserl, he had some interaction with Frege, and so on. Um, but, but Heidegger apparently was given a book for his, I can't remember, 16th or 17th birthday, uh, a book by Brentano called The Several Ways of Being in Aristotle. Um, uh, and Heidegger claims, I forget, in his 80, you know, in the 85th birthday address or something like that, that this was enormously important for him. He didn't understand a word of it, but he thought, whatever this is talking about, this is what I need to get a, a sense for. And the basic, I, I've, I did try to read this book a long time ago, though. I, but what I remember of it is that the basic idea is this idea that Heidegger is referring to in the first introduction, that in Aristotle. If being is a unity at all, it's a unity only in virtue of the fact. It, it's a unity only by way of analogy. So if it's right to say that there's something in common uh, when you say that the tree is and when you say that the human being is, then if you're going to spell out that commonality or that unity at all, you can only do it by way of analogy because way, the way of being of a tree is different from the way of being of a, of a human being. And that's, that's okay, so now that's, a, that's supposed uh, on Heidegger's interpretation of it to be a view of being that's driven by the everyday way in which we, are, we find ourselves interacting with the practical entities of the, of, the, of the world, the entities that we take up and use or the entities that we interact with in our everyday, in our everyday discourse, in our everyday activity. Yes, the thing is that in the metaphysics he ends up like fundamenting everything in a just one kind of being. Maybe it's in the logic in, 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 where you find this uh, very diverse uh, ways of being more clear than Yeah, well, okay, we, we, we would have to do Aristotle, Aristotle stuff in order to figure it out. And it, it is an interesting question, it's always an interesting question, how much Heidegger's reading of these philosophers is really a dedicated reading of them uh, that's, um, how should we say, uh, accurate. <laughs> And, and how much, you know, it's Heidegger sort of getting something out of them that, that's, you know, that he makes important things out of and that's interesting for that reason. Heidegger thinks that reading the history of philosophy is a special kind of skill um, that involves not just, um, well, that involves interpretation, but interpretation in the way that he understands interpretation. And as he says at a certain point, um, uh, you know, any reading of the history of, of philosophy or of a text in the history of philosophy that's worth anything um, has, you know, part of its contribution made by the text and part of its contribution made by the interpreter of the text. And that's what an outside and Zetsung is. That's what a confrontation, this kind of confrontation between thinkers is. And if you're not doing that, you're not really thinking in any interesting way. You're doing mere scholarship or something. Yeah. 
Okay, but maybe it's time then to go to the, to the first introduction because the first introduction tells us, um, and I should say, I think that's part of what, that's part of what um, Arendt is responding to when she reports that the students were really finding exciting things in these dead texts. That's part of what, you know, the, the, the phenomenon was. Okay. So, I want to start right at the beginning on page, whatever, these pages are not numbered. So, 16, 17, 18, page 19, the opening little, it's almost an epigraph. Um, because I think this gives some indication of what Heidegger's conception of philosophy really is. So we have this passage from the Sophist, um, which, uh, which Heidegger nicely translates for us, except one always wants to know what the other, shall we say, standard translation is. Um, <laughs> so you remember the Sophist. The Sophist is a dialogue. Theotetus is involved, I think Socrates is involved, and the Eleatic visitor, this, visit, this philosopher from Elia, is involved. And it's the Eleatic visitor who says the thing that Heidegger um, quotes at the very top. He's talking with Theotetus, who's shown a certain kind of interest in a variety of aporiae, and a variety of sort of philosophical paradoxes. And uh, They've gotten to a certain point where they're imagining a discussion between some people, and Theotetus is saying, well, surely the person would say this, and the Eleatic visitor says, well, if that's, what we're, if that's the point we're, we're going to get to, then um, clarify this for us, since we're confused about it. This is, um, this is the Eleatic visitor, though it's a typical Socratic trope. Um, uh, and what we're confused about is, what do you want to signify when you say being? You've made this claim now, it's supposed to solve all these weird paradoxes, but I'm just confused about it. it the, the claim involves saying that something is, and what do you want to signify when you say being? Obviously, you've known for a long time, and we thought we did, but now we're confused about it. So first, teach it to us, so we won't think we understand what you're saying when just the contrary is the case. So this typical kind of... Socratic humility, I guess, um, is involved. And that's the passage that Heidegger quotes. Of course, he's interested in it. You, one reads it, and one thinks, oh, well, he's interested in it because it's about being, and that's part of it. He says, for manifestly you've, been, you've long been aware of what you mean when you use the expression being. We, however, who used to think we understood it, have now become perplexed. So I think part of Part of what Heidegger is interested in is that, you know, this is a discussion about being. But really, I think, what he's interested in is the idea that the philosopher is the one who becomes perplexed about things. And um, the Eleatic visitor... Uh, oh, no, sorry, that's a different place. So the philosopher is the one who becomes perplexed about things. Sometimes perplexed about things that nobody else would even think to be perplexed about. I mean, you know this is a, a professional um, you know, pro, you know, concern <laughs> for philosophers. I mean, you try to explain what it is you've been so worried about to your mom or your dad, and, you know, and they think you're, you're spending your time doing what? <laughs> what on earth are you thinking? But, but that's what the philosopher on Heidegger's account, uh, that's what characterizes the philosopher, and that's what characterizes real thinking, Heidegger thinks, is the ability to become perplexed and stand in amazement and wonder at the things that other people think are banal and uninteresting, and to show why actually they're not so banal and uninteresting. They're actually very difficult to get a handle on, and it's very difficult to understand what one ought to say about them. So Heidegger says, do we in our time have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being? I remember Heidegger's writing in the 20s now, there are lots of schools of philosophical thought in Germany, the Neo-Kantian school, you've got a kind of, a remnant, re, a remnants of a kind of scholastic um, uh, kind of tradition in, in philosophy, you've got uh, various other kinds of schools of philosophical thought, 
Um, and he's suggesting that, uh, that uh, we don't have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being. Not at all, he says. And uh, so, it's fitting that we should raise anew the question of the meaning of being. But are we nowadays even perplexed at our inability to understand the expression being? And Heidegger says, uh, no. We're, we've lost even this attitude of perplexity, even this attitude of wonder that Theotetus uh, was able to have in talking about the question with the Eleatic visitor. So the first project here, and I think this is sort of what Heidegger was doing when he gave his er lectures in the early 20s, the first project here is to reawaken an understanding for the meaning of this question. And I take it that means for the meaning and the genuine perplexity of it. Why is this a question that we need to be worried about? Why is this a question that we should stand in amazement and wonder at? What is it about this question that ought to draw us into it? And, uh, and I think the, the sort of the first project of the book here is the project of recognizing that in a certain way, although there's lots of philosophy going on, there isn't anymore the kind of perplexity and wonder, which is the word that typically goes along with it. There isn't a the kind of perplexity and wonder that characterizes genuine the genuine philosophical stance, at least has characterized it um, since, the, since the Greeks. Of course, this, um, this notion that wonder is what stands at the beginning of philosophy also comes from Plato. And um, I think there's a place that Heidegger attributes it to Plato. I couldn't actually find the place. It's not, not in here. Um, but the classical citation for this idea that philosophy begins in wonder is from the Theotetus. So, uh, and it, it's in, it's, Theotetus again is getting described as the character who's got the right kind of philosophical uh, mood. Um, he's getting described that way by Socrates. Uh, and I'll just read a short passage here to give you the sense for what Heidegger thinks he needs to reawaken and revivify in his readers when proposing that he think about the question of being. So Socrates in the Theotetus is talking with Theotetus, and he says, I dare say you do, my dear boy. It seems that Theodorus was not far from the truth when he guessed what kind of person you are. For this is an experience, so, I mean, Theotetus has just said, I often wonder like mad what all these things can mean. It really drives me crazy. I can't, I can't get out of it. I'm, and when I'm looking at them, he says, I begin to feel quite giddy. Socrates says, I dare say you do, my dear boy. Theodorus uh, was, was pretty close to the mark when he guessed what kind of person you are. For this is an experience which is characteristic of a philosopher, this kind of wondering. This is where philosophy begins and nowhere else. And there's, so philosophy begins in wonder. That's the, the big thing. And there's a standard story that one hears uh, that Heidegger is going to be very much against. A story that talks about the development of philosophy and the relation between philosophy and science. It says, yet philosophy is that kind, of, that kind of curiosity that gives rise to scientific method. Because scientific method is what allows you to figure out what the proper answers to the things that you were curious about are. And I think Heidegger is going to be against that way of thinking about what this canonical philosophical mood of wonder, which is thaumadzein in the Greek, sort of standing in amazement before something. Um, I, I think Heidegger's going to be against the idea that you could reduce this kind of philosophical wonder to anything like a curiosity that some scientific method could give a determinate satisfaction to. So, um, I think, let me see, I think Heidegger's view is something like, you're not really in the philosophical mood unless your perplexity and wonder takes a form that couldn't be satisfied by something that wasn't, um, that didn't have, let me see how I said it. Um, yeah, 
So wonder is a mood in which one is struck and amazed by something, not necessarily a mood in which one wants to reduce the thing you're struck and amazed by to elements one is no longer struck and amazed by. I mean, you want to you want to give an explanation, but the explanation might not. I think Heidegger thinks it won't be a kind of naturalistic explanation that reduces the thing that you were standing in wonder to to something that you, you can't stand in any wonder with respect to at all. I think he thinks that if you haven't got this mood of being perplexed by the most basic kinds of questions, uh, then, you haven't, then you haven't got the philosophical mindset. So that's why he wants to reawaken this kind of perplexity, as he says on that page. Um, and he wants to reawaken it, he says, because he thinks the question has been forgotten. He says that on the first, in the first sentence of the next page, so the first sentence of the introduction proper, the necessity for explicitly restating the question of being, this question has today been forgotten. And of course, forgotten means something like it's been covered up or hidden. It's the kind of thing that doesn't strike us in any way whatsoever anymore. And the phenomenological method is going to be the method of bringing out of this forgottenness and bringing out of this kind of hiddenness a genuine question that we can stand in wonder and be, uh, with respect to and be amazed by. And he thinks it's been forgotten precisely because... Um, precisely because the question of being has been trivialized by the philosophical tradition. I take it that's what he says at the end of that first paragraph. Um, all these people in the philosophical tradition um, have, uh, um, have, you know, th this question of the meaning of, of being has provided a stimulus for philosophers from Plato and Aristotle on all the way down to Hegel. And what they rested with the utmost intellectual effort from the phenomena, fragmentary and incipient though it was, has long since been trivialized. That's to say, he thinks, in the contemporary readings of, that's to say, readings from Germany in the 1920s, of these philosophical figures, Aristotle and Plato and Hegel and Kant and the other great philosophers, the readings that are being given of these folks have trivialized their characterization of the question of being. And they've trivialized it, uh, and to the extent that they've trivialized it, the question itself, that's to say, the philosophical mood of wonder in which one asks the question and is deeply perplexed by it, has been lost also. So he's going to give us some story about what these trivialized uh, and trivializing readings look like. And he's going to tell us why, in this first uh, substantive introduction, these readings of the question of being um, co both cover up the phenomenon and yet at the same time are related to the original version of the phenomenon that he's going to recover. So he's going to try to take back from these trivializing readings what made them really fundamentally interesting in the first place and what the, what the grain of truth in them really was so that he can set up the question of being the way that, the way that he wants to. So uh, I'll, I'll just go through the three of them. There, there are these three uh, things that have traditionally been said about being that Heidegger thinks are the way they've been appropriated in the early 20th century in Germany have become trivialized conceptions of what the question really is so trivialized that they really lead you to forget the kind of wonder and amazement that generated the question. And then he's going to tell you what element of truth there is in each of these readings, such that you can set up the question so that you've got the right mood of wonder in the first place. And since we sort of know what answer he's heading towards, because we've read the first division, we can 
stand in the right mood once we see his description of how to recover and appropriate these, these questions and the traditional ways of conceiving of being. And that's the way Heidegger thinks you have to do it. Remember, Heidegger thinks that any time you approach any question, you've got to approach it with a kind of fore structure, with a sense for where the, question, where the answer to the question is headed. And we've, we've got that now. And it's only in virtue of the fact that we've got that now that we can understand what he's going to say in, the, in these, uh, what he's going to try to recover from these traditional characterizations of the question of being. Okay, so how does it go? Well, so um, the first thing, the first traditional characterization of the question of being says that being is the most universal concept. If you track down the, so this is now I'm on page 22 in number one, <coughs> and if you track down the, uh, if you if you track down the footnote, I thought it said it's, I thought it said it's. I see, it's Aristotle. Yeah. It's Aristotle. I think it's Aristotle as he's been appropriated by um, Aquinas. So, <coughs> uh, first, Heidegger says, it's been maintained that being is the most universal concept. Heidegger wants to say, uh, there's a way in which this is true, and a way in which... The truth of it has been covered up by the way the tradition has appropriated what Aristotle had to say. So how did the tradition appropriate what Aristotle had to say? Again, this is a claim about the history of philosophy that I'm not um, uh, sufficiently scholarly to, to assess. But let, let's, let's, just, let's just take it for what it is, Heidegger's reading of the history of philosophy. Here's what he says Aquinas did to Aristotle. Heidegger says, um, Aristotle tells us that an understanding of being is already included in conceiving anything which one apprehends in entities. That means, Aquinas tells us, that being is the most universal concept. And how does, I guess it's Aquinas, tell us what it is for um, for being to be the most universal concept. Well, he does it in the context of the genus-species relation. He says, uh, well, look, we've got this, uh, this way of grouping things such that we get all the, the red ones together. And uh, we've got all the red ones together. Those are all the ones that share redness. And it's this table, and it's Ben's jacket, and the inside of Eric's coat, and so on. It's, okay, we've got all the red ones. Then we make a broader category, and it's the ones that, uh, let's say, um, have uh, either redness or blackness associated with it. Now we've got the chairs, and then we broaden, and we've got uh, anything that uh, counts as, uh, let's see, a human being or a material entity. And then we've got just plain old thing, entities that... So we get... I mean, you have to go up this... I'm not doing it very well. But you go through, you go through um, human beings, then you go through animals, then you go through material things all together. And finally, you get at the biggest genus, the biggest way of categorizing things. That's the way that categorizes them according to their having only be. It's the most universal concept, the one that applies to everything that is. And so it's a concept like any of the other concepts. It's a concept like redness, or animality, or chairness, or thingness. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a concept that applies to everything. Um, and Heidegger says, well, uh, it can't be that being is the most universal in the sense of genus and species. Since the way, if you just pay attention to the way things are, you'll recognize that the way in which things are is multifarious. The way in which things are is different depending upon which thing you're talking about. So the mode of being of a chair, he says, just look at the, just look at the, way, the phenomena. The way in which a chair is is different from the way in which a Dasein is. And the way in which a Dasein is, is, the, is different from the way in which a hammer is, and so on and so forth. And he thinks that Aristotle already understood this, although it got covered up by the appropriation of Aristotle when you tried to get um, 
when you try to get Aristotle um, sort of tied in with the uh, uh, with the genus species account. So he says. Um, so he says in the middle of 22, the universality of being transcends or goes beyond any universality of genus. In medieval ontology, being is designated as a transcendence, uh, and that's supposed to get at something, but they don't really have anything for it to get at, because the only way in which they think things can be is by being present. Um, so uh, Aristotle himself knew the unity of this transcendental universal as a unity of analogy. Um, I say it says in the face of instead of in contrast to, but someone can check that in the German. Um, in the face of the multiplicity of the highest generic concepts applicable to things. Uh, Okay, so and with this discovery, in spite of his dependence on the way in which the ontological question had been formulated by Plato, who thinks there's a genuine unity to being that's found in the, say, the unity of the, of the form of the good. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, in, spite of the, in spite of his dependence on the way in which the ontological question had been formulated by Plato, he put the problem of being on what was, in principle, a new basis. Of course, even Aristotle didn't really understand it in it's proper detail, he says, but now we're going we're gonna to recover the thing that's supposed to be true. The thing that's supposed to be true uh, when you say that being is the most universal concept. So at the top of 23, at the end of this first section, he says, so if it is said that being is the most universal concept, sorry, as opposed to? Uh, in... Yeah. Like we should understand the generality of um, generality and universality of being as it is the generality of a genus, species. Yeah. So in a sense, that's what he's rejecting. That right? is what he's rejecting, so, yeah. Because even there, there's, a, there's an, a way of taking account of multiplicity, right? Even in the, when we talk about genus, but it's not, it's not the way to do it, but you should rather use the I see what unity you of... Uh, of analogy. analogy. Yeah, okay, good. Because uh, I see, oh, I see what you mean. I understand. Good, 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 good. So I understand. Okay, so, in con so there's a way in which you could think that the highest generic concepts applicable to things have a kind of multiplicity built into them, but that's not the way to do it. You need this, you need this unity that you get only by way of analogy rather than one that categorizes them all under the same genus. Okay, good. So you... At any rate, the important thing is that we've got, this, we've got this multiplicity. Heidegger wants to hold on to the multiplicity in some form. And so if it's said that being is the most universal concept, this cannot mean that it's the one which is clearest or that it needs no further discussion. In fact, it's ra instead the darkest of all. That's what he wants to get out of it. He wants to say, look, if it's true that being is... The cons insofar as it's true that being is the concept that applies to everything, then there's, uh, far from its being the case that we already understand it in its clearest detail, the way he wants to think about it, and now you have to use your four structure, the fact that you can sort of look ahead to what he's going to say. He's going to say, the way to think about it instead is that being is what you've already got this familiarity with, this understanding of, uh, and it's the closest thing to you, but precisely because it's the closest thing to you, it's the farthest thing from being self-evident. Instead, it's completely hidden from you, it's the darkest of all. Okay. So that's, that's the sense in which he wants to retrieve from this traditional claim that being is the most universal concept, a sense in which that's right that doesn't trivialize the, the question of the meaning of being. It doesn't trivialize the question, what does it mean for anything to be? So that's the first, that's the first one. And how could you possibly understand that if you hadn't read the whole first division? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's rather the darkest of all. You must just, if you're reading this from the start, just skip over that sentence. Because it can't possibly mean anything to you unless you've got in mind this phenomenon that, uh, that's at the center of division one, which is the phenomenon according to which 
the way in which things are is by withdrawing from you rather than by, present, rather than, um, by presenting themselves to you. And when they withdraw from you, they're hidden. And that's what makes them the darkest of all. And being, insofar as it's the thing we're most familiar with, because it's the most universal, has got to be the thing that withdraws the most. That's the, that's the structure of it. And, uh, okay. So that's what he wants to retrieve from this traditional thing one says about being. Here's another traditional thing one says about being. Evidently, this is what Pascal said about being. Um, that the concept of being is indefinable. And this is supposedly deduced from its supreme uh, universality. Okay. So, um, the concept of being is indefinable. I don't quite understand how this traditional uh, version of the argument goes, but you can imagine something, something like this. You can't give a definition of being, since being is the most universal thing, and in order to give a definition of it, you'd have to make use of some other resources, but the only resources you've got available to you are the resources that are already got being tied into them, since it's the most universal thing, so definitions don't work. Yeah? I thought it was simply like, if I say for example, if you want to give a Definition of bachelor. Yeah. You say married man. Yeah. You use two concepts, married and man, which are more general than bachelor. Yeah. Right? Good. But good. being is the most general That's the version. concept. Yeah. Then there is nothing you can do in the definition parts. Good. Because in definition, what you use as a concept has to be more general. Good. Than the much better said than I said it. Yeah, right. That's, that's, the, that's the intuition I have, but you've said it much better. Yeah, exactly. So if insofar as a definition always goes by means of something more general than the thing being defined, if uh, being is the most general concept, then you can't ever give a definition of it. Okay. Sounds like a thing that a metaphysician might say. Um, okay. So, and what, what does Heidegger want to say about that? Well, he wants to say, yeah, there's a sense in which it's true that uh, you can't give a definition of being. Uh, but A, that doesn't mean that there's no problem left. We ought to be perplexed. And our perplexity ought to lead us to think uh, that there might be some notion of being according to which um, the way you characterize it isn't by giving a definition of it. And this leads Heidegger to say, well, how do you think about the things that you give a definition of? Well, the standard way of thinking about the things you give a definition of is by thinking of that, that as determinate entities that you want to be able to categorize. Uh, and we can give definitions of determinate entities insofar as they're determinate and they sit inside some category. Uh, but Heidegger wants to say, and again, you couldn't possibly understand this if you hadn't already read the whole, the whole first division. Heidegger wants to say, look, it's true that you can't give a definition of being, but that's not because it's the most universal concept. Uh, it's some determin that's in particular not because it's some determinate entity that's the most general entity and there's no more general concept that you can use to define it. Rather, it's because being isn't an entity at all. And I take it this is the first formulation of what, of what gets called the ontological difference. There's a difference between being and entities and the traditional categories that we've got for characterizing entities don't work for being. Being is instead a kind of familiarity. It's tied up with the understanding that we have of ourselves and the world that we find ourselves already thrown into. Uh, and insofar as you don't think of being as an entity, it's true that you can't give a definition of it, but it's not for the reasons that the traditional metaphysicians have thought at all. So I take it that's what he's saying here. It's been maintained, secondly, that the concept of being is indefinable, and this is deduced from its supreme universality, and rightly <laughs> so. Um, but being, uh, indeed, uh, cannot be conceived as an entity, nor can it acquire such a character as to have the term entity applied to it, 
Being cannot be derived from higher concepts by definition, nor can it be presented through lower ones. All that's true, but this doesn't imply that being no longer offers a problem. We can infer only that being cannot have the character of an entity, which is what he wants to take out of it. <laughs> Thus, and then now there's a real problem. Well, what does it mean to say there can be something that's not an entity? Uh, Thus, uh, we cannot apply the, uh, to being the concept of definition as presented in traditional logic, which itself has its foundations in ancient ontology and which within certain limits provides a justifiable way of characterizing entities. The indefinability of being doesn't eliminate the question of its, being, of its meaning. It demands that we look that question in the face. And we're going to look it in the face by starting from the assumption that whatever being is, it's not an entity. And that's going to be an assumption that um, in the history of philosophy, people haven't been able to hold on to in the right way. Okay. So, um, so there's the second traditional characterization of being uh, as indefinable that's got a grain of truth in it, but that leads in the direction that Heidegger wants to develop the question. And then finally, um, the third one is that being is a self-evident concept. <laughs> I guess I'm not quite sure who, where he, who he attributes this to. Maybe to Kant. He says something about Kant, although um, it's not an aspect of Kant that um, that I recognize. Uh, but so, but here's the issue. You can imagine someone saying that uh, it's held that being is of all concepts the one that is self-evident. I guess the intuition is something like being gets its primary focus in the use of the copula. Maybe it's someone like Leibniz who says this. I don't know. Being gets its primary use in the, uh, in the, in the context of the copula. The sky is blue. Uh, what are his other examples? I am Mary and the like. And since we understand sentences like this, uh, it must be self-evident what it is for things to be. Because... Those are the simplest kinds of sentences to understand. And we all understand them already. So um, whatever being, whatever the meaning of being is, it must be self-evident. And so we don't need to worry about it. We shouldn't be perplexed. We shouldn't stand in wonder. The expression is held to be intelligible without further ado. Okay. So... What does Heidegger want to say? He wants to say, well, in one sense, that's right, and in another very important sense, it's not right. Um, it's true that we all have an understanding of being. We couldn't be the kinds of beings that we are unless we have an understanding of being. And yet... Uh, the understanding of being that we've got that allows us to understand these sentences like the sky is blue and I am Mary. Not the person Mary. I am, you know, happy. Um, the, the understanding of being that we've got that allows us to understand these kinds of sentences, Heidegger wants to say, is what he'll call a vague, average intelligibility, which merely... Uh, which merely demonstrates that this is unintelligible. We ought to be totally perplexed at the idea that we're able to understand these kinds of sentences in their normal context at all. It makes manifest that in any way, now I'm reading on 23 and number 3, that in any way of comporting oneself towards entities as entities, even in any being towards entities as entities, there lies a priori an enigma. A puzzle, something we've got to wonder about, be perplexed by. The very fact that we already live in an understanding of being and the meaning of being is still veiled in darkness proves that it's necessary in principle to raise the question again. So he's got, so he's got, so he's a added something important here. We've got the idea that there's a manifold, uh, there's a manifold of ways that things are. We've got that the, um, the understanding of being is indefinable, and that shows that... Uh, so there's a manifold, there's a multi, a manifold number of ways... There are manifold ways that things are. That means that being is the darkest of all. Um, we've got being being un indefinable. That means it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not an entity. 
And then we've got being, um, being self-evident. That means although it's the darkest thing of all, and although it's indefinable, nevertheless, we understand it. Nevertheless, we understand it. But we understand it only in this vague and average way that ought to give rise to the question, what is it that we understand that allows us to go on in our everyday affairs? And, that's, and of course, the answer is supposed to be that what we've got is this familiarity, this, um, this background understanding of being for how to go on in circumstances, in various situations. That background understanding of being is uh, something that we get in the vague and average case from our having been brought up in the norms of Dasman and the norms for how one goes on in various circumstances. This vague, average intelligibility is what uh, articulates the referential context of significance. It's what makes it possible for anything to be intelligible to us as anything at all. And yet, now there's got to be this, this question, how on earth can that be something that we've got an understanding of uh, if the understanding that we've got doesn't go by way of a definition, the thing that we understand isn't an entity, and the understanding that we have of it is the darkest, is the darkest and most, most hidden from us of all. That's the... Okay. That, that's what he wants to retrieve from the third, um, from the third claim, that being is self-evident. So you can see that he's, he's heading you in the direction, if you already understand where he's going, he's heading you in the direction of the idea that being is going to be the understanding of being that we've got by way of having been brought up and enculturated into a set of norms for how one goes on in, in various situations and various circumstances, that this understanding of being is going to be both the closest to us in the sense that we all understand it and it's, um, it's the most familiar thing and the farthest of way, away from us in the sense that you can't really get clear about it, you can never get behind it, even noticing that you've got it is very difficult. Um, and, so, and he's heading us in the direction of the idea that the question of the meaning of being ought to be perplexing because it's got all this weird combination of factors. And since we know how those factors are going to be resolved, or more or less resolved, um, we, we can sort of keep in mind what he's, what he's heading us towards. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, the, those are the, that's the thing to say about section one. Um, well, we're, we're, yeah, I talked a lot. <laughs> uh, but that, okay, so that's the thing to say about section one. I think... Um, I will move. I will try to move on to the the methodological introduction, the discussion of phenomenology uh, on Thursday. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm I'm kind I'm kind of excited this today. So I'm glad that we're going to podcast it. Who knows? Maybe it will be a disaster. I'm excited partly because there was a very quiet period of time in our house between 2.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. Finally, stillness. And so I took the opportunity to read some of the lectures around this period uh, and, and I found amazing things. I mean, I had evidently read these lectures before. At least they were filled with my little scribblings. But I didn't, hadn't noticed any of the things that I noticed this time. And, uh, and so I recommend 2.30 to 4.30 if you're looking for study time. Uh, the first thing I noticed that's kind of, that, that's kind of interesting, I'll just put it, uh, I'll just read this. Uh, I've been telling you that it's really important that we not read the introductions first, that we really have to get through the whole, um, uh, you know, at least Division One before we read the introductions because they won't make any sense at all uh, until, you've, uh, um, until you've read a good chunk of what he's up to. And I've been trying to say that that's related to Heidegger's understanding of what um, it is to be involved in a phenomenological project, which he is, this phenomenological project of giving an account of the meaning of being, and I've been trying to say that the reason um, his account of um, the phenomenological project of laying out the meaning of being requires that you read the interpretations 
after you read the rest of the stuff, the introductions after you read the rest of the stuff, has to do with the idea that when you're involved in the project, you're guided by this force structure. Uh, but the way the force structure works is it, gui it guides you in making choices about what to say, but it doesn't give you the kind of clarity about what the guy uh, about what the principles are in virtue of which you're being guided and it's only after you've done the whole thing that you have the ability to reflect and write about what those principles were which is what you typically do in the introduction so i've said that's that's why you you should read the introduction to being in time after you read um, after you, you read being in time well i was heartened at about I don't know, 3.15 this morning, to discover that in Heidegger's lecture on Kant, the Phenomenological Interpretation of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which is a lecture he gave in the winter semester 1927-28, so just after um, Being in Time had been published, Heidegger says right at the beginning, he says, okay, so we're going to read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, um, when we begin to familiarize ourselves with the text, the first things that we come... And that's how you start off. You familiarize yourself with the text. You see what's in there. The first things that we come across are the prefaces and introductions of both editions, A and B. But it is characteristic of genuine prefaces and introductions that they're written after the work has been completed and in retrospect provide an anticipatory view of the work. These prefaces and introductions will really be understood only from out of the understanding of the work as a whole. Accordingly, our interpretation will not start with the preface and introduction. I, I was just, I stood up and cheered. I couldn't believe that he understood so clearly what it seemed he had to understand and, and, and that he'd used this very method when he was teaching the, the critique of pure reason that we're using when we're teaching him. It seemed just beautiful. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I didn't wake anyone in my, in my cheering. Uh, so, uh, and I think that's the way. I think that's the way it has to work, and it has to work that way because of what it is to be involved in this kind of phenomenological project. To be involved in this kind of phenomenological project, as I say, or really, he thinks to be involved in any properly philosophical project is to have a kind of mood that puts you in the right relation to the entities that you're trying to, um, to think about or to the problems, the deep philosophical problems that you're trying to think about. That, um, that's, the mood, that's this mood of, well, some mood. For the pre-Socratics, it was the mood of wonder. Uh, and it's supposed, to, it's supposed to draw you on in making choices about what you, what you say about the domain. Uh, but it's supposed to draw you on in such a way that it couldn't possibly be clear to you what the principles are in virtue of which you're, you're being drawn on. And because of this, because that's the way it is to be involved in real philosophical work, it's going to turn out, um, Heidegger ought to think, it's going to turn out that the person who's involved in the project can't really write about the principles of the project until after they've done the project, so they can't write the introduction and the prefaces until after the project's completely done. And furthermore, even then, they're probably not going to be the best kind of people to get clear about what the project was really about. Uh, and it's only going to be uh, from the point of view afterwards that people can get clear on what this interpretive force structure was that was guiding you to make the to make the various choices that you that you did. Now that seems like that seems like a weird kind of interpretive principle because it seems to license moves that um, that that seem on the surface almost crazy. I mean, I, 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 and I wouldn't believe that this is a, a reasonable interpretive principle if it weren't for the fact that once, may, maybe it's starting to happen, maybe I'm starting to understand Heidegger now, but th there was one time when I really felt like I understood something about, about Merleau-Ponty, and when I finally felt like I got what was really motivating him to make the choices that he did. I was so excited that I went through the text looking for all the places that confirmed that this is really what he was up to. 
And I found that some of the time he got it, and some of the time he didn't. And I was devastated. I thought, my God, I, I, must, have, I must have gotten it wrong. And I, I, this was about ten years ago, and I called up, I called up my, old, my mentor, who, Bert Dreyfus, and I said, it's, it's a disaster. I said, I finally got this interpretation, and it, it's, it's got to be what, he, what Merleau-Ponty really thinks. It's got to be what's really motivating him. And yet, he just, he just doesn't manage to say it right. In fact, sometimes he says just the opposite of what he ought to say. And, and Bert said, well, that's just exactly what you would expect. If you get really what's motivating him, then it's the thing that he can't be clear about. And so he's going to get it right some of the time, but quite a lot of the time he's going to be confused about it, and so he's going to go wrong. And that really shows that, you know, if you've, if you've got a, a position like that, that really shows that you've got to the bottom of things. That sort of sounds crazy. I mean, it sounded crazy to me, because it suggests that if you're going to think about... Um, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about a, th- a thinker who's working in a sufficiently interesting and rich domain, then what you've, what you've got to, then what's, what's likely to happen is that if you get the right kind of understanding of the domain he's working in, or she's working in, then you're going to be guided by the domain and by their take on the domain. And that's going to allow you to understand better what they were up to than they did themselves. That seems sort of crazy, right? Because it means that if you're going to give an interpretation of, of what a philosopher's up to, you're probably not going to do things like um, go to all those letters they wrote to their friends where they were explaining what they were up to. Because those letters aren't going to have... Or, uh, or the various places where they were explaining what they were up to. Because those... those sort of places are going to be interpretations that they give of their own work, which are going to be neither here nor there uh, with respect to what the work actually is. There's what the work actually is, and there's what the thinker thinks the work actually is, and you might actually be in a better position to say what the work actually is than the thinker, than the thinker himself. I, like I said, that sounds sort of crazy. And I wouldn't have believed it was a reasonable interpretive principle if it weren't for the fact that this, in this one case, it seemed absolutely right to me. It seemed to me that finally I had gotten something that, Merle, that was really motivating Merleau-Ponty that, um, that he didn't understand about himself. Well, it turns out that's really what Heidegger thinks one's doing when one is interpreting someone else, a, a, a sufficiently deep and interesting philosopher, for instance. And furthermore, he thinks it's what um, one's really doing when one's engaging pr- uh, primarily with any sufficiently deep and interesting philosophical domain. And it's not just that he thi- Heidegger thinks this. He thinks that Kant thinks this. And so in his interpretation of Kant, he starts off um, with, these, with these various places where Kant is saying, th- amazingly, you couldn't have believed that Kant could think that, uh, that the thinker might not be the person who's got the best, clearest understanding of what that thinker is up to. But he, 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 um, he uh, finds these passages not from the first critique, but from other places. And I'll just read you one or two of them, because um, I think they're pretty amazing. So, um, let me just see where, I think it's, let me just see where it is here. Aha, right. Um, so he says, uh, he, quoting Kant now, um, what's that? No, he's actually here. He's quoting from the first critique. I misremembered. That's what happens when you read at three in the morning. Um, so he says, quoting from the first critique, but places far into the first critique that I don't recognize. Um, he says, when someone's, Kant says, when someone's developing a science, which is a pure philosophical inquiry, uh, a way of coming to know something sufficiently interesting, he says, since sciences are devised from the point of view of a certain universal interest, we must not explain and determine them according to the description which their founder gives of them. 
but in conformity with the idea which, out of the natural unity of the parts we've assembled, we find to be grounding in reason itself. In other words, it doesn't matter what the founder of the discipline says is characteristic of the discipline. What matters is what the domain says, what the things say. And if, you, if the founder allows you to get properly sensitized to what the domain is, then you might well understand what they're up to better than they do. Kant continues in the first critique, for we shall then find that its founder, and often even his most recent successors, are groping around for an idea which they've never succeeded in making clear to themselves, and consequently, they've not been able to determine the proper content, articulation, systematic unity, and limits of the science. And then at a different place, um, he says in, in the first critique, I need only, Kant says, I need only remark that it is by no means unusual upon comparing the thoughts which an author has expressed with regard to his subject, whether in ordinary conversation or in writing, it's by no means unusual to find that we understand him better than he understood himself, in that he's not sufficiently determined his concept, and therefore has sometimes spoken, or even thought, in opposition to his own intention. That was the thing that it seemed to me that I managed on this one occasion to get out of Merleau-Ponty, uh, but Heidegger really thinks that he manages to get out of his readings of um, Aristotle, of, of Plato's sophist, and the Philebus, of the pre-Socratics, of Kant, and so on. So that the kind of, um, the kind of, he says at another point, I didn't bring this, so that the kind of interpretation and engagement with the history of philosophy that you get is one that's um, sort of co-constituted by the thinker that you're commenting on and by the person who's doing the commenting. That's what Heidegger calls, I think, an Auseinandersetzung. And it's a way in which both the thinker and the thinker's interpreter come together in the middle uh, to, to generate an understanding or to uncover, I guess is a better way of thinking it, um, an understanding that you couldn't have without either the one or the, or the other. Okay, so that's, I say that because um, it seems to justify the pedagogical choice we made to read the introductions later, um, but also because it seems to exemplify the account of what phenomenology is, which is what we're supposed to talk about today in the methodological introduction, um, it's about, it seems to justify the account of what phenomenology is, and uh, it's supposed to um, sort of remind you of what Heidegger thinks uh, the, the basic nature of truth as aletheia is, truth as this kind of unhiddenness. And I'm going to, that, that's what I want to try to spell out today. I'm going to try to spell out those connections. Um, uh, let me just see. Oh yeah, um, in, in the in the in that context. So just to set it up one one more time, in that context, I, I found myself saying yeah uh, last time, uh, commenting on these passages from Aristotle about the way in which the mood of wonder is is um, uh, it's some way definitively related to philosophy, I, I found myself saying something that made me a little uncomfortable and a little nervous. I think what I said, at least what, what the, way, the form it took in my notes and the way I remember having said it was that um, uh, if you're really genuinely motivated by this mood of wonder for particular kinds of philosophical problems, and Heidegger thinks there's a range of basic philosophical problems that are at the center of philosophy, and the question of being is the, is the, is the most basic one. If it's really this mood of wonder that's motivating you, then the treatment that you give of the domain, the treatment you give, for instance, of the domain of being, what it is for something to be, requires that you not reduce what you're amazed by and wondering about to elements that you're no longer amazed by and wondering about. And I think that Heidegger thinks, I, so that's what I said last time. Um, I felt a little concerned about it. I was, I was thinking, 
of uh, sort of Heidegger's relation in the 20s and early 30s to sort of positivistic neo-Kantianism uh, and uh, in a certain way sort of his, his relationship insofar as there was one to the kind of logical positivism of the, of the day which really attempts to um, generate a, uh, sort of in some way or another reductive accounts of difficult problems, either difficult philosophical problems, accounts that reduce those problems to elements that are that you can be completely clear and completely certain about. Uh, and I think Heidegger thinks if you've done that, then it guarantees that you've gone off in the wrong direction some somewhere. But but that feels a little bit weird. It feels a little bit odd because it makes it seem as though, well, what are you doing when you do philosophy if you're not giving answers to problems? That's, that's our classic um, understanding of what it is to engage with any kind of problem, to give a clear um, and developed account in uh, clear and non-mystical terms of how you, how you solve the problem. Uh, that looks like what one ought to be doing. But um, Heidegger says it a little bit better than I was able to say it. Um, again, in the Kant lectures. Um, but now let me just see if I can... I say page one. Yes. So this is his characterization of philosophy. And I think he thinks that phenomenology is the method of philosophy. Uh, and he says, philosophy belongs to the most original of human endeavors. In this regard, Kant remarks, uh, but these human endeavors turn in a constant circle. That should remind you of the hermeneutic circle. Uh, arriving again at a point where they've already been. Thereupon, materials now lying in the dust can perhaps be processed into a magnificent structure. And I think Heidegger's thinking what that means, in part, when you do philosophy, is you relate to the great figures in the history of philosophy by recovering out of them uh, um, things that you never thought you, you'd be able to find in them. Yeah, Anton. When he says original, does he mean original in the sense of primordial or original in the sense of creative and revolutionary? Ah, not creative and revolutionary. Um, uh, well, not revolutionary by means of being creative. If creative means sort of creating ex nihilo, building out of nothing, uh, something. Uh, but I think he means original in the sense that uh, it's what char- it's what characterizes us as as human beings. I think philosophy belongs to the most original of human endeavors. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know. And I don't know what the word in the German is. I'd have thought it means something like um, it's one of the basic things that makes us human that we can do philosophy. That will go along with the idea that Dasein is the being that can ask uh, the question of the meaning of being. Right? That's in, the question of the meaning of the being is one of being is one of the basic philosophical questions. Um, but he goes on. It's precisely these, uh, this is, remember, related to this claim that I made last time that I felt uncomfortable about, that had to do with the idea that if you really weren't forgetting these philosophical problems, then you were dealing with them in some kind of non reductive way. So he says, it's precisely these original human endeavors that have their constancy, they're always there for us, these philosophical problems, in never losing their questionable character and in thus returning to the same point and finding their sole source of energy. So the questions have to somehow remain constantly as questions, though there must be some sense in which we can make an advance. So the question is, what kind of advance does one make if one does philosophy in the way Heidegger thinks? Well, he says, the constancy of these endeavors does not consist in the continued regularity of advancing. So advance is the, is the wrong word. Advance is what goes on with, you know, in the Hegelian account of history, where we advance and make progress and get better and better and clearer and clearer on what uh, kind of being we are, on what it is to be, on all the basic philosophical problems. Um, progress exists only in the realm of what is ultimately unimportant for human existence. I love that sentence. <laughs> I love that 
sentence. I was on a panel. I was on a panel about three or four years ago um, at, at, at the APA, sorry, which is the American Philosophical Association, the big meeting over over um, over Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, and there were and there were hundreds of philosophers in the audience, and um, there were three three or four of us. I can't remember sitting up at the front, and the and the question was, what's the future of philosophy? And someone. In fact, one of our current colleagues, I won't mention who, came, came up to the microphone and said, I have a question for the, for the participants. He said, what, uh, what progress has philosophy made? Can you say anything about what progress we've made? I mean, surely if we're worth our salt at all, we must have made some progress. And the first three other two participants, they came up with weird answers about, you know, in moral philosophy, we now understand that. And I, I didn't know what to say, but I sort of babbled on about somehow the idea that progress wasn't the right, wasn't the right way to measure what we do in philosophy. That's a kind of scientific way of measuring it um, but, uh, but and somehow uh, in philosophy what we do is we bring into question things that other people have taken for granted and that's what our, that's what our job is. We make bizarre and wonderful and amazing all these things that people thought were banal and, un- and uninteresting uh, and I think that's what Heidegger is saying here. Um, so uh, the constancy of these, uh, let's see, uh, philosophy does not evolve in the sense of progress. Rather, he says, now this is the thing that's related to the method of phenomenology. Philosophy is an attempt at developing and clarifying the same few problems over and over and over again. And his list of problems comes, I mean, at least in this book, comes out of Kant. There are theological problems about God, there are problems about being, there are the, the special metaphysics problems and the general metaphysics problems. Uh, and he says, philosophy is the independent, free, and thoroughgoing struggle of human existence with the darkness that can break out at any time in that existence. And every clarification, this is the thing that I find so crucial, every clarification opens new abysses. So if philosophy is about developing and clarifying, then it's about developing and clarifying in such a way as to open up new things about which we're no longer clear and about which we can ask these kinds of questions and stand in wonder and amazement at. Thus the stagnation and decline of philosophy, which Heidegger thinks is a real problem for philosophy, and Heidegger, I think at the time, thinks the stagnation and decline of philosophy is um, exemplified by the various schools of philosophy and by positivism and so on. Um, uh, Thus the stagnation and decline of philosophy do not mean not going forward anymore. Rather, they point to having forgotten the center. And I take it that means just what he opened up the substantive introduction with. We've forgotten what makes these questions wonderful and amazing. We've forgotten the way in which we used to be, uh, we used to stand in wonder at the very question, what is it for anything to be anything at all? And to the extent that we think we've given a final answer that reduces that wonder and amazement to something that we no longer need to be wonder, wondering and amazing about, to that extent, then, we've, then, then we've, we've lost the philosophical impulse and we've forgotten what philosophy was all about. Therefore, every philosophical renewal, and remember that opening passage is all about renewing uh, our, and, and remembering what we already knew. Therefore, every philosophical renewal is an awakening in returning to the same point. That's what he thinks we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Can you say a few more words about... Um, so, recently, I mean, there's a way of doing philosophy yeah. which seems like a metacritical thinking about anything whatsoever. Yeah. Therefore, you find this philosophy of love, philosophy of that and that, uh-huh. which, you know, as someone who's coming from this tradition, I have no understanding of how could that be. Right. So, since we are asking the same questions and he can give a list of it, can we say that there's like a basic question of philosophy is involved and it's not just it's not just a meta thinking about anything whatsoever? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by meta thinking, but it sounds like... Um, I mean, there's a certain kind of meta-thinking that Heidegger's involved with, in a way. I mean, and that's what we're going to talk about. He's interested in what method one uses when one asks uh, the central questions of of philosophy. Philosophy, Yes, yes, that's right. 
Uh, but he thinks it's uh, he thinks it's already clear. I mean, clear in the sort of formal indication way. <laughs> It's already clear what the questions are because we're historical beings and the questions have been laid out for us already. Uh, Of course, we could be totally wrong about what the questions mean, uh, but those questions are those questions are given are given in advance as as the questions that determine the sort of central original character of what it is to be our kind of being. Yeah, I think he thinks that. And and I think I mean. Just because I, I want to try to, I want to try to, I want to try to relive the reverie that I felt at three in the morning here. So I, I mean, it seems to me this structure is um, tied up with uh, Heidegger's understanding of what phenomenology is, and also um, with Heidegger's understanding of what the meaning of being is. The meaning of being is uh, what phenomenology is primarily devoted to telling us about. So so we have the claim, that this is the claim I want to hold on to from that first page of the Kant lecture. We have the claim that philosophy is a return to these classic central problems, like the problem of the meaning of being. And... It's, although it doesn't involve progress in the sense that you can advance to a clearer and clearer and more definitive understanding of the problems, it does involve developing and clarifying those problems. But every development and clarification opens up new abysses. That's the, that's the structure that he's got. And I think that structure is the central structure that you find in Heidegger. I, if, if every great philosopher has one idea, then I think maybe this is, this is in the... This, is, um, this idea is sort of in the running for the great idea that Heidegger had. It's the idea that for the central, most important kinds of problems, uh, the way in which one goes forward is by developing and clarifying the problems. But every version of development and clarification opens up new things that you're no longer clear about. And that's why you get this this hermeneutic circle. That's why you get the structure of the problems continually opening up new questions. Yeah, Jackson. Um, I'm just wondering why he thinks it has to be a circle and not been like a There's always some distance between where you want to get and where you, where yeah. you are. But, you know, yeah. Well, good. I, I, I'm gonna, I, I think all I can say is I, I can give you examples of where he thinks it. Um, so, but I, and I can tell you what, it, what he's against. So what he's got in mind is the history of uh, philosophy in the West, according, you know, in the case of the meaning of being, according to which what it is for something to be is for it to be present. This is related to the thing I was saying last time, that um, absence is a more primordial mode of being than presence. And the kind of absence that Heidegger has in mind, in the, the kinds that we've talked about, have to do with the way in which um, you know, the hammer, when it's really itself, withdraws from notice. The way in which being, uh, as that which, with which I'm most primordially familiar, which is held in the background practices, is something that has to withdraw from notice in order for it to, in order for it to play the role that it does. It has to do with the way in which um, the force structure of understanding, when it's guiding a thinker, or the unthought, as he calls it in another place, um, that's guiding a thinker when he's, go- when he's going or she's going forward, writing about and exploring a domain. That unthought has to be hidden from the thinker in order for it to play the role of, of guiding them. Um, those are examples of what's going on. I'll just read this one other lovely... And, and, and Oh, sorry, I meant to say... And, of course, that stands in contrast to, um, for instance... I'll say more about this in a moment. But for instance, to the Cartesian notion uh, of philosophy, according to which philosophy is about getting the clearest and most distinct account of the things that we can be absolutely certain of 
and building on the basis of those clear and distinct ideas uh, the kind of knowledge the kind of knowledge that we can have. That's a, that's I you know I mean we've seen in various ways that Descartes is the is the philosopher that he's most clearly against. But it's that aspect of him I think that he's most clearly against here. The idea is that every clarification. Opens up new, opens up new things that you're you're no longer clear. Hides so hides something from you. Um, so just just to keep and, and and Descartes doesn't have room for that. He thinks there are some things you can get absolutely clear about. Some notions, the distinctness and clarity of which is um, is beyond reproach. And that philosophy is about getting those and building our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of everything that is. Uh, on the foundation of those. And Heidegger thinks, that's what you can't do. That's what, if you could do, um, uh, philosophy would, if you could do that, then philosophy would amount to making progress. And we would get sooner or later as clear and as distinct and as certain a notion as we could possibly have about ourselves and about everything that is. Uh, And we would finally advance to the point where, as Hegel says, we've reached the end of history. We've reached the point where, um, where no further progress about these things um, can be made. And in Hegel's view, I take it, that's, that's a happy point. We live in perfect harmony and we live in the perfect uh, political state and we understand ourselves perfectly. And I think Heidegger thinks that's an inhuman... That, that, if you've got to that point, if you were even capable of getting to that point, you wouldn't be human. And, and the idea that you could approach it asymptotically, I think Heidegger thinks, um, is maybe not quite as bad, but quite bad, <laughs> because it fails to account for the, the fact that um, what's special about us is that we can be amazed by and stand in wonder at these things all from the start again. I mean, just from the bottom up, we can be completely amazed and stand in wonder at these things. That's our special, our special capacity. We couldn't do that unless it was clear to us that there was something deeply hidden and deeply mysterious about about what was motivating the question. That's the sort of the basic idea. Let me just so, I'll, and I'll say, I want to read this one other thing um, where he's talking about Kant. So um, he's talking about, uh, you know, his, uh, he's introducing the interpretation that he's going to give of Kant, and he's basically claiming about himself that he knows what Kant was up to better than Kant did, and that might seem a little (laughs) annoying, uh, but but he says, uh, he says, actually, this is the way to, uh, I mean, to be able to reach that point, for anyone to be able to reach that point with respect to another thinker shows the importance of the other thinker rather than anything else. And so, because uh, if you weren't a thinker whose ideas were genuinely motivated by some deep, dark, mysterious to you, hidden, unthought, then you were just doing something trivial that anyone could understand. Uh, but somehow, it's the fact that you were motivated by this thing that you couldn't get clear about that shows that you were engaged in this original human endeavor. So he says, um, when we comprehend properly what understanding better means, we realize from the first that such understanding is possible and meaningful. All these words, of course, have you know, interesting resonances with the terms that we've been talking about in being in time. Remember, this is written the year after being in time. So possible, un- such understanding is possible and meaningful only where something intelligible is already there. <laughs> right, your head is spinning by now, right? You're thinking, you're sort of <laughs> tracing all those words back. O- only where something intelligible is already there which contains in itself the possibility of being traced back to its um, bottom, to its root, to its ground. In saying that there is something that we intend to understand better, we're saying that it contains within it a content in which we ourselves can grow and develop. By contrast, so, and that's why it's so, so great to find this in some other thinker. By contrast, everything which drifts on the surface... Um, he, he should say, admits of progress. He doesn't say that here, but drifts on the surface and on the basis of its trivial and vacuous character, gives no clue to an interpretation. That stuff 
can also not be understood any better, but that's because it's not worth understanding. To be able to be understood better and to be worth being better understood, as Kant is, as Aristotle was, as Plato is, as Heidegger is, I'm sure he's thinking, um, is a privilege and precisely not an indication of something of inferior quality. Okay. That's page three uh, in both the English and the German, roughly three in the German. Uh, okay, so that's what he's, that's, I think, the idea he's got in mind. And just to trace it through, you should be able to think, you should be able to see this in, in all sorts of places now. So, it's the idea that every clarification and development, remember development is a term that we've used, every development and clarification opens up new abysses, new things that are hidden. Um, that's an interpretive claim that's made about the interpretation of philosophical problems or thinkers in this, in this context. But I think it's reflected everywhere in Heidegger's thought. So just to remind you some of the places we've seen it. One, Interpretation is a development of the understanding, but, I've claimed, it covers up what was available in the understanding. So interpretation is a development and a bringing to clarity uh, of what was possible in the understanding, but this very activity of developing and bringing it to clarity, making the understanding what it really is, covers up what the understanding was. Remember, that's the one that I said... Heidegger doesn't seem to be quite clear about. Um, at least he never says it explicitly. But I think he must believe that. He says it explicitly about the relation between assertion and interpretation. So assertion is a development of interpretation. But of course it covers up what was available in the interpretation. So it does that by, uh, by modifying the as structure by turning it from a hermeneutic as structure, which is situationally characterized, to an apophantic as structure, which is non-situationally characterized. So it's the idea that um, covering up is already in the nature of interpretation. Even if at, at some level of interpretation, we are not moving from a ready dead hand mode of being to the present hand. Even if we stay in the same mode of being, yes. still there is a cover, covering up as long as there's interpretation. Absolutely. Okay. That's the idea. Yep, that's the idea. Um, because in the, when you compare with the assertion and what comes before, yeah. there is also this distinction between the modes of being. So one might think that only when there is a change in the mode of being, the covering up, that you're saying, no, 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 it is in the nature of interpretation. It's the most drastic case of it, perhaps, in this. Yeah, I actually think that this is tied up with the way in which the unready to hand isn't well thematized in Heidegger. So the unready to hand, he doesn't want to call a mode of being. He doesn't quite know what to call it. It's this sort of continuity of cases. And yet, I think he thinks that when you go from the thoroughly withdrawn, transparent situation of understanding to the no longer withdrawn, showing itself as something, even if only in the situation notion of interpretation, you get some kind of changeover. He's got a name for it, but he doesn't call it a change in mode of being. But I think it's, I think it's analogous uh, to to the changeover that you get from interpretation to assertion. Um, so those are two clear cases, it seems, where development and clarification for Heidegger go along with covering up what, what was being developed and clarified, adding a new kind of unclarity. Um, but it happens in other places, too. Heidegger um, thinks that... Uh, I think Heidegger thinks... Uh, he doesn't, really, he doesn't really say this, but I think he must think that when a, a philosopher like Heidegger is interpreting another great thinker like Kant or like Aristotle or like the pre-Socratics and so on, uh, what's going on is a development and clarification of what was genuinely and deeply and mysteriously and in a hidden way motivating those thinkers I think that's what he thinks he's doing in his, um, in his interpretations. And uh, I think he must also think that when you do that, you cover up some other aspect of the thinker. Insofar as the thinker is a genuine thinker and is worthy of this kind of engagement, 
the engagement must not only develop and clarify what was going on, but must also cover up in some way something else that was going on. And that's why we can read these thinkers again and again, and we can renew our interest in them. Heidegger can renew the interest in Aristotle and in Kant and so on uh, by recovering the problems that were genuinely motivating these folks and, to, and, and, and um, developing and clarifying what was motivating them to say what they did about it. Uh, okay, so that's that's this notion of Al Sinandersetzum. And just so you remember, he says something about this in the interpretation chapter on 192. I don't believe we read this. Um, I don't, I'm not even sure I want to read this because it doesn't say exactly what I want him to say. Um, <laughs> uh, but on, on 192, well, on 192, he talks about textual interpretation as a version of interpretation. And he says at the very top, if when one is engaged in a particular concrete kind of interpretation, in the sense of exact textual interpretation. One likes to, to appeal to what stands there. Uh, then one finds that what stands there in the first instance is nothing other than the obvious undiscussed assumption of the person who does the interpreting. I think that's a trivializing way of saying that you can't come at an interpretation of another text except by having a four structure of your own. But I think he thinks it's more, it's more circular than that. I think he thinks that as you get deeper and deeper into the understanding of the other thinker, then what counts as your four structure changes so that together you can bring the, out this middle ground. I was thinking, again, in my reverie um, uh, th this morning, that... Uh, um, you, you could probably do this, you could probably convince yourself of this if you had a text that you'd been working on for 20 years and you went through and did a kind of archaeology of the marginal comments <laughs> that you'd made. You would discover that you had one four structure, one sort of basic background set of assumptions that you were bringing to the interpretation of the text at the beginning and that somehow your understanding of what counts as a problem and what counts as an interesting way of engaging with the problem changes as you get deeper and deeper into the text. That's the way in which the text changes you, but there's also got to be a way in which you change the text insofar as you bring out something from it that others, that others couldn't have. Yeah, Petrus. Yes. I want some clarification between yeah. terminology and hermeneutics. Yes. Uh, is Heidegger identifying Yes, um, he is. That's absolutely right. And the big transition, I'm going to say something about this. The big transition from Husserl to Heidegger is the transition from what was called transcendental phenomenology to what gets called hermeneutic or existential or existential hermeneutic phenomenology. Uh, and, the, and the big issue, um, I mean the sort of central issue, is that in this kind of hermeneutic project you always get a, you always get a kind of circle. But what seems to me generates the circle is the idea that every interpretation, insofar as it develops and clarifies the domain, uh, also covered, also opens up new abysses in it. That's, the, that's, why, you get the, that's why you get the circle. Um, but yeah, he does, he does think that her, um, phenomenology, insofar as it's interesting, doesn't admit of progress, but nevertheless admits of development and clarification, um, and engages with the genuine philosophical problems. Insofar as it's that, then it's hermeneutic. Um, and someone like uh, Merleau-Ponty, yeah. this kind of hermeneutical uh, phenomenology, or like, uh, what do you say? I th well, I... I think Merleau-Ponty is an, an interesting intermediate case. I think that Merleau-Ponty, um, I mean, I'll just say two sentences about it. Merleau-Ponty is the thinker that I first felt like I could understand, and I couldn't, I had no idea what Heidegger was talking about. But, but Merleau-Ponty at least was talking about particular problems. I mean, the pro problems of perception. He was talking about shape, the phenomenon of shape constancy in perception or something like that. And at least I felt like I had something to grab onto. I do think there's a way in which um, uh, Merleau-Ponty is involved in doing hermeneutic phenomenology. But I also think there's a way in which 
the particular problem that Merleau-Ponty is focused on, which is the problem of the phenomenology perception, which is what makes it tractable, which is what makes it an, a, a proper entry point for someone like me who didn't know anything about philosophy or phenomenology. Um, I, think, I think he... Um, insofar as he's focused on that particular problem, he doesn't have the, the sort of broader sense of where that project fits in the history of philosophy and why that makes it an interesting kind of revolutionary project. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, but so there, and then, so we've got um, this structure of some things developing and clarifying something that came before, and in the very process of developing and clarifying it, opening up new abysses uh, occurs in interpretations relation to understanding, assertions relation to uh, interpretation, Heidegger's relation to Aristotle. Heidegger says in this sophist lecture, Aristotle's relation to Plato. I won't read it because we're we're running up against time, but I think he thinks any genuine and proper philosophical interpretation of, of a genuine philosophical and, and original thinker um, has this structure. And of course, it's also the structure that characterizes Heidegger's own engagement with the philosophical domain, the philosophical question that motivates, that motivates him, the question of the meaning of being. That's, and that's what I want to get to, but go ahead. So, just one thing about you said I was wondering, so is, is the understanding the historical character of the work, is it, is it just for to understand what Heidegger says, or is something deeper going on here in the way in which we should do philosophy? So this historic character, which you said, I don't know anything about Marla Ponty, but you said yeah. you don't see in the Marla Ponty, yeah. seems to be an essential feature of Heidegger. It's not just because we can understand it better if we know these philosophers because he's engaging in a discussion with them, but there's something seems to be a deeper claim about how his story should be involved in doing philosophy yes. percent, right? I think that's right and I think it has to do with a part of Division 2 that we won't get to where Heidegger claims that Dasein is a historical being I mean, we, so to say that we are um, our way of being involves our having a relation to our history is to insist that you couldn't understand what it is to be us uh, if you if you left out the story about the, the, our, the relation to our history. Well, Ponty has a little bit of that, but that's really, I mean, you can see that's a broader horizon in which to interpret the, the question. And if you start thinking about the perception of objects, it's going to be hard to, hard to get there. And I don't think Merleau Ponty did, did get there. Um, uh, so there's a sense in which, uh, I mean, his, uh, I think there's a sense in which his account um, leaves something mysterious, not because it's covered it up, but because it hasn't clarified it yet, which is another thing that can happen. Um, okay, so the, the final one, Heidegger's interpretation of being, of course, uh, is going to admit of this structure. What it is to give the account, the phenomenological account that he's giving of the question of the meaning of being is to give an account according to which what it is to be is tied up with there being an understanding of being. And what it is for there to be an understanding of being is for there to be an understanding that discloses a world um, in a withdrawn and hidden mode of intelligibility but a mode of intelligibility that's such that it could be developed into uh, and clarified uh, uh, as a mode of intelligibility that shows things as they are, but which development and clarification uh, necessarily hides and covers up what, what made it possible. That's what it is for anything to be. That's, that's at least the first answer to the question of the meaning of being for Heidegger. So the way in which he wants to engage with the question of the meaning of being at all involves this structure of develop of a development and clarity which co which covers up, and that's gonna and and that's the sense in which you now at this level of the question of the meaning of being you really want to be thinking of the contrast between this account and the idea that says you could get clearer and more distinct and finally certain ideas about what there is that notion that. What there really is, is the stuff about which you could get most clear and most distinct and most certain ideas, is the structure that Heidegger's against, because he thinks any development and any clarity necessarily introduces a, a kind of hiddenness and a kind of, a, a kind of abyss, as he says. 
Um, so that's true as an interpretation of being that says, uh, so in a general sense, because Heidegger thinks every interpretation of anything covers up what it's a development of. So it must be that the interpretation of being has got to has got to satisfy that constraint, and it does. We, that's what we've been seeing. But I think it's also true of um, the. I mean, it's true of any interpretation. It's, it's true of Heidegger's interpretation of being and being in time, because it's true of any interpretation. But it's also true of Heidegger's interpretation of being and being in time in a more particular way. And I think this is what Heidegger finally came to understand when he finished being in time and gave up the project of fundamental ontology. Because there's, a, there's a, a tension between the idea that every interpretation of everything, insofar it develops, as it develops and clarifies anything, hides and covers up stuff. There's a tension between that idea and the idea that what you're going to do is fundamental ontology. The ontology that's cross-cultural, ahistorical, universal, tells you everything there is to know about what it is for anything to be anything. That's the stated project of being in time. This project of, of fundamental ontology. And it's the project that Heidegger gives up around 1931, 32, 33, a few years after being in time. I think I mentioned at the beginning, and now we've read the second introduction, you, you'll see that the proposed plan for being in time is two parts, each of which has three divisions. So six divisions, just in case you, you didn't notice it, it's, on, it's laid out on page 64. 63 and 64, the design of the treatise. Um, he says part one has three divisions, and part two also has three divisions. And that's the whole project, these six divisions. But we've only got two divisions in, in being in time. And some people think, there, there actually, apparently, there was a third division, uh, but he destroyed the page proofs after a, after a discussion with Jaspers, uh, apparently, uh, because Jaspers convinced him that what he'd written was completely unintelligible. <laughs> but the third division is supposed to have been called Time and Being, uh, and parts of it may be at the very end of the Basic Problems lecture, where he does say things about time and temporality that he doesn't say even at the very end of Being in Time. But the last three divisions, the divisions of Part 2, which are supposed to relate to the history of, um, you know, a, 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 there's, there's supposed to be what he calls a destruction of the history of metaphysics, uh, sort of focusing on Kant, Descartes, and Aristotle, were never written, or were never written as such. There was a Kant book that came about a year after this lecture, um, which may be related to um, Part Two, Division Three, but but there were there was never anything published under under that name. He more or less gave up the project of fundamental ontology, and you can see why, because there's this tension between the idea that you're doing something fundamental that's cross cultural universal, certain, and ahistorical with the idea that Dasein is a historical, self-interpreting being uh, and that anything you clarify or develop in your characterization of Dasein and of being in general is going to open up new abysses. There's a tension between those and he seems to have recognized it and given up on the project. Yeah, and... I'm wondering if the, if the two methodologies, let's call them the uh, Heidegger's yeah. Um, they can argue with each other, or they're so sort of basic that they're just claims. Uh, in other words, Heidegger could continue to say the progress that you think you're making is, is actually just obfuscation of the real wonder and amazement of that. Well, I think it's a great question, uh, and I don't know. Um, I think, in some ways, what Heidegger would like is. Um, for you to be drawn into the project in such a way that once you've felt the wonder and amazement that one can feel, once you've felt that mood and you felt it in relation to uh, an appropriate kind of domain, nothing will seem as satisfying anymore. And that, I think Heidegger really thinks you can't give an argument that this is the better way. You wouldn't expect to be able to give an argument. Giving an argument 
insofar as it's going to satisfy you by means of some discursive you know, rationality or something like that, is it going to speak to what he thinks is the central issue about you? The central issue about you is that you're a being that's thrown into a world that can project forward into the world and that thrownness has got different possible moods and some of those are moods that lift you up and reveal things even though they, in revealing them, cover up things. And some of those are moods that damp you down and level you off and, and make everything um, unlivable. So I think ultimately what Heidegger is going to think is um, if you can get caught up in a, a mood like this, Um, When you're caught up in it, you'll recognize that everything else is just unsatisfying, and that'll count as the refutation insofar as there's... It's sort of justification as itself of phenomenology. Yes, that's right. It's a a justification internal to itself. That's right. Yeah, yeah, Alan. What about those claims like this we started? Is he ever taking them back like that we are like drawn beings and we are the kind of beings and blah, blah, blah? (coughs) These claims seem to me still... Yeah. Cross-cultural. Well, well, good. Right? Yeah. I mean, well, so good. They, absolutely. So that they are cross-cultural and historical. And so that's the second thing that I wanted to say. This particular interpretation of being, second way in which I want to say this particular interpretation of being is involved in covering something up. It covers something up necessarily, you know, because any interpretation covers something up. But you want to know what does this cover up? And I think Heidegger came to realize that this accounts of being covered up and made um, made sort of totally irrelevant a whole range of beings in our a whole range of entities in our world that are important and central entities to the culture. I mean you just couldn't give an account of those entities if this was all you had. And the most important one for Heidegger starting in 1935 is a work of art. There, there doesn't seem to be any role. If you've, got a, if you've got basically three kinds of beings in being and time, you've got uh, equipment, Dasein, and other Daseins. Uh, if you've got these basic, basically these Dasein with, or sort of, uh, or uh, others, I guess he calls them. If you've got these three kinds of beings, uh, then it's not at all clear where works of art are going to come in. They don't seem to be equipment, uh, but they don't seem to be Daseins. And they don't seem to be other Daleks. So, what what role do they play? And I think Heidegger thought that this way of thinking about the question of being covered up the fact that works of art play an essential <laughs> role for us as a his, as historical beings. And then the question was, what role? And that's that's what he tries to spell out. And he tries to spell it. And and they give us they give us a history. He thinks, roughly speaking works of art, but we won't, we won't go into it. That's, the, that's what gets spelled out in the, origin, in the essay called The Origin of the Work of Art. So it's not just that, right, it just, so I'm just trying to answer what this cover up, and one might think that, look, just like in the case of Kant, he didn't recognize there's another yeah. form of being, which is also fundamental, yeah. like this, that Hanmog is not, you know, yeah. he, seems, he thinks that Kant was on the right track, but there's something deeper, and then yeah. had, uh, why can't we just say that, oh, the list was not complete, well, another week. So what, it, what about it could project? turn out, yeah, it could turn out that that's the way it works. Except that um, what what Heidegger, what Heidegger actually thinks is that once you realize what kind of being a work of art is, what kind of entity a work of art is, you recognize that it's the kind of thing around which a whole set of practices can be organized such that the people whose practices are organized around that work of art can come to recognize themselves as valuing certain things and as seeing the world in a certain way and having a particular understanding of being. And then if you get a different work of art that plays that role, then you get a whole different understanding of being. There's no possibility for a whole different understanding of being here in Being in Time. And so that's why it, gener- it, it really covers up what being is. It covers up that being is the kind of thing that itself can gather in different ways. That's, and so he does all sorts of things in this early 30s. He starts writing, he starts writing, I, I mean, you know, you're just one that's sort of embarrassed even, even to write it on the board. But, you know, he does things like every time he prints being, uh, he has it crossed out. You know, all sorts of weird things. You know, I mean, you know, we gotta erase that, or they'll think, we're, "Where's the eraser? Help!" <laughs> okay, well, I'm actually okay. So anyhow, uh, you know, I mean, so he, so, 
anyhow, he, think, he thinks that there's something essentially um, wrong about the, about the version that he's got here. Um, and it's that notion of hiddenness. So when we do a late Heidegger course again, that's what the, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start from that kind of thing. Um, and I should say, just by way of advertisement, there is some chance, I don't know when it's going to happen, I was hoping, Matt's not here, Matt Boyle has been coming, I'm hoping he will help us, um, some chance soon, and maybe next year, but maybe not, maybe the year after, we'll do um, a, a course on Heidegger's reading of Kant, um, and Peter Gordon might be interested, he and I have been talking about it, he has just finished a book on the debate between Heidegger and Kassirer that took place in 1929 over the interpretation of Kant. This famous debate called the Davos debate uh, happened in Davos, Switzerland. So anyhow, sooner this is a, that's by way of advertisement. Um, but okay, so but we haven't done the we haven't done the method of phenomenology yet, which is what this is all supposed to be leading up to. That's why it's relevant to talk about this here. Um, the section seven of the second division is the section where Heidegger tells us what phenomenology is. You should know, and I don't know how much to say this and how much not to say this, because of this particular interpretation of what, it, what one's doing when one is giving an interpretation of other thinkers, it turns out that Heidegger thinks really is totally irrelevant. Everything about them personally is totally irrelevant. Um, and uh, you can, so you can sort of you can sort of see why, because what matters is what they are not clear about, not the things that there are going on in their everyday lives. Um, nevertheless, the, these little stories are sometimes fun, so I tell them. He, 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 in, in the in the in the Aristotle lecture, he says this famous thing that I was reading from last time, from 1924. He says this famous thing. He says, um, "We will." Uh, we will now turn to everything important one needs to know about the life and personality of Aristotle. Aristotle was born at a certain time. He worked. He died. <laughs> and then he goes on. But, uh, but in, I'll just say a word. This notion of what the method of phenomenology is was a matter of dispute. Um, and, Hi and Husserl... Heidegger's teacher is the person who retrieved the name. It's a, it's not, he didn't invent the name. It's an older name. But he retrieved it and he named his method um, phenomenology. And Heidegger was a student of Husserl's and thought there were some things in Husserl that were important. Um, and Husserl was a big fan of Heidegger's. Heidegger took Husserl's chair at the University of Freiburg when, when Husserl retired. Um, uh, and in, and in around 1927, after he wrote Being in Time, and then in 1929, Husserl was, was supposed to write uh, an article for the Encyclopedia Britannica about phenomenology. Uh, and he thought, okay, well, great, I'll, 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 I'll get together with my, my best former student, uh, and he now holds my chair, and we'll work together, and we'll decide together what phenomenology is. And it was a disaster. They're, you can read these letters. They're getting increasingly angry at one another. Apparently, they spent 10 days over Christmas together, and it's a nightmare. <laughs> and and uh, well, Husserl ended up rescinding the offer. <laughs> so what, what appears in the 1931 Encyclopedia Britannica is Husserl's article and not Heidegger's. They couldn't agree. But you, you can see why they couldn't agree, because Husserl was a Cartesian. In 1929, Husserl gave these lectures in Paris called the Cartesian Meditations. He thought phenomenology was a matter of getting rid of all those presuppositions and prescinding from all those commitments that might keep you from getting an absolutely clear and absolutely distinct characterization of the phenomena. So you can do that. It's hard. He said, Husserl said famously, it'll take you know, two generations of properly trained researchers, but we'll get it. Okay? But it's, it's hard to get these clear and distinct ideas, but you, but you can do it. We will do it. It's just a matter of, of stepping back from the world in the appropriate way so that none of the commitments that you've got that tie you to the world get in the way of your understanding of the representation of the world that you've got. And you can imagine why Heidegger was against that. Um, and, and Heidegger's being against that is sort of writ through section 7. Um, there's a 
page, on page, at the top of page 52, he's clearly talking about Husserl when he talks about symptoms and signs. I won't, I won't go through, through that part, but that's cl- a clear reference to parts of the logical investigations. Um, so what are you doing when you do phenomenology according to Heidegger? The first thing is that Heidegger wants to insist phenomenology involves a certain kind of self-evidence. And, you know, that might sound odd. Self-evidence is supposed to be the kind of evidence that doesn't need any further justification. It's typically the kind of clear and distinct idea that you find in Descartes. I mean, self-evident claims are claims that you make and nobody could possibly disagree with them. And it's hard to imagine any of the claims in being in time are like that. You can't even understand them, never mind disagree with them. So, uh, but Heidegger wants to insist that there's a kind of self-evidence that in, that's involved in, in phenomenology. On page 50, he says, um, right, 28 in the margin, so 28 in the German. Thus the term phenomenology expresses a maxim which can be formulated as to the things themselves, which is the Zuzakenselbst, <laughs> that's, the, that's the phrase that Husserl used to characterize phenomenology. So we're not going to describe um, any of the pre-commitments or presuppositions that we've got about the way the world has to be. We're going to prescind from all of those and just describe, in Husserl's view, our representation of the way the world is. And Heidegger wants to reappropriate that term. Now the things, well, things are supposed, you're supposed to hear that in Greek. They're the pragmata. They're the things you use. And they're the things when you're using them, you're so tied up with them that you don't notice them at all. And in fact, any noticing of them turns out to cover up the way in which you'd understood them before. You can't prescind from the commitments that you've got to the way they are. Any prescinding from them um, destroys and covers up the mode of intelligibility that you're trying to describe. So it is opposed, phenomenology is opposed to all free-floating constructions and accidental findings. It's opposed to taking over any conceptions um, which only seem to have been demonstrated. It's opposed to pseudo-questions. Yet, this maxim, one may rejoin, is abundantly self-evident. I mean, doesn't everyone want to do that? And it expresses, moreover, the underlying principle of any scientific knowledge whatsoever. Why should anything so self-evident be taken up explicitly in giving a title to, the branch, to a branch of research? In point of fact, the issue here is a kind of self-evidence which we should like to bring closer to us so far as it's important to do so in casting light upon the procedure of our treatise. There is a kind of self-evidence that Heidegger's version of phenomenology is, is going to make use of but it's a kind of self-evidence that involves things showing up in such a way that the very way in which they show up covers up the way in which they were intelligible to you before. But they can show up, and they can, moreover, show up in ways that reveal better what they are, or they can show up in ways that further cover up what they are. And so, and that's the structure that he wants, what he wants to have in mind. And he's got that structure in mind. And he says, look, I, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to tell you what phenomenology is by telling you what each of the words that makes up the term means. Phenomena and logos. Two good Greek terms. Okay. And he says, um, and, and so he starts with phenomena. Phenomenon in the singular. Um, and on page 51... The first thing about it that he says, and I find this fascinating, um, is that, and I didn't remember this until I reread this this morning, a little bit later than 4:30. Uh, the the um, it comes from a it comes from a Greek verb that's in the middle voice. So he says the Greek expression phenomenon, to which the term phenomenon goes back, is derived from the verb phainistai, which signifies to show itself. Thus, phenomenon means that which shows itself, the manifest. Phenistai itself is a middle-voiced verb, is a middle-voiced form, which comes from phino, which means to bring to the light of day, to put in the light. 
you can see again, this is related to the clearing. It's related to his account of um, the Enlightenment, uh, his alternative account of the Enlightenment. Um, Fino comes from the stem fa, like phos, the light, that which is bright. In other words, that wherein something can become manifest or visible in itself. That wherein, the clearing, what's disclosed. That's the basic kind of phenomenon, he's going to say. Of course, you couldn't know that if you hadn't read the whole Division I. Thus, we must keep in mind that the expression phenomenon signifies that which shows itself in itself, the manifest. The, the reason I think it's interesting that this is a middle-voiced verb is that Greek, unlike English, unlike German, unlike most, maybe even all contemporary languages, has a form that's neither, a verb form that's neither the active nor the passive. That's what we have. We have active and passive. Uh, Greek, especially Homeric Greek, but it lasted even into the classical period, though in a a derivative form. Um, Greek has a, a verb form called the middle the middle uh, voice. Um, and the middle voiced verbs are supposed to be ones. I mean, no, I talked with a uh, historical linguist about this the other day. Nobody knows what they were for. I mean, they just have no clue. <laughs> they really have no clue. But here's an interpretation, and maybe why Heidegger thinks it's interesting. To say that the, phenom- the phenomena are what shows itself, uh, and to say that that's a middle voiced thing is to suggest that something showing itself is neither a matter of the subjects taking it in actively, nor the subjects passively being given it. It's a matter of the, the Dasein and the world to get coming together to allow there to be this phenomenon, to allow something to show itself, which is what Heidegger really thinks. There couldn't be a clearing unless there were both a world and Dasein. And those are two aspects of a unified phenomenon. So the middle voice verb is the right place to to um, to find this to find this kind of this kind of word. Um, so okay, so you've got this middle voice thing, the phenomena, whatever it is that shows itself. Think, keep thinking, have examples in your mind. Keep thinking of the hammer, which can show itself. It first shows itself by withdrawing, then it shows itself as something in a situation, then it shows itself as something apophantically. Um, Okay, but just because phenomena require both Dasein and world doesn't mean that there aren't different ways that phenomena can show themselves. Of course there are, there's a whole range, like I've just said, by withdrawing, by... Uh, the the hermeneutic as by the apophantic as but in addition and this is really bizarre but related to what we've been talking about but in addition one of the ways in which the phenomena can show themselves is by hiding themselves is by covering themselves up and Heidegger says that um, reading on from where from where we were So he says, accordingly, the phenomena are the totality of what lies in the light of day or can be brought to the light. That's at the level of understanding. Uh, It's always a possibility that the things can be made to show themselves as something. What the Greeks sometimes identified simply with entities, ta'onta. Now an entity can show itself from itself in many ways, depending in each case on the kind of access we have to it. This is Heidegger tying up Um, what the phenomena are and what our mode of access to them are. In the general case, what being is and what the understanding of being is. Um, Indeed, it's even possible for an entity to show itself as something which in itself it is not. When it shows itself in this way, it looks like something or other. This kind of showing itself is what we call seeming. Thus, in Greek, too, the expression phenomenon signifies that which looks like something, that which is semblant, semblance. Phenomenon agathon means something good which looks like, but in actuality is not what it gives itself out to be. So it's built right into the word phenomenon that phenomena can show themselves in such a way that they hide what they are. Okay. And that's, of course, crucial to Heidegger's characterization of what phenomenology is. That's the structure that, that we've been talking about that he, that he finds everywhere. Um, so they can, they can show themselves in a way that hides what they are. Um, and, but what's most important, it, I think, 
for Heidegger, is that there is what he calls a structural interconnection between the fact that phenomena can show themselves as they are in themselves and the fact that phenomena can show themselves in such a way as to hide the kind of thing they are. That's what he says next. This is the, the main thing. I'll probably end with this. Um, so if we're to have uh, an, any further understanding of the concept of phenomenon, everything depends on our seeing how what is designated in the first signification of phenomenon, <coughs> phenomenon as that which shows itself, and what is designated in the second phenomenon as semblance, or what covers up or hides what it really is. These two things are structurally interconnected. That's only when the meaning of something is such that it, can, that it makes a pretension of showing itself, that is, of being a phenomenon, can it show itself as something which it is not. Only then can it merely look so and so. So I take it that means only when the meaning of something is such that it makes a presentation, when it shows itself, only when it shows itself as something, can it cover up something. And that's exactly what we find happening at the level of interpretation and at the level of assertion. When the phenomena show themselves as, when there's an as structure, only then do you get the first kind of cover up. So only when you've got things understood and intelligible in such a way that you can understand them as one thing or another, which is, of course, necessary for you to be able to say anything about them, only at that moment do you have the phenomena also covering themselves up, also hiding something about themselves. Um, and, it's, and that's what phenomena, that's what phenomenon, that's what the phenomena, phenomenon means in the Greek, Heidegger wants to claim even if the Greeks didn't really understand it themselves, it was built into their language, and he can, he can make that clear now. Um, and uh, it's that notion of phenomenon that uh, phenomenology is really devoted to, is really devoted to studying. Um, and in the most basic case, maybe I'll just go to this, in the most basic case, we've, we've done a lot about logos, um, but in the most basic case, Heidegger wants to say, the thing that most fundamentally shows itself by hiding itself, the phenomenon that's basically like that, is the phenomenon of being. You can see now how that's going to go, having read Division I. And that's why phenomenolo- only as phenomenology is ontology possible, as he says. Not here, I think, but... Um, uh, but in the base, in basic problems. But so he says uh, on page fifty nine, um, the thing about the being of entities. So thirty five in the German. Now halfway down. Now what must be taken into account if the formal conception of phenomenon is to be deformalized into the phenomenological one? And how is that latter to be distinguished from the ordinary conception? What is it that phenomenology is to let us see? Phenomenology is. Logos is letting things be, show themselves. So phenomenology is letting, um, letting the phenomena show themselves as they are in themselves. That's the full etymology of it. And what are we supposed to, what's the basic phenomenon? What is it that must be called a phenomenon in this distinctive sense? Um, manifestly, it's something that proximally and for the most part does not show itself at all. It's something that lies hidden so that it can show itself in contrast to that which proximally and for the most part does show itself. But at the same time, it's something that belongs to what thus shows itself, and it belongs so, it essentially, so as essentially to constitute its meaning and its ground, and that thing is being. Where, where does he say that? I thought he was going to say it right there. Next paragraph. Yes, uh, it's not just this entity or that, but rather the being of entities, as our previous observations have shown. That's what phenomenology is really devoted to. Okay, wow. All right. I'm uh, uh, okay. <laughs> I, okay. So on Tuesday we will move on to Division Two, and we're going to read. I think the first, the whole first chapter. We obviously won't be able to talk about the whole first chapter, but the, um, we're going to read about death, which turns out to be not, not. Croaking, as John Hoagland says. <laughs> yeah. uh, something much more existentially interesting. Okay, we'll see you then. So here's where we are. Now we're ready to launch into Division 2. We know 
that the interpretation of being that Heidegger wants to give depends on the interpretation of Dasein. And so we'd better make sure that the interpretation of Dasein that he gives is the right one. That's the, the sort of where we start. Now, Heidegger has a name for, um, uh, for the right kind of interpretation. He says an interpretation is a good interpretation if it's a primordial interpretation. And in the German, this is ursprüngliche interpretation. So, and I, I guess some German speaker helped me out. I guess that means something like springing out of the origins. I mean, coming out of uh, the, the, the basic phenomena. And so the interpretation of Dasein is going to be the right kind of interpretation if it's primordial in the sense that it comes out of the phenomena. Um, so Heidegger says, so we got to ask ourselves, what does it take to have a primordial interpretation of Dasein? And Heidegger's asking himself that on 274, right in the beginning of Division 2, section 45. He says on 231 in the German, what we are seeking is the answer to the question about the meaning of being in general, and prior to that, the possibility of working out in a radical manner this basic question of all ontology. But to lay bare the horizon within which something like being in general becomes intelligible is tantamount to clarifying the possibility of having any understanding of being at all. Again, tying being to the understanding of being. And so suggesting that if you're going to study being, you better study Dasein. Uh, the understanding of being, an understanding which itself belongs to the constitution of the entity called Dasein. The understanding of being, however, cannot be radically clarified as an essential element of Dasein's being unless the entity to whose being it belongs, Dasein, has been interpreted primordially in itself with regard to its being. So I take it that means something like, the standards are pretty high. We've got to give the right kind of interpretation. I'll call the right kind a primordial interpretation, one that comes out of, uh, the, comes out of the phenomena. Uh, so now we have a natural question. What is it to give a primordial interpretation? And Heidegger says, uh, well, it's got at least these two features. If you're going to give a primordial interpretation of an entity... It's got to be an interpretation that gets clear about the whole entity and an interpretation that understands that whole entity in its unity. So wholeness and unity are key words here. It's got to be whole, the whole entity and we've got to understand it in its unity. So about Dasein, if we're going to give the right kind of interpretation of Dasein, it's got to be a, an interpretation that gets the whole of Dasein, and then understands that whole Dasein as a, as a unified entity. Now, uh, so he says this on 275, uh, 232 in the German. Halfway down 275, he says, If, however, the ontological interpretation is to be a primordial one, this not only demands that in general... I'm going to leave out what it not only demands, um, but it also requires explicit assurance that the whole of the entity which it has taken as its theme has brought, been brought into the four-halving. And similarly, it's not enough just to make a first sketch of the being of this entity, even if our sketch is grounded in the phenomena. If we're to have a foresight of being... We must see it in such a way as not to miss the unity of those structural items which belong to it and, uh, and are possible. Okay. So we need the whole entity, Dasein, and we need to understand it in its unity. Now, I think, although I don't think Heidegger had this way of thinking about it clearly in mind when he was writing Division 1, I think you could see the demands for wholeness and unity already in the analysis of the other kinds of entities that you find at the beginning of Division 1. So I think it's useful to go back and see what he thinks uh, it takes to have a whole entity in view and to have it in view in its unity in a case in which we're, that we're already familiar with uh, before we go on and think about how it's going to work for, for Dasein. So I think in particular the demand for wholeness and unity ought to remind us of his earlier treatment of equipment. So 
it's a little hard for it to remind us of the earlier treatment of equipment if you've been reading this only in the English, because neither the words wholeness nor unity in English show up anywhere, as far as I can find, in the, uh, in the English translation. Uh, but the word wholeness, at least, ganzheit, or whole, ganz, is essential uh, in, the, in the German version of it. Unity is harder to find, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but the place where you find discussion of the whole in the context of equipment is when Heidegger says that equipment always belongs to an equipmental whole. Uh, and where he says that equipment is always properly understood in the context of a referential whole which is translated usually as referential totality, uh, which makes it hard to keep track of this. But uh, if you look on page 97 in the discussion of equipment, that's page 68 in the German, section 15, I assume, yeah. Uh, Heidegger says, we've read this passage before, taken strictly, there's no such thing as an equipment. To the being of any equipment, there always belongs a totality of equipment. And in German, that's ein Zeugganzes. That's got the word ganz in it. Which they translate totality here and whole when they're talking about Dasein. I think it's confusing. Uh, but to the beginning of it, to the being of any equipment, there always belongs a whole of equipment in which it can be this equipment that it is. Equipment is essentially in this in order to, an equipmental whole is constituted by the various ways of the in order to. So the idea is something like this for wholeness in the case of um, equipment. The idea is something like uh, for equipment to be equipment. You can only under you can only, it, it it's got to stand in the context of all the other equipment that has the functions and uses that um, that equipment has. So the hammer wouldn't be a hammer unless it had a bearing on nails and unless unless it had a bearing on uh, other kinds of construction projects and so on. So that's the wholeness. The wholeness tells you that you don't have in the case of equipment. An understanding of what equipment is, unless you understand it in the context of the other equipment. Uh, what about the unity? And so now, so I think we're going to have to look for something like that in the case of Dasein. What about the unity of the equipment? Um, that's a little bit harder. I really think this is something that Heidegger didn't get clear about until he started writing Division Two. But it ought to turn out that there's a kind of unity. Uh, in the analysis of equipment also. Uh, And I think there is, although I don't think that Heidegger uh, uh, is is all that explicit about it. There's one place where Heidegger uses the word unity um, in talking about equipment, and that's on page 109. But it's only when he's talking about a very particular kind of equipment. He's talking about signs. And signs are a funny kind of equipment because instead of withdrawing when they're most themselves, they stand out when they're most themselves. And he says, this is hard to see unless you um, understand a certain kind of, understand them in the context of a certain kind of unity. But it's, I, I won't go through it because I, don't, I think it just leads us astray. Uh, but I do think there's a place where he could have used the word unity, and he just didn't. Or another place where he could have used it, and he just didn't. Because I think he thinks it's true that the relationship between the equipment and the equipmental whole, a piece of equipment like a hammer, and all the other referential, the whole other referen- re- the other the whole of references that other equipment has on on other equipment. Um, I think he thinks that relationship is like a figure ground relationship. You understand the hammer against the background of your 
prior understanding of the way all this other equipment in the workshop has bearing on, uh, on the other equipment. And that figure-ground relationship is essentially a kind of unity. That's to say, you couldn't bring out this relationship if you understood the parts as separable from one another. The hammer just isn't understandable separably from the equipmental whole and vice versa. Um, so the relation between the hammer and the equipmental whole isn't that they're independent things that somehow get glued together or bound together. It's that they're essentially a unity. Now he uses this phrasing uh, unity of a phenomenon as opposed to separate parts that get bound together in a variety of places. And what I'm suggesting is that in his analysis of equipment and its relation to its equipmental whole, there's a unity instead of these things being somehow glued together by some entity, that some, some, some process that glues them. Those are the two options, and he uses that, those two options in other contexts. So, for instance, when he talks about the unified phenomenon of being in the world, he says it's not like there's the subject that somehow gets, is, is characterizable separately from the objects towards which it's related, and the two get bound together. In the context of his discussion of assertion, he says the, there's, a, there's an essential unity to the proposition. It's not as if the subject of the sentence and the predicate of the sentence are independent, self-standing things that somehow get bound together. They're already a unity. And I think here, in the context of the relation between the hammer and the un prior understanding of all the relations that other equipment bear to one another, he wants to say that there's a, a unity rather than a binding together. The closest I can get to him saying anything like this is on 99. And I'll read the paragraph. <coughs> 99, uh, the second paragraph. So this is 69, towards the bottom of 69 in the German. The ready to hand, which is the mode of being of equipment, is not grasped theoretically at all. You can't take the ready to hand mode of being as something that theoretically means self, in a self standing way. Right? Um, uh, nor is it itself the sort of thing that circumspection takes proximally as a circumspective theme. It's not just the equipmental whole either. The peculiarity of what's proximally ready to hand is that in its ready to, readiness to hand, it must, as it were, withdraw in order to be ready to hand quite authentically. That would, uh, and then skipping down, the, uh, well, I won't skip. The... <coughs> Um, that with which our everyday dealings proximally dwell is not the tools themselves, not the hammer, but the work. Uh, on the contrary, that with which we concern ourselves primarily is the work, what it, with the shoe that you're producing by means of this hammering, the towards which of the activity. And the work, this is where I think the unity comes in, the work, the shoe that you're producing, bears with it, I want to say, in an essentially unified way, the referential whole within which the equipment is encountered, within which the equipment presents itself. So I think this is a place where if you were using the terminology of unity, he'd have, he'd have used it there. And I think, um, in other words, he, he means when you're in the middle of the activity that's towards the end of building, of making the shoe. In that context, in the context of making the shoe, the hammer presents itself most as it is in itself by withdrawing. And it presents itself most as it is by withdrawing only because you're already out there ready to use all the other bits of equipment in order to make the shoe. So in the activity of making the shoe, these two, these two things are unified, the hammer and the hole against which it counts as a hammer. They're essentially unified. You couldn't have one independent of the other. And furthermore, 
I think this brings out a connection between uh, the wholeness of the hammer, which isn't understood unless you understand it in the context of the equipmental whole, the unity of the equipment and its whole, and and authenticity, which is uh, again this kind. Because in the, in the middle of this paragraph, I read it, but I didn't draw attention to it. Heidegger says uh, the peculiarity of the hammer is that it has to withdraw in order to be ready to hand quite authentically. So it's only when things present themselves as a whole and their unity is presented to you that they can be authentically what they are. That's, that's the general phenomenon that I think Heidegger's applying to his analysis of every entity. And so I think it's the phenomenon that he's going to apply to the analysis of Dasein. It's just that the wholeness of Dasein and its unity uh, and its authenticity are going to amount to very different things than they do for hammers because the being of Dasein is a very different mode of being. It's not readiness to hand, where the crucial thing is that there's a kind of withdrawal uh, and this kind of equipmental whole. The crucial thing about Dasein is going to be that something very different, that its wholeness consists in its having a beginning and an end. And that gets us to, that gets us to the, the crucial issue in Division Two. We've got the wholeness of Dasein that we've got to get in, in mind. The wholeness of the hammer consisted in our not understanding the hammer except against the background of already having these skills for using all the other tools. But the wholeness of Dasein is going to be something radically different from that. Uh, and here's the way I think you can see. This is a slightly abrupt transition, but this is the only way I know how to do it. Dasein is a being whose being is existence, not readiness to hand, like the hammer. Whatever else existence is, is something that's continually happening. It's not the static presence of a property to an object. It's something that's going on. It's got a kind of temporality to it, existence. We know, ultimately, being is going to have its relation, is going to be characterized in terms of temporality. But Dasein, the kind of being we are, the kind of being that gets its being by taking a stand on the kind of being that it is, that's always taking place in the context of some kind of extension, some kind of, uh, some kind of temporal understanding of yourself. And so in some sense or another, you don't understand what Dasein is as a whole unless you understand it in the context of this whole extension from its beginning to its end. Existence sort of requires that if you're going to think about the kind of being that we are. So Dasein is a being who has a being, has a beginning and an end, and we're not going to understand the whole of Dasein, we're not going to have the whole of Dasein in view unless we think about it in the context of its beginning and end. And just to telescope things for you, death is its end and guilt is its beginning, just so you have, have the, the story in view. But I'll show you where he's saying this about beginnings and ends uh, right now. On 275, now we're again back in Division 2. On 275, uh, in the beginning, in the middle of the page, which is 232 in the German, Heidegger says, <coughs> um, oh sorry, at the bottom of the page. Sorry, 276. <laughs> at the top of the page, this first full paragraph, 233 in the German. Um, and how, I think this is going to do what I want. Yes. And how, uh, and how about what we have had in advance in our hermeneutical situation hitherto? How about the four having? Never mind what all that means. When and how has our existential analysis received any assurance that by starting with everydayness, as we did in Division 1, it's forced the whole of Dasein 
this entity from its beginning to its end into the phenomenological view which gives us our theme. Uh, we haven't got any assurance about that. Everydayness is precisely that being which is between birth and death. Everydayness, which is what we talked about in Division 1, doesn't think at all about what the beginning of Dasein is or what the end of Dasein is. So that's what we've got to do in Division 2. If we're going to understand authenticity, then we're going to have to understand uh, Dasein as a whole and in its unity. And in order to do that, we're going to have to understand its beginning and its end, and what these mean existentially. Just um, uh, okay. So, to give you the the sort of overview picture, I feel odd giving you this overview, but there's so many structural details that I think it might help if you have this sort of skeleton to to lean everything off of. So, to give you the overview, you need to know that Dasein. That uh, death is Dasein's end. And guilt is Heidegger's name for Dasein's beginning. Of course, these have the character of formal indications. We don't know what death is really. We don't know what guilt is, really. We just know they're somehow the name for the end of Dasein and the beginning of Dasein. And the work is done when you try to figure out existentially what it means to say that Dasein has an end and what it means to say that Dasein has a, a beginning. What's the proper existential analysis of that? So death and guilt are going to turn out to mean uh, something very different, not surprisingly, from what you what you might have thought they what you might have thought they meant. Um, so Heidegger's talking about this and about the fact that you can't have an account of authenticity in the case of Dasein until you've got an account of uh, death and guilt. Um, and that, and that we didn't do any of that in Division 1. He's talking about that on the bottom of 275. So, on the bottom of 275, the last paragraph, uh, Heidegger says, What's the status of the foresight by which our ontological procedure has hitherto been guided? Well, we've defined the idea of existence as an ability to be, as a sein können. Um, Macari and Robinson translate that potentiality for being and that seems very misleading because it suggests that at a moment there's some property that you've got the property of be, it's being possible for you to be and that's not it you're an abil- you're, at every moment you're an ability to be you're an ability to take a stand on the kind of being that you are and go forward in your role and your understanding of yourself uh, we've, so we've designed the idea of existence as an ability to be an ability which understands and for which its own being is an issue. But this ability to be, as one in which is in, as one which is in each case mine, this, that's something that we haven't talked about yet. We know that in Division One, when Dasein was operating in its average everydayness, uh, uh, who I was in my average everydayness was others, was Dasman, so not myself. Uh, But this ability, as one which is in each case mine, is free either for authenticity or inauthenticity or a mode in which neither of these has been differentiated. In starting with average everydayness, which we did in Division 1, our interpretation has therefore been confined to the analysis of such existing as is either undifferentiated or inauthentic. So we've just got Dasein, insofar as we haven't got it in the context of its beginning and end, of its whole beginning and end, but only at a moment in the present, in its average everydayness, we've got an inauthentic account of Dasein. To get an authentic account, we need to understand it in the context of its wholeness. That's the, that's the picture that he's got. And to give you some more... Well, let me see. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, right. So I want to say, I, I see, I wanted to introduce that a little different. So, so in other words, the reason we can't say that Division I gave us an authentic account of Dasein is because it didn't give us an account of Dasein in the context of its wholeness. It would be like saying, when you give the account of equipment that you can get, when you study the assertions that one makes about equipment, that's an inauthentic account of equipment because it hasn't understood it in its wholeness. It hasn't understood it in the context of its equipmental whole. That's for Dasein like what we did in Division I. We understood Dasein at a moment independent of its wholeness. And so we got an inauthentic account of what it is the kind of inauthentic account we would have gotten of equipment if we studied only the assertions that one makes about equipment, understood only the ways in which equipment can show up as one thing or another. So to get the right account of Dasein in its wholeness, you have to understand it in the context of its death and in the context of its guilt. And now, now we're starting to build up some sense of, what's, of what the project for Division Two is. To give you, yes, Ailen, go ahead. So you were, I look at the passages in my night. So you were saying that this whole is a unified whole? Right? Yes, and I think so. And then, um, so, and it's a unity, then there must be a principle of unity, right? So in the case of equipmental whole, what provides the principle of unity is the work to be done? Like yes. Whether it is all these things are for? That's right. So... Now we're talking about whole and Dasein, so yeah. what is the principle of unity with Dasein? Well, that's a good question. Um, we've got to ask what its end is and what its beginning is, and I'm going to try to say something about, uh, and what it is for it to stretch out along them, and that, those are the kinds of questions that he's going to be asking. I'll, I, I'll say, well, and I'll say something about that for the case of death um, in, in, in a moment. Um, the, uh, I'll give you, I mean, what I wanted to, uh, there's a weird way to approach it, but the, I want to show you what the names of the things are. This is sort of the way Heidegger approaches it. I want to show you what the names of these, uh, of these principles are. Um, for death, there's a question. What is the phenomenon of death? And what's the relation that Dasein has to its death that brings out most authentically what it is to be Dasein? That's the kind of question that we want to ask. Uh, and the answer is going to be uh, anticipation. Whatever your death is, you've got to be in the mode of anticipating it. And so, too, about guilt. You've got to ask the question, whatever guilt is, what's the relation that I can stand in to my guilt such that when I'm standing in that relation to it, I'm most authentically bringing out the kind of being that I am, the kind of being that has existence as its kind of being, the kind of being whose being involves taking a stand on its own being. What's the word for doing that the most authentic way possible? The word for doing that the most authentic way possible is resoluteness. And then authenticity is when these two are taken as a unity. I'm just going to show you that because so that you have what we're heading towards. I feel like this whole lecture is what we're heading towards, and none of it is getting us there. But, we, but we'll, I'll show you where he's saying that. Um, the existential analysis of, da, of death involves anticipating one's end. The existential analysis of guilt involves resolutely holding on to one's beginning. He says that about anticipation on 307, just so you know where these words are. Then we've got to get phenomena for them. So on 307, uh, towards the bottom of 262 in the German, he says, being towards death is the anticipation of an ability to be, 
of that entity whose kind of being is anticipation itself. In the anticipatory revealing of this ability to be, Dasein discloses itself to itself as regards its uttermost possibility. In other words, anticipation is the right relation to have towards your death. We don't know what death is yet. I'm going to argue and show you places that I think support the claim that whatever death is, for Dasein, given the kind of being that Dasein is, whatever death is, it's not, as John Hoagland calls it, croaking. It's not the physical demise of the entity. The physical demise of the entity doesn't distinguish us from any other living being. The fact that we've got a physical demise doesn't distinguish us from any other living being. And so that can't be the essential end for us. The essential end for us has got to be something different. It's got to be something that brings out the kind of being that we are. And the relation we've got to have to it is the relation of anticipation. Okay, I'm going to, That's what I'm going to try to develop. Before I do it, though, I want to read you the page where um, we've got to get the passage where we've got to get in the right relation to our to our beginning. If you turn to 343, you haven't read this yet. This is in the guilt chapter. Uh, 343, the second full paragraph, the bottom of 296 in the German. Heidegger says the disclosedness of Dasein in wanting to have a conscience is thus constituted by anxiety as a state of mind. We're going to read about anxiety when we talk about falling on Thursday night. Um, Anxiety is a crucial kind of befindlichkeit, a crucial mood. Um, Is thus constituted by anxiety as a state of mind, by understanding as a projection of oneself upon one's own most being guilty, and by discourse as as reticence, not saying anything. This distinctive and authentic disclosedness, which is attested in Dasein itself by its consciousness, conscience, this reticent self-projection upon one's own most being guilty in which one is ready for anxiety, that's a whole phenomenon that he's supposed to be describing, we call resoluteness. Resoluteness is the name for getting in the right relation to your guilt. <laughs> and anticipation is the name for getting in the right relation to your death. Although we don't yet know what guilt and death are. It's got the, the name for getting in the right relation to them, are, the names are resoluteness and, uh, and anticipation. And when those are taken as a unity, then you've got the whole unified characterization of Dasein in its authentic mode of being. That's to say, authenticity involves taking these two as a unity, not as one independent phenomenon that you could glue onto or bind onto some other independent phenomenon. Whatever whatever these phenomena are, they have to be able to be understood as aspects of the same phenomenon. He says that at the beginning of chapter 3 of Division 2, which is page 349. Um... He says, I'll just read right from the beginning. An authentic ability to be a whole on the part of Dasein has been projected existentially. That's what he's gone through in the first two uh, chapters. By analyzing this phenomenon, we've revealed that authentic being towards death is anticipation. Dasein's authentic ability to be in its existential attestation has been exhibited and at the same time existentially interpreted as resoluteness. How are these two phenomena of anticipation and resoluteness to be brought together? That's a question. Has not our ontological projection of the authentic ability to be a whole led us into a dimension of Dasein which lies far from the phenomenon of resoluteness? What can death and the concrete situation of taking action have in common? In attempting to bring resoluteness and anticipation forcibly together are we in all these questions... Then the next paragraph, any superficial binding together of these two phenomena is excluded. Remember, binding is the opposite of unity. If these phenomena were distinct and separable, then to bring them together, you'd have to glue them. The way you glue the parts of the assertion, 
the way you glue the part, you glue the subject and object together, if resoluteness and anticipation were properly understood as distinguishable and separable phenomena, then you'd have to glue them together or bind them, and that's not what we're doing. Uh, this is the, rather, they exist in a kind of unity. Okay, I don't, I don't remember if he actually uses the word unity there, but he uses, he says it's not the opposite of unity, which is to say it is a unity. Okay, so it's just, so it's got the same structure, uh, as the structure that we found in the case of uh, the analysis of the ready-to-hand mode of being of equipment, except we've got to fill in all the terms, all the phenomena differently, and that's what we've got to start. That's what we've got to start to do. So the right way. The right way. Yeah. Go ahead. Man. This may just be a, like a receipt of what was yeah. asking, but I guess when I hear unity, I want to ask. Well, if there are parts that are their aspects and what yes. is, is it fair to say that there are parts although they are not separable or individual in this case? Yes. So so this is the phenomenon that, that he's constantly got in mind. It's sort of at least half of the phenomenon that he's constantly got in mind. It's the it's the phenomenon according to which um, things ph- phenomena are uh, come in this already unified form which allows them to be separated and, but which separation has the effect of covering up the prior unity? That's the, so think of, I'm thinking, as I'm saying it, I'm thinking about it in the case of the assertion. In the case of the assertion, Heidegger wants to say, look, you look at the sentence, the board is black. It looks like it's got a subject, a predicate. It looks like the subject and predicate are distinct from one another. And <laughs> so it looks like you ought to be able to ask the question, how do they get unified? Well, lo and behold, it turns out that question is really hard to answer. Russell gave up. He decided, you know, if they were really separable, there was no way to get them together. Uh, and, so, and so Heidegger wants to say, the only way you can account for the fact that they can, there can be a unity there at all is to trace the unity to some prior unity and to show that, in the case of the assertion, what you've got is something that's a pa- two apparently distinct things that cover up the fact that originally they were part of one thing. They were aspects of one thing. And that's what's supposed to go on in the case of resoluteness and anticipation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when it goes on in the case of resoluteness and anticipation, then we'll get authentic Dasein, just as when it went on in the case of equipment and the equipmental whole in the context of the work when what you're really focused on is the shoe you're making, uh, then the hammer withdraws, and it withdraws because you're already circumspectively out there among the equipment, all the other equipment. That's when you get the hammer authentically being itself. So too, you, there must be some phenomenon um, according to which you get Dasein authentically being itself. And that phenomenon ought to have resoluteness and anticipation unified, uh, just as equipment and the equipmental whole are, are unified. And the idea of the whole is that uh, in order to, to grasp resoluteness, you have to look at the context of anticipation? Or well, what's, he's going to talk about a unified phenomenon in chapter 3. Uh, th- again, this is all just words, and we, we have to find phenomena for these words, but that's sort of the way Heidegger does it. Yeah, the, the unified phenomenon of authenticity is called anticipatory resoluteness. And that's one unified phenomenon that brings together these two aspects of Dasein's, um, of Dasein's mode of being. Yeah. Um, so I want to try to... I want to try to put a little bit of meat on the, on the death side of it. Now, we'll, do, we'll obviously do more on Thursday morning. But <laughs> I, want to do, I want to try to do it in the, I want to try to do it in the following way. Um, the question you've got to ask yourself is, what's the end of Dasein? And uh, I think when you ask it out loud like that, it ought to strike you 
that it's a funny question. Because the word end could mean the final moment, uh, in which case the end of Dasein would be its perishing or its croaking or demise, I think is the word that, that they use in this translation. Uh, that could be the end of Dasein. On the other hand, there's another context in which we use the word end that's related to, uh, to the Aristotelian kind of structures that we used in, that we made use of in Division 1. The end of Dasein could be something like its telos. Could be something like uh, what it's headed for, or maybe even what it's for. Maybe the end of Dasein could be something like it's for the sake of which. Da, the end of Dasein is that for the sake of which it is. That's a way that you can hear it. I think that's the way that we want to hear it. In order to get an account, an existential account, of the mode of being a Dasein, of existence. Dasein is the being that takes a stand on its own being. That is, it's for the sake of which. We've read that passage a bunch of times from section, what, section 17 or something. The Dasein's for the sake of which is that it takes a stand on its own being. That's what makes Dasein the kind of being that it is. That's what gives Dasein the mode of being of existence. So if the end of Dasein is it's for the sake of which, And it's for the sake of which is that it's the being that takes a stand on its own being. Then being related towards your, to your end in the right way, in the authentic way, in the way that reveals the kind of being that you really are, has got to involve having the right relation to the fact that you're the kind of being that takes a stand on your own being. That's what it's got. It's got to have, it's got to have the, you've got to live in such a way or exist in such a way that your existence validates the fact that this is your end. I think that's the name for anticipation. If you think of it with one further modification. I think really, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you all the passages for this in the next 10 minutes, but I want to give you the phenomenon. I think really Heidegger's actually got both notions of end in mind. We've got the notion of uh, completion or finishing or no more. And we've got the notion of telos. And I think really what he thinks is that Dasein, because it's the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being, and in taking a stand on its own being gives an identity to itself, gets a sense for who it is, because, it's, because the only place that your identity comes from, and the sense of who you are comes from, is, uh, well, so to speak, from yourself, though you have to think of yourself as thrown into a situation and existing in a world and so on. Uh, but because there's no further determinate ground for it, for your identity, for the being that you are, that stand that you take on yourself, which is your telos, can come to an end, can complete itself, can no longer give you possibilities for acting. And I think that's the existential phenomenon of death. The intuition is something like, I'm the kind of being that takes a stand on my own being, and in taking a stand on my own being gives myself an identity and possibilities for acting. 
that's my telos. But because this identity and the possibilities for acting that come out of it are avail don't have no further ground, they're not justified by God, and they're not justified by rationality, and they're not justified by my, you know, my aristocratic upbringing. They're not justified by anything other than that I am the kind of being that takes a stand on my own being. The stand that I take on my own being can is such that it could come to an end so that I can take another stand on my own being. And that coming to an end, the possibility of that coming to an end, what he calls in this chapter, the possibility of no more possibilities, is what I have to get into the right relation to. And the right relation is anticipation. I, that's the... That, that's, that's a bigger, that's, a, that's a, the beginnings of an account of the phenomenon that we're trying to, trying to go through. Yeah, go ahead, Ailen. So what does it mean for, for the sake of Christian culture? And I, I don't think I really get that. Well, okay, so... Isn't it just like, in, is it not a, a potentially infinite test of, so thank you being, I mean, I don't yeah. know what, what is the example, but let's say like being a father. Isn't it like potentially, like, infinite options to ask, like in every case that you can take an action? Yes. So what does it mean for it to come to an end? Well, I think what it means for it to come to an end, for instance, is uh, for something to happen that makes you no longer understand yourself as a father, which is a, which is a kind of human possibility. I mean, you can imagine lots of ways in which it might happen. You might give up your commitment to your being a father and run away. Uh, your child might die. Uh, and that might, might instigate you, know, you to relate to yourself in a new way, a way that doesn't have fatherhood at the center of your understanding of who you are. There's lots and lots of ways that the way you understand yourself can no longer get support from the world that you find yourself in. And that's, not, that's the way a for the sake of could come to an end. Of course, you're for the sake of which, that you're the being that takes a stand on your own being doesn't come to an end. But any of the for the sake ofs that you take up in virtue of your understanding of yourself as the kind of being that takes a stand on its own being could. And I think that's the notion of, that's the other notion of end, that's the ontic end. That's the possibility of no more possibilities that, that he talks about. So, so but, that's, but that's exactly the phenomenon that, I want, that we need to try to think about. So have in mind the phenomenon, you know, you get your, um, uh, identity, well, I'm trying to think of, a, of an example. Well, Kierkegaard is an example. Kierkegaard gets his, gets his identity as the lover of Regina. Um, and then something happens. Nobody knows what in Kierkegaard's own personal biography. But something happens that makes it clear to Kierkegaard, to Soren Kierkegaard the guy, that he can't, he can't stand in the relation to Regina that he needs to stand to her in order to be the lover of Regina. He breaks off the engagement. Now, Kierkegaard has one analysis of that. <laughs> Kierkegaard thinks that you can do that, but still understand yourself as the lover of Regina, even though nothing you do uh, is interpretable in the context as what the lover of Regina would do. But Heidegger, I think, thinks of it in a different way. I think Heidegger thinks you could, you could get your full and total identity through your relation to another person, say, and then something could happen that makes it, it makes it impossible for you to understand yourself in that way. And you've got to live in the identity that you take up in such a way as to get all of your meaning out of it at the same time that you recognize that it, it's always possible that it could come to an end entirely. And if it does, then you've got to be ready to take up a new identity. That's... That's, I think, the phenomenon of being towards death that Heidegger has in mind. And the name for the right relation to the possibility of the end of your identity that Heidegger has is anticipation. I think that means somehow, although you're not, he says, expecting 
this identity to come to an end. Uh, this particular identity as the lover of Regina. Nevertheless, you recognize that it's not a grounded identity. Here's another thing you could do that would be inauthentic. You could, um, you could take it to be sanctioned by God that you are the lover of Regina. And you could think that now I finally understood what my purpose in life is. is. And now I finally understand what God's, uh, what God's been calling me to do, to love Regina. And if you related to it in that way, then you wouldn't have anything like the proper anticipation of the possibility that that understanding of yourself could come to an end. You would think that, since it's sanctioned by God, it's the kind of thing that must go on indefinitely. You've understood an essential and timeless fact about yourself, what God had always intended for you, that you would be the lover of Regina. And Heidegger thinks that's, that's a wrong way of getting in uh, relation to your death because you're no longer anticipating the possibility of this for the sake of being completed or, or being ended. Uh, so the question is, what's, what's the right way to get in relation to it? What's the way that you get in relation to your death so that uh, you take the stand on yourself that reveals both that you're the kind of being that takes stands on yourself that's your telos. That's your end. That's the sense of the, the kind of being that you are. And yet, because you're the kind of being that takes a stand on yourself, and the, being, and the stand that you take isn't justified or grounded in anything outside of you, therefore, the stand is such that it could come to an end, and you've got to live in such a way that, re- that your existence reflects both of those aspects about the kind of, of, the kind of being that you are. That's, I, I think, in short form the phenomenon that Heidegger has in mind. But what I want to do, um, and you can see that if you have that phenomenon in mind, that tells you something about how you relate to your end. Then we need another phenomenon that tells us something about how we relate to our beginning, which he calls guilt, which is, like with death, not going to be anything like uh, what you thought it might have been. And then those phenomena have to be such that they could stand in a kind of unity with one another. And only when they stand in a unity with one another are you existing in a way that reveals authentically the kind of being you are, the being that's got existence as your mode of being. That's, the, that's, that's what we're looking for over the next three weeks. That's what we're looking for to, to finish the course. But what I'll do next time, since I've got these two things on the board now, is I'm going to try to go through the death chapter and try to make the argument that this is the phenomenon that Heidegger has that Heidegger has in mind when he talks about authentic being towards one's death as anticipation. So if you haven't read it yet, or if you've read it and you didn't understand it, very likely, I've read it a thousand times and don't understand it, go read it again and read it again looking for this phenomenon. Read it thinking about how, whether or not, this is the kind of phenomenon that might make sense of all the word salad that you find in chapter one of division two. Okay.